Good. Great. This afternoon. I heard we hit our 500, which is very exciting. Are they doing the swab test? Mm -hmm. I don't know what they did. What did they do? It wasn't Al? so bad. It They're wasn't so bad. Invasive. Does everyone watching us now have this discussion? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no. We are now going live. It was, it was not so bad. It was super mild. Um, the person who performed the test was excellent. Um, the process was very smooth. Um, easy, very easy. People were grateful yes. to be there. Good. Just nasal or did they do your, uh, did they do the throat? Just nasal. Easy peasy, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So I believe we're good to go, Mayor Fine. Thank you, Clerk Miner. So the, the discussion we've been having is about the uh, free COVID testing at City Hall. So if through the rest of this week, please do go visit uh, 9 to 5 p.m. Actually, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Okay, um, it is 5.03 p.m. on Tuesday, June 16th. I'd like to call to order this special meeting of the Palo Alto City Council. If the clerk would please take the roll. Council Member Cormack? Here. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Here. Council Member Philseth? Here. Mayor Fine? Here. Council Member Niss? Here. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Here. Seven present. Thank you. Um, so we have four items tonight, um, a bit of extra work to get through before the council break. Um, and let's, I guess, go to oral communications first, and then we'll take up our action items. So if there are items not on the agenda you'd wish to speak to, uh, please raise your hand. And if the clerk would please help me uh, with these folks who want to provide their comments. Sure. Peter Rosenthal, you're our speaker. Confirm so you want to speak on something yeah. not on the agenda? So I want to talk about Max. Um, that will come up on the next, on the first a action item. Okay, so should I wait till when? Yes, please. Okay, sorry. No worries, sir. Um, if anybody else would like to speak to items that are not on the agenda, now is the time to do so. Uh, please raise your hand if, if that's the case. Jeremy Ehrman, do you wish to speak on something not on the agenda? Yes. Go ahead, you have two minutes. I'm very disturbed by the Cumberly lease that the council passed last night. The whole process behind this lease was marked by the staff saying, we're going to do this. The council did not lead the policy. The staff said, oh, we just can't afford to continue renting Cumberly. Um, and there was no negotiation with the school district. They just said, oh, we're gonna pay $2.5 million, what do you want? The city council exercised no oversight whatsoever, despite a majority of them saying that they were unhappy with the decision, yet no one made any move to change anything. If you're unhappy with the decision, you can change it. That's your jobs. And I don't quite understand why you don't do it. The city staff behavior with the coverly lease um, seemed to be to essentially force the issue. After creating the lease, they didn't bring it to the council first to review, but they sent it to the school district and the school district seeing no other options voted to approve it. Still, before it came to council, city staff sent eviction notices to tenants, not even telling the city council or the public who these specific tenants were, sent eviction notices. And only then after having the school board vote on it, having the eviction notices sent out. And then finally, after weeks of having this lease, the city staff finally brought it before council last night, a week before you're supposed to vote on the budget and said, oh, here, look, we've done this, it's done, vote. So it's like, you know, what, what are you supposed to do? No other options were given except to give up portions of Cubberly. It's completely outrageous. The city managers made up the idea that, oh, we can't afford it. Well, if you had signed, a, if they had signed a lease back in October as city council voted and directed staff to do, staff didn't do what council directed. And yet somehow now it's okay for city staff to be like, well, we just can't afford this. Let's kick people out in the middle of the pandemic. And the city council goes, oh, we don't like it, but we have to do it so everyone can feel the pain. The city council does not seem to be feeling the pain. And I just think this is absolutely outrageous. Um, and I'm just so disappointed in this council. You just, you don't do the work. Thank you, Jeremy. Jonathan Ehrman, you have two minutes. 
Yeah, no, as my brother said about the coverly lease, look, both sides say, oh, we're not happy with it, but they both signed it anyway because each side was in a situation they said, oh, we don't have a choice. And there was never any, you know, last night when they were querying the city manager, you know, where you, did you give them any other options or is there back and forth? And he was kind of like, oh, no. But everyone just accepted it, even though nobody's happy with it. Again, this whole issue with the theater building, you know, right now, obviously, we can't use theater buildings because of the pandemic. But signing, you know, it's at least going a couple of years from now, you know, you know, there's a picture on the on the Palo Weekly article, you know, showing a dance troupe on the stage. Where are those people supposed to go when they get off stage, despite the assurances? Oh, well, they'll just rent the rooms from the school district. But there's no assurance of that. That doesn't make any sense at all. And they say, well, it's like we're getting a car back. But that's ridiculous. If you're, you know, if you're renting a car, a car, if you're renting a car from a friend and you've been paying them a certain amount, say each month or each year, and then you say, well, I can't afford as much as I have been, you know, here, I'll give you back, you can buy back the glove compartment and the passenger seat. Um, and you can, you know, use those if you want. Um, and I could still bring people into that car, but they'll have, you know, they, they'll have to check with you first. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, how is the building, how is that, th that theater art, that theater music building is is one complex. It can't be administered by two different agencies. How is someone going to use it? Is one person going to have all the keys? Uh, you know, that hasn't been thought through because, you know, none of, I don't think anybody involved has ever performed there or understands how it works. Um, you know, I've been perform I've been in every single room in there. I've been performing in there for decades with several different uh, renters and people using it, and it's just bizarre that you don't appreciate performing arts groups. It's the same. The art, the the auditorium in the art center. You also got rid of the green room there. A performing arts space is more than just a stage. You have to have facilities for the artists to treat them with respect. Thank you, Jonathan. There are no other speakers at this time, Mayor Fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to our action items. We have letter A and then items one, two, and three. Um, so letter A is adoption of amendments to the city of Palo Alto tobacco retailer permit ordinance. Uh, this has been continued from June 8th uh, when myself, Vice Mayor Du Bois and Council Member Niss pulled it. Does staff have any comments or presentation? No, we do not. Okay, um, let's go to members of the public. So if you'd like to speak on this item, uh, please raise your hand and the clerk will help uh, process your, your input. Our first speaker is Lori Corey to be followed by Nico Fucci and Rachel Messia. Lori, you have two minutes. Hello, um, I am, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm here with my husband, Neil Curry, and we're the owner of Max Smoke Shop. And we've spoken to council many times about this tobacco ordinance. And as we've told you many times, our little iconic shop that has been around for over 85 years. And just a little factoid, flavored tobacco has been around longer than that. It's been around for 97 years. And the events of the past three months have been devastating. I mean, just turn on your TV and all you hear about is the decimation to small businesses. And between the impact of COVID-19 and now this potentially super prohibitive tobacco ordinance, you guys are gonna just put us to our death. And the whole issue isn't as simple as changing our business model as some people have made comments, oh, they can just change our business model. It doesn't work like that. We've created a history of a business and it's worked for us. And now someone is just gonna take it away from us and squash it. And we're gonna have to file for bankruptcy and we're gonna have to shut our doors. And Coming back to the issue at hand, this all started out as a topic about vaping and we've gone past all of that. What we're requesting is an exemption to continue to sell flavored tobacco. It's been woven into the history of who we are and it's beyond puzzling why this was never an issue before and now all of a sudden it's coming up. And let me be perfectly clear, for the past few decades, all of our products have had a hint of flavor. And again, it's never been a problem. And my simple request is to ask council to direct staff 
staff to go back and rewrite the ordinance in such a way that it provides an exemption to allow us to sell flavored tobacco so we can stay in business. Thank you, Lori. Our next speaker is Nako Fucci, to be followed by Rachel Messia, then Peter Rosenthal. Nako, go ahead. You have two minutes. Hi. I'm here to request the council adopt the vape ban without exceptions. My name is Naoko Fuji. I'm a parent PTA leader, and I own and operate a biotech consulting business in Palo Alto. Without police enforcement, we need a total ban on the sales of vaping products. We have photos of underage teens buying vaping products at the California Avenue shop during and after the shutdown. Vaping stores are non-essential businesses and should not have been open taking phone orders. City staff told us that they were not patrolling the shop and did not take action to enforce the county shutdown order. Our teens know that without enforcement, they could buy vaping products anytime in violation of the law. So only a complete ban will reduce access for our teenagers. I work on bringing new cancer medicines to the market, and I don't want our children to be our future customers. Thank you. Thank you, Nako. Our next speaker is Rachel Messia, followed by Peter Rosenthal, and then Aaron Hebert. Rachel, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, I'm Rachel Messia, the Program Director for Community Research at the Stanford Cancer Institute and a longtime partner of the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council. This evening, I am here to speak about the importance of reducing health risks and the role of prevention. As you are all well aware, COVID-19 has transformed how many of us think about and behave towards reducing health risks and prevention. This devastating multi-level impact of COVID-19 has accelerated the bar for standards and accountability. That includes how we build a community environment that sets the foundation for influencing and reinforcing choices, especially those that have a profound impact on health. Researchers are examining the relationship of COVID-19 with chronic illnesses and behaviors associated with poor health outcomes. They are learning more about the relationship of the ACE2 receptor, also known as the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. Researchers have shown that ACE2 appears to be associated with hypertension, cardiac function, heart function, and diabetes, and as a receptor of the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. A unique quality of COVID-19 is that it has spike proteins that attach to the cell via the ACE2 receptor, and that is to believed to be a starting pathway for weakening the normal functions of the body. New evidence links cigarette smoke and nicotine to increase ACE2 receptor, thus, increasing the binding site for COVID-19. This is preliminary and more research is very necessary to validate. However, I would like to emphasize that some of the knowledge we know highlights the unprecedented need to consider measures that will effectively reduce health risks and preventing health problems for all populations. Thank you for listening and for considering what you can do to safeguard the wellness of your community members. Thank you, Rachel. Our next speaker will be Peter Rosenthal, followed by Aaron Hebert, and then Ross Smokeshop. Peter, go ahead, you have two minutes. Yeah, uh, good evening, Mayor Fine and council members. <clears throat> I'm not a smoker. I am a longtime resident of Palo Alto. And as I walked around downtown Palo Alto, I'm saddened by how many stores have signs indicating they would not be returning to business. Max is probably the oldest or one of the oldest retail establishments in the city. It has a funky charm and is part of Palo Alto's history. It's one of the few places one can reliably buy print newspapers these days and the only place in downtown that one can buy a New York Times now that Starbucks no longer sells them. Max has been allowed to stay open during the shelter in place because the newspapers it provides are for many people their only source of news available. Please remember that only one in only four in five people in the Bay Area have access to the internet. I understand council members' objections regarding 
concerns that max sale of flavored tobacco and vaping products gives money gives minors access to these items. Max has agreed to eliminate vaping products, but wishes to continue to sell flavored tobacco as a matter of financial sustainability. <clears throat> if you go into the store, you will see that Max has a very visible sign that states that they do not sell to anyone under 21, a policy it enforces. I hope you will give the owners a chance to figure out a way to change the business model so they can stay in business and Palo Alto can retain this relic of the past. I'm requesting that you do not adopt Ordinance A and rewrite it to allow an exception for flavored tobacco. I would hate to see Max become another vacant storefront. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our next speaker is going to be Aaron McGully Hebert, followed by Ross Smoke Shop, and then Nidia. Maramuthi. Aaron, go ahead. You have two minutes. Unmute. Uh, there you go. There, got unmuted. Uh, I thank you for letting me speak, City Council and the Mayor. I am a lifelong resident of Palo Alto. I'm a graduate of Palo Alto Unified Schools, and I now work as a teacher in another district. I live in Palo Alto. And I urge you wholeheartedly as a lifetime resident of Palo Alto, as a public educator to adopt the measure without exceptions. I recognize that Max has been a part of Palo Alto for almost a century and I respect that. And I too mourn the loss of the distinctive funky businesses that made downtown Palo Alto so special throughout my childhood. But I can also tell you that Drug use and cigarette use have been endemic problems in Palo Alto. And even when we could not get alcohol in Palo Alto easily, that was why we called that one neighborhood in East Palo Alto Whiskey Gulch. Palo Alto's teens will get access to these things through other means. And I agree with Miss, I believe it was Mr. Rosenthal about the importance of all the products that Max sells. And I feel confident that Max can continue to stay in business without selling vaping products. We have seen research indicating a link between teens who vape and severe cases of COVID-19. If the state council of PTAs can adopt a resolution almost identical to this one with 99% approval from all over California, certainly Palo Alto can take the lead as we so often have and moving forward and doing the right thing for our health, our community, and especially our treasured youth. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Our next speaker is Ross Smoke Shop. Ross Smoke Shop, go ahead, you have two minutes. Ross Smoke Shop, go ahead, you have two minutes. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, there you go. Okay, good, good evening. Uh, uh, I just wanna point out some stuff. Uh, for example, uh, before I start, the lady she was saying that she every time uh, this happens, she call my store out and she says I, I took pictures of underage. Did she check their IDs to know if they're not if they're underage or not? That's just one comment. Uh, also I want to point out Santa Clara County was proposing to ban vaping in unincorporated areas. Uh, so when councils uh, say we're adopting Santa Clara County ordinance, please make it clear that that was for the incorporated areas, and we are, of course, incorporated. Uh, the second point, the hookah tobacco is a tra traditional thing, so please keep Palo Alto multicultural and diverse, and we all should respect, you know, that. Uh, as we all know, vaping and flavored tobacco is 80% of smoke shop businesses uh, or business, and by banning 
vaping and flavor tobacco, it's very clear you are putting us out of business in this horrible times and where more than 20 million people are taking unemployment. Uh, for me, I just opened Ra smoke shop just a year ago and I invested all my life saving to open this shop. So you're not only putting me out of business, but you are making, making me lose uh, all my savings. Uh, we do have leases, rent, and inventory. That at least you guys need to look at it and consider it before banning. Uh, last time, staff were directed to write a proposal, and they came back with a great proposal with, with a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, Your two minutes is up. Our next speaker is Nitya, followed by Blythe Young and then Alan Ng. Natia, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, go ahead. my name is Nitya Marimuthu and I'm a member of the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit Youth Advisory Board. I am 17 years old and will be entering my senior year in high school. I speak today to urge you to adopt the Santa Clara County Department of Health tobacco permit ordinance with no exemptions. I'm specifically concerned about the exception for adult only stores. At my school, vaping is a huge issue. In fact, it is the number two problem that our administrators had to deal with. Despite multiple policies implemented against vaping, the administrators were unable to stop the growth of this popular habit. Many of their students get their vape devices from adult only shops, whether firsthand or indirectly. With many ways of contacting each other, it takes one youth who is able to obtain adequate supplies to spread vaping devices to tens of others. In many of these shops, vendors fail to check the identification of youth, allowing teenagers to easily obtain these unhealthy drugs. I have personally seen many of my friends fall victim to the dangerous, addictive properties of tobacco and nicotine products. I ask, for the sake of a better school environment and a healthier future, that we put the well being of our youth first and pass this ordinance with no exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Blythe. Blythe Young, you'll have two minutes, followed by Alan Ng and Patricia McDaniel. Blythe, go ahead. Thank you, Council. My name is Blythe Young. I'm the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in the Bay Area. And I'm here tonight to ask you to pass a comprehensive flavored tobacco policy. Cities and counties are currently working hard to remove the adult-only exemptions that you're proposing tonight, simply because they're not the best practices used today. They are an enforcement nightmare and they don't work. I'd like to talk a little bit about business. Prior to COVID-19, no businesses and cities with these types of policies, a comprehensive policy, have shut their doors. Businesses can and will survive without flavored tobacco. Your policy could allow for grace periods and education for business transition. There's a lot of attention on vaping at the moment, but I am willing to bet you've also heard from advocates about menthol, one of the oldest flavors. Some say the original flavored tobacco. Menthol is a social justice issue. Currently, as a country, we're seeing both a focus on public health due to COVID-19 and simultaneously the relearning of how to be an ally for Black and Brown communities. Supporting the continuation of flavored tobacco, including e-cigarettes and especially combustible menthol cigarettes, undermines both public health and communities of color. No one is questioning the existence of your historic business. We would sure like it to see it go on. Um, but we are asking that stores that sell flavors to change just one of the many types of products they sell. You heard from another speaker this evening that they sell newspaper publications and many other products. We're just asking to give up flavors because they addict kids and they're an issue for communities of color. And most of all, we're asking you to put public health first. I believe that when we know better, we do better. And I'm asking you to do better by passing an ordinance that mirrors the county and supports health above tobacco profit. Thank you. Thank you, Blythe. Our next speaker is Alan Ng to be followed by Patricia McDaniel and then Karen Felsher. Alan, go ahead. You Good have evening. 
I'm here to request that the council adopt a vape shop ban without exceptions. My name is Alan Ng. I'm a Palo Alto homeowner, parent of a teenager, rising um, freshman in Pali, an employee of a Palo Alto based company located on University Avenue. We've been investing in the community for over 20 plus years. We want Palo Alto to remain a healthy, family friendly community. We need local businesses to support our community just like Max's, uh, but we also need businesses that will track other businesses to help support the community and bring out families and our kids to support them. Vape shops will hurt our local business climate and it'll hurt our community as well as our kids. If you really think about this issue, we need to think about this and I've asked, asked this in the past to um, former city manager, Jim Klein, Keen and, and recently other council members, you know, what do we want Palo Alto to be? What businesses would open next, open up next to a vape shop? And we need to really look at the hard business facts of the impact it has on our city. You know, vape shops will have an impact on property values. It will lower the tax revenues for the city. And most importantly, it's gonna distract families and kids from patronizing businesses in those areas. So it's not just an individual business impact, it is a community impact of the vape shops. So I don't want Palo Alto to be a vape shop destination. I think we have a lot more energy to um, put into other areas. So I, I vote to, I urge people to vote to build a better Palo Alto and make way for businesses that, will, that we want in our community. Thank you, Alan. Our next speaker is Patricia McDaniel to be followed by Karen Felscher and then Rebecca Eisenberg. Patricia McDaniel, go ahead. You may have to unmute from your end. We'll go on to Karen Felscher. Karen, go ahead, you have two minutes. Karen Felscher, you have two minutes. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. <laughs> Go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Eisenberg. In addition to running for city council, I'm also a Palo Alto public school parent. I have two teenagers. Both will be in high school this upcoming fall. Um, this is an area of, of great concern to myself and the other parents who have spoken. Uh, I, along with the others, fully support the ban. In fact, I personally would like it to be even stronger. When cigarettes were found to be dangerous, they were banned. Many stores claim that the new cigarette restrictions would put them out of business. Some did go out of business, but many more lives were saved due to the restrictions. Here we face an evil, even bigger risk. If Palo Alto has more relaxed restrictions than neighboring Santa Clara and San Mateo cities, it is entirely certain, it is inevitable that Palo Alto will be the destination for people, especially young, pe young people, seeking their youth-friendly products, including flavored tobacco. Here's the deal about vaping companies and flavored tobacco products. They may be used by a wide variety of people, but they were designed for one purpose, as the many lawsuits and investigations are now revealing. Their purpose was to get addicted a whole new generation of young nicotine addicts. Vaping products serve one purpose. They were designed as a delivery mechanism. They were decided to be, they, the company Philip Morris that owns Juul, of course, used these delivery mechanisms to deliver a product that has absolutely no good other than to create addicted customers, and that's nicotine. There is no place for these products in Palo Alto. 
it is too bad if these smoke shops can't figure out a way to stay in business without endangering the lives of our children. But it's their problem, not ours. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Your two are up. Patricia McDaniel, let's try again. Patricia McDaniel, you have two minutes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, who specializes in tobacco control. Um, I encourage you to adopt the proposed ordinance with no exemptions for adult-only stores. As you know, uh, flavored tobacco products, particularly flavored e-cigarettes, are one of the biggest current challenges we face in protecting kids from the harms of tobacco use. If we want to protect youth, there's good reason not to allow these products to be sold in adult-only stores. Um, in California, compliance check data from 2018 showed that tobacco and vape shops have the highest rates of illegal sales to minors, nearly 35% violation rate. And Santa Clara County teens also report buying e-cigarettes directly from stores. City staff have raised concerns about stores going out of business, but tobacco shops are already facing declines in sales due to declining tobacco use in California. The adult cigarette, cigarette smoking rate in California fell by 57% between 1988 and 2017 and currently stands at 10%. And the California Tobacco Control Program has a goal of reducing this even further in the next 15 years. So tobacco stores will need to transition to other products regardless of what you decide. Your goal should be to prioritize public health considerations and the proposed ordinance does just that. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Our next speaker is Bonnie Halpern Felscher to be followed by Erwin Morton and Ronnie Selig. Bonnie, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, good evening. Dear Palo Alto City Council members, my name is Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher and I'm a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Stanford University. I have been studying youth tobacco use for over 25 years with e-cigarettes at the core of my work more recently. I am urging you to adopt the Santa Clara County Department of Health Tobacco Permit Ordinance without any exemptions. This ordinance will further restrict sales of flavored tobacco and e-cigarette products. In particular, I am concerned about the possible exemptions for the so-called adult-only stores. I actually have new data just collected from over 4,300 adolescents and young adults under 21 across the US, including in California, showing that the majority of underage youth purchase their e-cigarettes at vape or smoke shops, and over a third of underage youth did not have their age verified when they purchased these e-cigarettes. We have numerous cases to back this up in Palo Alto, as you've heard today, where people are not checking their ID. We cannot allow these shops to police themselves, and we cannot put anything, including business, above the health of our youth. We have an epidemic number of youth using and addicted to tobacco, largely through e-cigarettes, but also through other products such as hookah, in which we know about 20% of youth are using hookah. We continue to see tobacco use putting youth in harm's way. We have seen numerous youth ill from using e-cigarettes and we in our lab have new data showing that ever users of e-cigarettes are two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. Now is the time to act. Please pass the ordinance as written to protect our youth. I thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Our next speaker is Erwin Morton to be followed by Ronnie Selig, then Jen Grand Lahano. Erwin, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the time and attention you have given this issue in the midst of a very difficult time for the city. I put public health first, especially children's health. I'll mention in passing the benefits of full alignment with the county. That allows them to cover the permitting, compliance and enforcement. There's no cost to the city, and more important, the county can get it done properly, while the city really does not have the resources. But more important, I'd like to focus on community support. My wife and I have lived here almost 40 years, got married here, and raised our children here. In our community, parents of school-aged children come together through the PTA. 
we have about 6,000 PTA members in Palo Alto. Our PTA council has been working for nearly a year on a resolution on vaping. Uh, I am part of the team. In all that time, I have never heard a parent asking us to weaken our proposal. We brought the resolution to our annual statewide convention held last week on Zoom. And when it came up for its final vote last Tuesday, 99% of the delegates voted yes. That's 99% of a group that is diverse in every possible way except one. We all subscribe to PTA's motto, every child, one voice. Now I can't poll Palo Alto parents, but it is hard to believe that we are significantly less focused on kids of that, on protecting our children from harm than the state as a whole. So while I'm just one dad in front of a mic, please understand that there are 6,000 other parents standing right behind me and 750,000 standing behind them. We all speak with one voice. Please protect our children. Please adopt this measure without exemptions. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Erwin. Our next speaker is Ronnie Selig, to be followed by Jen grand Lajano and Eileen Kim. My name is Ron Selig. As its interim executive director, I am here representing Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, or PAVE, a national grassroots organization founded in New York in 2018 by three concerned moms in response to the youth vaping epidemic, the worst adolescent public health crisis our country has seen in decades. I want to express three main concerns about flavored tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. The, this issue that brought me as a mother of two young adults to the table. Flavors hook kids. Flavors mask tobacco related risks and flavors do not help adults quit smoking. There are currently at least 15,500 vape or e-cigarette flavors on the market. Candy sweet flavors with kid friendly names like bubble gum or cotton candy and varieties of cool mint they all mask the harshness of the of tobacco flavor. Actually, eight out of 19 teens report that they began vaping with flavors. Flavors also give young people a false sense of safety. More than 66% of kids who vape report they had no idea these devices contain nicotine. You will likely hear arguments that adults need flavors to successfully quit smoking conventional cigarettes. However, that is simply not supported by research. While adults may prefer flavors, they are more likely to quit smoking cigarettes without flavors. Early research actually suggests that flavors lead to dual usage. If e-cigarettes truly help adults quit, let them be regulated as a smoking cessation product and given with a prescription by a doctor, but not be readily available for youth. The evidence is clear. The extraordinarily high levels of nicotine get kids addicted. Flavors attract and keep kids addicted to tobacco and nicotine, and adults don't flavors. E-cigarettes quit smoking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Our next speaker is Jen Grand Lajano, to be followed by Eileen Kim and Jade Chow. Jen, go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Jen Granlahano. I am the Northern California Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And we are here to urge you to adopt the policy as written without any exemptions. We've learned from experience that exempting adult-only stores is problematic and weakens what could be a strong policy. Most importantly, if flavored tobacco products remain in the community, they will find their way into the hands of youth. Um, the California Department of Health found that vape shops and tobacco stores had much higher violation rates for selling to youth when compared to every other category of tobacco retailer. These are not stores that should be exempt from the rules. We cannot put the profit of a few retailers over the health of our kids. We know through best practice and policies like this across the country, the tobacco industry always finds a way to take advantage of these loopholes. 
as a national organization working at the local level, we've seen exemptions like this go sideways time and time again, despite the best intentions of thoughtful policymakers like yourselves. And we would hate to see this happen in Palo Alto, especially with such strong support from the community. Um, this is not about putting retailers out of business, and we have not seen businesses cl business closures following flavored tobacco sales bans. Businesses evolve and adapt to a changing market like they always have. This is about putting the health of our youth and residents over the profits of a few retailers. A few years ago, jurisdictions tried exempting adult-only stores to lend an olive branch to, to tobacco retailers. This was tried and failed, and those jurisdictions have now removed their exemptions. Santa Clara County recently updated their policy to remove adult only store exemptions to strengthen their ordinance. So to keep this exemption in Palo Alto would be to regress and weaken protections for our kids. We urge you to adopt the policy before you as written with no exemptions. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Our next speaker is Eileen Kim to be followed by Jade Chow and then Jesse Singh. Eileen, go ahead, you have two minutes. I'm a pharmacist holding a doctorate of pharmacy degree, a Palo Alto resident with two children and VP of health and wellness on the PTA council. Please adopt a strong tobacco ordinance that mirrors the Santa Clara County ordinance without any exemptions. When a youth vapes nicotine, it's a highly addictive substance with a feedback mechanism loop that's multi-layered and multi-reinforcing that immediately hooks a youth on their first puff. Nicotine is an addictive substance when inhaled into the lungs, goes into the alveoli, into the bloodstream and is immediately delivered into the brain for an instant chemical reward that cements the addiction habit in the teenager. You can't get a faster drug delivery mechanism than this. This vaping habit is so addictive, studies show it takes an average of 30 attempts of smoking cessation before someone can permanently stop smoking. That's an average. A regular pack of cigarettes has 20 cigarettes in it. However, a vaping pod, which is unregulated, unregulated contains 20 to 40 cigarettes. That's one to two pack of cigarettes in a pot. Furthermore, we are on the brink of a serious youth and community public health epidemic on proportions we are not ready for, where youth are highly addicted to nicotine. Dr. Halpern has noted before that having retail shops so close to schools is a clear predictor of whether you start to use e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. For the sake of our youth, please adopt a strong tobacco ordinance in Palo Alto that mirrors the Santa Clara County ordinance without any exemptions for adult only stores. Having loopholes and exemptions in tobacco ordinances means youth will ultimately have access to vaping products and Palo Alto as a city will decline in quality for families and youth, and it will become the vaping destination for all the surrounding cities that have the Santa Clara County or County ordinance in place. Allowing exemptions not only means you do not want to protect our youth, but it is also particularly unfair you're favoring five adult smoke shops over the rest of the local tobacco businesses within. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Our next speaker is Jade Chow to be followed by Jesse Singh and Ann Teagan. Jade, go ahead, you have two minutes. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good evening, my name is Jade Chow and I am the president of Palo Alto Council of PTAs. I represent those 6,000 local PTA members in Palo Alto who are your residents and your voters. Our community is suffering. I know a mom who has to send her son not to summer camp, but to rehab. I have many more stories like this. Our students are begging us to help. They've been duped into vaping because it smells nice, was marketed as cool and not dangerous by teen influencers on Instagram a couple of summers ago. I was the maker of that statewide California PTA resolution mentioned by one of the speakers earlier on June 9th to curb teen vaping. That was passed by a vote of 99% by convention delegates. CTAs across the state will be doing what we are doing now, bringing awareness and advocating for teens to protect them. I was the one who witnessed the Cal Avenue vape shop twice to sell to teens and I reported that to the city staff with the photos. The vape shops have a conflict of interest to self-discipline and not sell to teens. I'm also thinking with all the budget cuts that the city services is going to experience or are experiencing and police perform, how are they gonna enforce vape shop not sell to teens? Luckily, Santa Clara County has offered to do the enforcement and should we be saying no to them? 
What has changed is that the vaping and tobacco industry targeted our youth over two summers ago on Instagram and social platforms having vaping parties across the country. They lied and we know. They hooked our teens. Now one out of four high school students as well as middle, middle school students are vaping. Your actions today can be silent, acquiescence, or take action to stop the epidemic. Please consider this not as shutting down small businesses. Our PTA supports them and have been supporting, supporting them over many, many years. This is about Big Tobacco, who has purchased large interest in vape startups. The businesses have a commercial interest to look to our teens as their future customers as they pivot in their business. Thank you, Thank Jade. You Thank you, Mr. Powell. Our next speaker is Jesse Singh to be followed by Annie Teagan and Amaya Wooding. Jesse Singh, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, you have two okay. minutes. Okay, good evening City Council. Uh, my name is Jaswinder Singh. I am the owner of Smokes and More and Smokes and Vapes in Palo Alto. Uh, I have been in this uh, business in Palo Alto for almost 10 years now. Ever since I opened, I have been in compliance with all the tobacco laws and never had any violation on my record. Almost two years ago, all the smoke shops were made adult stores in order to curb youth vaping. We all have been checked periodically by law enforcement and we always passed. I don't understand when we passed all the checks and we are adult only stores, why does the city want to shut us down? I understand underage vaping and underage alcohol use, which also comes in hundreds of flavors, is still taking place. Why only vaping is targeted to shut down? Flavored alcohol is also addictive as smoking or vaping, and alcohol takes so many lives every year in the world. Unfortunately, the city wants to ban vaping. I also understand underage kids must be getting their vaping products through adult friends, and in some cases through family members, and same could be the case with alcohol. Are you guys going to ban alcohol also? I don't think so. Council is helping all other business like uh, restaurants by closing down streets for vehicular traffic, but at the same time trying to shut down other small businesses like ours for doing nothing wrong. This ban could punish and send adult ex-smokers back to cigarettes, which are more harmful than vaping. Facts and science should be our guide, not personal opinions or biases. Shutting down smoke shop will not solve the problem. It will create black market where vaping products could be sold on the street without any age verification. If only va vaping is banned in the city of Palo Alto, this clearly shows that we, the smoke shop owners, are all discriminated against. We have lots of inventory, lease, mortgages. You are just ruining our lives by this ban. We request council to give us a chance to meet with you and show our point of view before moving forward with this ban because you cannot just shut down our business without even knowing what vaping is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Our next speaker is Annie Teagan to be followed by Amaya Wooden. And our final speaker for the evening on this item is David Zamut. Annie, go ahead, you have two minutes. Great, thank you. I'm Annie Tagan with Tobacco Free Kids and testifying in strong support of this ordinance tonight without exemption. To protect health, um, we must end the sale of these products completely. The scientific evidence leaves no doubt that menthol cigarettes and other flavor products increase the number of people who try the product, become addicted and die a premature death as a result. And I understand that there's concern about a beloved tobacco retailer and maybe several. Um, I hope those retailers will find a, a way to stay in business selling other products, hopefully healthy products. And I'm just sitting here thinking when I was listening to all this and um, thinking just because we feel connected to maybe a local shop that sells tobacco, because it's always sold tobacco, um, it doesn't mean that it needs to stay that way. Um, I don't feel we have a duty to allow the sale of products that when used as directed, they cause addiction and death and disease. Um, death to over 400,000 people in this country every single year. So as city leaders, um, I hope that your priority is to protect health of our residents and not to create exemptions that will allow more kids to get addicted to these deadly products. And unfortunately, these products, if they are sold in Palo Alto anywhere, um, Palo Alto youth will access them. Yes, kids are getting access, even though they're already illegal to sell. Um, the signs alone don't do the trick. And I wanted to make a note that the black markets have not popped up elsewhere where other similar ordinances have taken effect. 
And these are challenging times, and times that demand bold action to protect our most vulnerable residents, including our children. And if there's one thing we're learning during the devastating events of recent days, it's that just because it's always been that way, doesn't mean it should stay that way. So I hope that you'll pass a comprehensive ordinance without exemptions for retailers. It really will save lives. And thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you, Annie. Our next speaker is Amaya Wooding and our final speaker on this for the evening is David Zamut. Amaya, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Wonderful, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Happy Pride Month. It's Amaya Wooding from Proudly Against Tobacco, the Bay Area's LGBTQ Tobacco Control Coalition. I'm here to reiterate some points about hookah that were in the letter that we sent to Council last week. Flavored hookah, as we know it, was introduced commercially in the early 1990s in the Middle East, and only then did it really become popular with young people. Before that, it was mostly unflavored um, and mostly for old men. So that's what traditional hookah looks like. Now, both indoor use of, or rather indoor use of both flavored and unflavored hookah is actually banned at the national level across much of the Middle East because of its popularity with young people there and the hazards posed by secondhand smoke. So as it relates to us as residents of California, the Bay Area, Palo Alto, flavored hookah is still a flavored product and all of the arguments that you've been hearing still apply to it. Thank you, good night. Thank you, Amaya. And our final speaker for the evening is David Zamut. David, go ahead. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, good, good. Um, there's a lot of good, good arguments on both sides. I mean, I have a written statement ready, but um, that kind of changed a little bit. I'll get back to it. Um, kids and vaping, adults and vaping. Um, the issue is, um, do you take away the adult choices because the kids are abusing their choices? In my opinion, the kids are parents' responsibility in teaching them uh, not to do what they do. And if they do it on the parents, it's not on the kids. They are under age. They're under your um, guidance and responsibility so uh, don't be surprised if they do it but don't punish other people because your kids fail to listen to your advice um, that being said um, as far as i'm concerned um, in the first meeting the the council put uh, blended all the tobacco products along with the vape and said let's ban all of it it's like apples and oranges these are not the same uh, i only do flavored uh, hookah tobacco I don't do plain one like the last person uh, talked about. Um, and it's all flavored just to, uh, to make it more uh, pleasurable to do it. The tobacco, that the, the hookah tobacco is 0.05% nicotine, has a zero tar, zero chemicals, nothing. I, I know what's in it. You can read the label. We can argue about that all day long, but it's, it's just about 0.05% nicotine. It's not addictive. Hookah does take time to make, so the kids are not really attracted to the hookah because it takes time and have, have people sit around and, and do that. Uh, however, the hookah, is, it is a Middle Eastern culture. Uh, a lot of people who are from a different faith, uh, they like to sit down and do hookah rather than drinking because they don't drink. Uh, that is being taken away because there's only one hookah lounge in Palo Alto, and that's hookah nights. Um, now, I did email all the city council twice. Uh, only one responded, and the others didn't. I did all. Thank you, David. And that's the end of our speakers. Thank you, Clerk Miner, um, and thank you everyone for speaking up uh, at our meeting a couple weeks ago and tonight again. Okay, so we now return to council. Um, just a little context. You know, we dealt with this on a. a a couple weeks ago and there was a 4-3 vote um, and then a few weeks after that myself uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois and Councilmember Niss uh, pulled the items that's why it's back before us. Uh, I hope we can get through this quickly. Um, I think those three of us who, who pulled the item have a couple of requests we'd like to make and see if we can make some changes. Um, if they fail on votes that's fine and we'll go forward um, but I think we just wanted a, another chance. So the uh, first Mayor, I just wanted to say that um, I think there are much, I'm getting emails that there are a lot of people who have, who had their hands taken down uh, and who wanted to speak. So I don't, I don't think, think at the beginning you mentioned that you wanted to limit 
the speakers. So, so we, we did, I we, keep on getting the emails that you're limiting their freedom of speech. We, we did mention it about 15 minutes in the, the, who the final speaker would be, and we try to stick to that. Understood. Yeah. Um, so our first council speaker will be council member Ness. So I, I think we're all clear on, on what the ordinance is and that it follows it follows the county ordinance, which is it, which is the one that we have voted on previously. Um, and so not to prolong this, but just so that I can stay a word or two because I know it seems odd that I might not support um, the ban of flavored tobacco, especially with a public health nursing background, but while I put certainly put public health first, I recognize that vaping is really a true citywide problem. And I'm not seeing that flavored tobacco rises to that same level of concern that we're hearing tonight. Um, flavored tobacco has probably been sold, I, I would gather locally for at least a hundred years. I have asked at several stores, apparently I don't find that kids, which um, thinking primarily of those under 18 in particular, buy flavored tobacco, they buy vapes. That's, that's what's easy to use and very, very um, straightforward. But um, from what I could find out, kids don't roll their own cigarettes. They usually don't, um, they usually don't smoke a pipe. So it seems to me as though our real issue is around vaping. So in order to move this forward, Mayor Fine, I would like to make the following proposal to the ordinance that we have in place. And the first would be, this would be to separate it into three parts. And the first part of that would be that we all agree on a complete ban on vaping products. So I would make that the first motion is that we all, that we have a complete va uh, ban on vaping products in our community. I'll pause there for a second. Is, is this going to be a multi-part motion because because we can certainly yes. we can certainly split apart the voting but maybe get your whole motion up there okay so the second part of this and um yes this deals with exactly the three the three aspects the second would be to exempt the adult only stores to sell flavored uh flavored tobacco products including cigar pipe chewing and paper cigarettes and then uh, the last would be to exempt the on-site use of flavored tobacco products for currently permitted businesses. And so without naming what these businesses are, I mean, you do know which ones they are. Let me just say one more thing um, about Max Tobacco. Um, I did go in, spend some time with them at Max. I felt pretty comfortable after I talked with them that they check the IDs very carefully. They have a camera, they go over it at night. Um, they offered to show it to me. They said they had offered to show it to our police department as well. So I don't know about the other stores that sell tobacco. I happened to um, spend some time at Max and I just wanted to reveal that ahead of the vote. So um, that's my most motion, Mr. Mayor. You want to maybe restate it so the clerk can capture it? Please. So the first is a, you have that, a complete ban on, a complete ban on vaping to exempt the adult only store to sell flavored tobacco products, including cigar pipe chewing and paper cigarettes. So the flavored products are those that you use in cigars, in a pipe, um, for chewing, um, and paper cigarettes. That, did you get that one down? Good. And the last one is exempt on site use of flavored tobacco products for currently permitted businesses. Okay, um, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by the vice mayor. Council member Nist, do you want to speak to this? 
I, I think I've spoken to it. I, I might add one more thing. Um, I certainly wasn't alive during Prohibition and neither were any of you, but I always used to hear stories about this from, from particularly my dad, who used to say, um, the most fun of Prohibition was being able to find a drink. And I remember that, you know, as you all recall, the prohibition went on for about 10 years. It certainly affected Palo Alto as well. It is very difficult to prohibit something, especially like flavored tobacco. What I hope we can um, really cut back on is vaping, because I think the vaping is that which can be controlled, frankly, much better than, than flavored tobacco. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I want to be very, very clear. I, I think we all support a vape ban. Uh, Max supports a vape ban, as they said clearly tonight. And I 100% agree with Jay Chow that this is about vape products, 100%. We want to keep that stuff away from kids. Um, and vaping products are, are electronic. They vaporize flavored liquid, typically. Um, and we should, we should ban um, those kinds of vaping products, e-cigarettes, liquid tobacco. Um, what, what, what I'm focused on tonight is, is uh, pipe tobacco, uh, cigars, paper cigarettes. I supported pulling this item. Uh, I don't smoke, but I believe adults should be able to purchase tobacco from a, from a personal freedom perspective. And uh, it's looking, you know, as we, I too am surprised I find myself sucked into this issue uh, as I went and talked to businesses and they say that the clientele for the kinds of products we're talking about tonight are typically 35 years old and up. Um, and the last thing I'll say is this exemption would be very similar to our neighboring city of Los Altos. Um, you know, again, there were, there were a lot of discussion about vaping tonight. I don't, I don't think there's any disagreement on council about vaping. Um, so thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, City Attorney Stump. Thank you. Just to clarify, so there's no confusion with anyone in the public, could A be adjusted to say direct staff to create an ordinance for a complete ban on the sale of vaping products? Because of this course. is not proposed to yeah. be a sale on the conduct, a, a ban of the conduct itself. Good, good addition. Yes, thank, you. thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Stump. Okay, um, the next hands I had were Council Members Tanaka, Ku, and then Cormac. I'll just mention um, when we get to voting on this, I, I do plan to split it up um, under A, B, and C. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, so I, I just want to. Um, I don't want to talk out of order, but I have to agree with Councilmember Ku. I, I think a lot of people are, at least I saw these 10, maybe more hands that wanted to speak. And I was listening pretty, care pretty carefully, but I, I didn't hear um, anyone say the closest sessions would be closed um, you know, or at this time we're not getting any more hands. But I, I think to be fair to people who took time out of the evening to speak on this, I think it would be worth it to give them a chance to say their piece. Um, so I, I realized, you know, um, this purview of the mayor on this, but um, it just it just seems right to um, allow people to give their comment um, because I, I I think people can't tell who's who who's last right because it it they can't see who else's attends. So I just want to say that because I, I think that um, that would be more fair to the public. And and if in the future um, you want to do something like this, I think that's fine. But I think it, it should be clear like it's going to be at you know, in 10 minutes, we're gonna close it, right? So put up your hand or that's it. But there was nothing like that. And so I think a lot, I think it caught a lot of people surprise, which is probably why we're all getting emails on this right now. So, but anyways, uh, Mayor, it's it's your show. So, uh, but I just gotta give you feedback on that. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, I feel like we've discussed this before and you know maybe the vote will be different this time but I, I feel like we discussed it before so I'd like to make a substitute motion for the original um, uh, staff recommendation that we had um, we had uh, did before that that was also on consent calendar second okay there's a substitute motion for the consent calendar 
or the item that was originally consent calendar. Yes, Second that's item. to that's to actually adopt the adopt an ordinance tonight on first reading. Yes. Would you like to speak to your motion, Councilmember uh, Council well, Tanaka? No, I, I mean, we have a lot to talk about tonight. So I don't want to rehash all the stuff again. So I, I'd just like to put that out there and see if we can get this passed right away. Sure. Councilmember Cormack. I would like to speak to it. Thank you so much. Um, because I think the prior times we really talked about vaping and we actually haven't talked enough about flavored tobacco. Um, Councilmember Ku and I attended the Santa Clara County um, presentation on this uh, last year. It was a number of hours. Um, and fundamentally, when I left that room, I came to the conclusion that flavored tobacco is not consistent with a healthy city. Part of the reason is that flavors are designed to be ingested. They have not been tested to be inhaled. We had a speaker talking about the alveoli. Um, and we all know from the coronavirus, you know, how easy it is to target that, how um, flexible that membrane is. Um, to the vice mayor's point about adults having the right to buy and use tobacco products, I agree, but they do not have the right to buy um, them in Palo Alto. Um, more people in the US die of lung ca cancer than any other cancer. Um, you know, those of you who haven't watched that happen um, may not fully appreciate um, how meaningful it would be to prevent even one person from getting addicted to tobacco. Um, I particularly appreciated Aaron McCauley's comments earlier this evening. Um, and then I think in light of, you know, what we did last week um, with Black Lives Matter, I think it's important and we've gotten hundreds of emails in the past couple of weeks. So if my colleagues um, were unable to read Annie Teagan's letter um, from the um, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, I'm gonna read you a few parts. Um, what, what, what number two would do here um, is would permit menthol and menthol is really the biggest issue I want to talk about. Um, is the only flavored cigarette left on the market. It's no surprise that menthol cigarettes are popular among youth. Again, I'm reading from Annie's letter. Um, menthol cools and numbs the throat, reducing the harshness of cigarette smoke. More than half of youth smokers use menthol cigarettes, including seven out of 10 African-American youth smokers. Tobacco companies have a long history of targeting and marketing flavored tobacco products to African-Americans and youth, unquote. Um, Blythe Young said earlier tonight that menthol is a social justice issue. It was an entire topic um, at the event uh, last fall. And I confess I was not aware of it before that. Um, so I will be supporting the substitute motion and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Council Member Cormack. Okay, so I'm persuaded by my colleagues, we can go back to the public. I do wanna reiterate, we did announce at 15 minutes in who the last speaker would be. I apologize, members of the public can't see the list of attendees. Um, let's go back for 20 or so minutes uh, to members of the public to comment on this item. I would encourage you to be brief so more members can speak. And if the city clerk would please help me uh, uh, get the comments from these folks and let's make sure people who have already spoken uh, don't speak again, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, we have eight speakers to speak again. The first speaker is Carol B. to be followed by Patricia Barr and Xander Koo. Carol B., go ahead, you have two minutes. You need to unmute from your end. Carol B., we'll move on to Trisha Barr. Hi, this is Trisha Barr. Thank Hi. you, council members. I'm a parent of three kids. I urge you to adopt the ordinance as written to perhaps prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes. This isn't about small businesses. This is about making a choice to put public health and youth first. You all know because we've sent you evidence of multiple stores selling to youth and a parent spoke to that in an earlier meeting and has a receipt that she could show you. The answer is to do what many other jurisdictions have done and are working to do and stop selling these addictive products in Palo Alto. Last year and again in January, you all signed a letter supporting Senator Hill and Assembly, Assemblyman Berman's SB 793 to do the same thing now you're given, now you now the same decision is before you. You said you support them making the decision, so you should have the courage to do the same. 
Senator Jerry Hill and Assemblyman Berman aren't the only ones who have pushed similar legislation. Supervisor Samidian and his colleagues obviously adopted the very ordinance we're at urging you to mirror and adopt. Additionally, a few weeks ago, our Congresswoman Anna Eshu wrote each of you in her letter urging you to take action and adopt this ordinance, she said, and I quote, when the FDA announced their guidance on flavored tobacco products in January, I wrote the director of the Center for Tobacco to express my concern that leaving any flavored products on the market, even if they are sold at vape shops or other adult only retail locations still puts our children at risk. Palo Alto should not fall behind here. Please join other counties like San Francisco, San Mateo, Alameda, Contra Costa counties that do not allow the sale of these products and the city jurisdictions like Menlo Park, East Palo Alto, Cupertino, San Francisco, Oakland, Fremont, Burlingame, and others which do not allow these products to be sold in their cities. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Our next speaker is Carol B to be followed by Xander Ku and then Grace Ma. Carol B, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Baker. I'm a volunteer ambassador with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network and also a co-chair of the Tobacco Free Coalition of Santa Clara County, which represents 26 health, health organizations in the county. We are in favor of adopting the same language that is in the Santa Clara County Ordinance without exceptions or exemptions. Um, I cannot believe that you are ready to give up the health of the youth of your, of your city in favor of funky charm. Um, and again, even though I've been raising my hand for a long, long time, I appreciate giving, you giving me this chance and put in my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Our next speaker is Xander Ku, to be followed by Grace Ma, then Lama Ramawi. And a reminder to the speakers, if you have already spoken on this item, you cannot speak again. Xander Ku, go ahead, you have two minutes. Um, hi, I largely agree with the nature of this bill. I believe that tobacco products should be strongly regulated um, so as to prevent our youth from accessing uh, potentially addictive and cancerous products. But I think um, it should be, it, it's, with, it's um, in the council's interest to clarify what is meant by the adult only store in the legislation and whether or not that would encompass the other smoke shops that exist in Palo Alto should they be should they decide to become um, adult only um, as well as perhaps thinking about a long term phasing out of tobacco sale entirely um, uh, with a plan that keeps these local businesses in mind and offers some sort of um, I guess phase out plan for them that, yeah, I think the times have changed and we need to move on, but I think we can't just throw these local businesses to the wayside. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, Xander. Our next speaker is Grace Ma to be followed by Lama Ramawi and then James Hendry. Grace, go ahead. Grace, go ahead, you have two minutes. You may need to unmute from your side. Unmute, okay, thank you. My name is Grace Ma, I'm on the Santa Clara County School Board. I'm also the GUN PTSA Advocacy Chair. I'm a resident of Palo Alto for 36 years and I have a I'm a parent of a GUN teenager. Um, one thing that I wanted to remind everyone is that from the um, study done by the uh, county um, health department that the acquisition of e-cigarettes and e-liquids among current e-cigarette users among teens was 32% buying from someone else, buying from an adult. 27% um, was buying from the store myself and then 14% was from the internet. So access through even adults is still an issue and will still cause addiction. The specialty store, Max, 
is largely based, and the, the story of Max is largely based on its timely access to New York Times, Washington Post, and other longtime newspapers. It's got charm, it's got character, and it will continue to be the only source for such iconic papers. As the media shift has been going from um, paper to um, online, Max has adjusted its business and still continues to be the premier location for purchases. And I know that um, as the market um, evolves and changes, that they will likewise innovate when um, flavored tobaccos are also banned. Thank you very much for supporting a complete ban of flavored tobaccos with no exceptions. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Our next speaker is Lana Ramawi to be followed by James Hindery and then Brian Davis. Lama, go ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Lama Ramawi. I'm a pediatrician in Palo Alto. Um, you have to excuse me, picture, that's my husband. Um, I've lived in Palo Alto for years and I've seen the rise of vaping addiction in children. Kids can't sit through a classroom because they need to step out and take a hit. They can't sleep. Last year, Pally had to shut many of its bathrooms so that kids wouldn't vape in them. Kids are hiding the vapes from their teachers, their parents. It's destroying our families. I sent an email to our esteemed council members, and thank you, by the way, for letting us speak, um, with some studies that really show what the risk is. One study shows the presence of tobacco retailers close to schools is associated with tobacco use initiation and sustained tobacco use among adolescents. Another study, a nationally representative study of US youths revealed that a high density of tobacco retailers in surrounding environments is associated with increased likelihood of tobacco use initiation. Two more studies. Similarly, e-cigarette retailer density around schools is associated with an increased likelihood of e-cigarette use among adolescents. And a study published just last year and conducted in California showed that tobacco and vaping shops are the most likely shops to sell to underage youth and did not ask underage youth for ID nearly 45% of the time. The study findings, according, according to Dr. Chaffee from UCSF, challenge the assumption that limiting the sales of vape products to adult-only tobacco and vape shops will successfully reduce youth, youth access to these products. On the contrary, these establishments were the most likely to sell to youth. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lana. Our next speaker is James Hindery to be followed by Brian Davis and then Vanessa Martin. James, go ahead. Hi there, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, you have two minutes. Wonderful. Um, so first I'd like to disclose that uh, I've been using nicotine, so I grew up in Palo Alto and I started using nicotine products at 14 years old. Um, I started with chewing tobacco um, and it was mostly purchased through older friends at school. Um, I am in complete support of a ban on flavored, uh, flavored vapes. I think those are purely marketed at children, but I personally uh, used unflavored vapes to quit cigarettes, um, which I transitioned to from chewing. Um, and that made a big difference on my life. Um, I still, in general, am in support of phasing uh, tobacco sales out completely of our city. However, I do worry about phasing out tobacco sales while keeping alcohol sales. Um, I, 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 the data I've seen suggests that alcohol is equally as dangerous. And I just, I think it's a double standard for the city if, if we're gonna focus on public health uh, to ban tobacco products, but not alcohol products, which often lead uh, to in intoxicated drivers. Um, and many of those intoxicated drivers are our young, young people in the community uh, who still feel invincible um, when, when they're on a night out um, or when they've just gotten their license. So while I do support um, the eventual phasing out of tobacco sales because it's been a horrible, horrible experience um, throughout my life to, to be addicted to tobacco, I do worry that, that if, if the focus is on public health, uh, is, is that going far enough? Thank you very much. Thank you, James. 
Our next speaker is Brian Davis to be followed by Vanessa Marvin. And our final speaker is Karen Felsher. Brian, go ahead. You have two minutes. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Brian. Thank you, my name is Brian Davis, a member of the Tobacco-Free Coalition of Santa Clara County. I'm in favor of ending the sale of all flavored tobacco products and electronic cigarette devices with no exemptions. 50 California cities and counties have stopped the sale of all flavored tobacco with no exemptions, including 28 Bay Area jurisdictions. One of those cities is Fremont, a city with eight adult only tobacco businesses and a large population of people from countries where hookah is traditionally used. The Fremont City Council recognized that the importance of protecting the youth of that city from getting addicted to tobacco via all kinds of flavored tobacco was a higher priority than keeping local businesses from having to diversify their inventory. Hookah bars are very popular in, in college towns around the country for the same reason as the one in Palo Alto. Young people of all kinds are attracted to hookah for flavors and the social aspect. According to their online menu, the hookah bar in Palo Alto has flavors like gummy bear, tropical punch, kiwi, and many others that you would be unlikely to find in the Middle East. Hookah is not safe. Research shows that one session of hookah delivers 25 times the tar, 125 times the smoke, 2.5 times the nicotine, and 10 times the carbon monoxide as a single cigarette. Depending on how you use it, hookah can be even more addictive than cigarettes. Secondhand smoke from hookah has also been shown to be harmful to hookah lounge employees. Willing or not, no one should have to choose between their job and their health, especially now. Please join the growing movement to reduce the risk of young people becoming addicted to tobacco products by ending the sale of all flavored tobacco products and e-cigarette devices everywhere in Palo Alto. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Our next speaker is Vanessa Marvin to be followed by Karen Felsher. And the final speaker of the evening on this item is Bob Gordon. Vanessa, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, good evening, Council. My name is Vanessa Marvin, and I'm a co-chair along with Carol Baker of the Santa Clara Tobacco Free Coalition and a parent. I appreciate that you guys are looking into steps to protect the youth in your community from this deadly product. However, I'm disappointed about the exemption that you're considering, which will weaken the proposed ordinance. I'm sure no one wants to sell tobacco and other beet products to kids, and perhaps people don't intend to. But honestly, if good intentions were enough, we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. Unfortunately, leaving this in the hands of the business community hasn't been enough. And so you as leaders need to step in. And sure, it may be a hard choice and a hard decision that you'll have to make tonight, but that's what your role is, to step back and evaluate what we need to do to protect the greater good in our youth. And as a reminder of what we're talking about, in Santa Clara County, a third of all high school students have tried an e-cigarette and one in eight currently use them. The loophole you're considering undermines your good intentions and the law that you're planning and allows these flavored products into your city and potentially to your youth. Please follow the county's lead and adopt the county ordinance. I appreciate your consideration tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Our next speaker is Karen Felscher to be followed by our final speaker, Bob Gordon. Karen, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, my name is Corinne. I am 20 years old and a rising university junior. I strongly support complete restriction of flavored tobacco products, including in all retail locations. I strongly believe that flavors are at the root of youth nicotine addiction. Among my daily conversations, I hear my friends and peers discussing flavors and how they are so excited about the flavors in their vaping products and how excited they are to try each other's flavors. If any flavors are still on the market, they will simply switch from one flavor to another. Further, it is important to say that mint is very popular among my friends. Thinking that so-called adult-only shops are truly for just adults is completely false and naive. I have personal experience of witnessing for the last five years, my friends and other students easily accessing flavored tobacco at smoke and vape shops. It is so easy to walk into a vape or smoke shop and obtain any tobacco product and especially flavored products. My friends my age are not questioned about their age and not asked to show ID. Therefore, I strongly support the Santa Clara County Department of Health Tobacco Permanent Ordinance as written. 
Thank you, Corinne. Our next speaker and final speaker is Bob Gordon. Bob, you have two minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Gordon. I'm a member of the Tobacco Free Coalition of Santa Clara County. I hope you will listen so closely to the young speaker before me. She has said it all. Um, she has said it well. She is living this experience. This is washing over her generation. We older folks do not understand what they are going through. We are doing our best to understand and learn together. Please listen to them. I do just want to mention that the cultural, uh, that yes, hookah smoking is a cultural practice, but it's also a deadly practice. And increasingly, it's a young person practice. And on Hookah Nights uh, Yelp page, um, someone is a young person, of course, is talking about how excited they were to be able to uh, smoke gummy bear uh, hookah at Hookah Nights in Palo Alto. Now, you don't have to take it from me in terms of the health uh, aspects of hookah smoking, but the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control associate uh, to hookah smoking with oral cancer, lung cancer, stomach cancer, cancer of the esophagus, clogged arteries, heart disease, and infections that may be passed from one hookah smoker to another. And of course, we're thinking of COVID-19 infections on our mind. Last thing about Newport cigarettes, as you talk about paper cigarettes and perhaps exempting those, that's menthol. That is a uh, Newport cigarettes are worth over $27 billion dollars to the tobacco industry. Young people love them. They're the most popular cigarette brand, especially with African-Americans and other people of color and LGBTs. If those Newport cigarettes are still allowed to be sold in Palo Alto, they will find their way into the hands of young people. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bob. And we have one final speaker, Corinna. Corinna, you have two minutes. Karina, go ahead, you have two minutes. You may need to unmute from your side. Karina, do you wish to speak? Karina, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, I just want to know, you know, clarify everything that is going on. Yes, I get, you know, the use of vape is wrong, but also the use of beers. It's not fair for the community as well. Yes, we're going to, if we ban this vaping, at the end, people are going to go back to, you know, using black market, using, they could go to the liquor, get, I mean, oh, they're over 21. They could also get beers that have flavor and it's not fair for other other retail that are small that you know we have never experienced you know when they come in they're over 21 we ask for id i work in a smoke shop i've been working there five years if anything you know i have gotten customers that said this has helped me quit smoking cigarettes rather than you know even the smell of it even when they take a shower they feel uncomfortable you know being with their partner saying you know the smell of the cigarette was the worst thing and now they're using vaping that they say it has the flavor that is not uncomfortable you know I just feel it's not fair for if it's going to be equal even like the other person was saying if it's going to be equal make it as well for the beer the, that I'm done thank you Karina and that's our final speaker Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everyone uh, for those comments. We now return to council and if we could put the motions back up on the board. So I see a hand from council member Ku and just a reminder, we're speaking to the substitute motion, which would continue our previous action. If that fails, we can get back to the, the primary motion. Council member Ku. Thank you. Um, so I, I wanna say thank you to uh, council member Cormac and to council member Tanaka for um, putting forward the substitute motion. Um, um, just, just to repeat some of the things that the um, general public had mentioned, Blythe Young said that enforcement will be a nightmare. And it's true. We have no way to enforce. We've cut our police force. We've cut our fire department. Our public safety is reduced. 
there's no way to enforce. So enforcement here is going to be a nightmare. If, and we need to take responsibility for, uh, for ensuring that this is not easily attainable or accessible to the youth in our community. We need to give our youth an opportunity to grow up to have a healthy mind uh, and to have a good education. So this is, this is one way. And what concerns me a lot is also that it's reaching into our middle school. The middle schoolers are also getting it. So it extends to younger and younger and younger ages. And that is something that as a healthy community and a healthy city, we need to ensure that this is a product that is not gonna be sold here in Palo Alto. Um, somebody also said that um, Fremont had eight adult stores and they also have decided that they're going to ban tobacco sales. So it's time, it's time that we make sure that we, we do the same thing, that we take our youth and the health of our community um, as a top priority. Um, you know, our uh, higher elected officials, such as Senator Hill and Berman, and also Supervisor Samidian and Eshu, they've all taken up this, this, this action to protect the youth and to protect the community. Um, as uh, one of the community members said, Trisha Barr, it's time for us to adopt this and to make it happen in Palo Alto and not leave loopholes by providing exceptions and exemptions. So again, thank you to Council Member Tanaka and Council Member Carmack for bringing, putting forth the substitute motion. Thank you, Council Member Ku. Any other speakers on council on this main motion? Okay, so just a couple comments. Um, I won't be sup supporting the substitute motion as the vice mayor mentioned, and I agree with pretty much everything he said. I think our entire council supports uh, making this purchase of vaping devices in Palo Alto illegal. I think everyone is there for that. And that is a good public health purpose. It's a good social purpose for our city. Uh, what worries me is that when we first debated this, we expanded it to affect the adult only stores, which are many of them are longtime Palo Alto businesses that sell tobacco products to adults. And I have some hesitation about prohibiting that. I, I do worry on the one hand that we are driving longtime businesses out of Palo Alto. I think it is a bit of a government overreach and a bit parochial uh, to say that, you know, thou shalt not buy a legal product here in Palo Alto. So, so that worries me. Um, we'll vote on the substitute motion in a moment. If it fails, I'll commit uh, on the main motion to breaking it up into sections, um, but that won't matter if, if this main motion passes. Any other comments before we vote on the substitute? Okay, um, continue our practice from last night. Let's vote in remote or in reverse order, please. Uh, Council member Tanaka? Yes. Council member Ku? Yes. Council member Nis? Uh, you're on mute. No. Thank you. Uh, I vote no. Council member Philseth? Yes. Council uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois? No. Council member Cormack? Yes. Okay. The substitute motion passes four to three with myself, the Vice Mayor, and Council member Nis dissenting. So that essentially means that the original discussion we had a couple weeks ago carries forward. Thank you all for that. Thank you very much to our members of the public for engaging again on this item. Uh, I know it was perhaps a bit tedious to discuss it again. So thanks to my colleagues as well. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a five minute break and then come back for item number one, the sustainability and climate action plan. So I'll see you all at 640.
Can anyone hear me? Yes. Because it says that my video is um, turned off. Uh, Nelly needs to turn you back on. The co-host has asked you to start your video. Okay, so <laughs> it's a new message. There you go, all set. Yeah, so a good part of today, Ed, was the testing. Good. Even if I don't. Even if I don't like closing Max Porsche smoke shop, but I like the um, the testing, sort of, you know, feels justified. Did you take a picture with the banner outside the front door? No, <laughs> and you know, I, I'll do it tomorrow. We need I to just, get that. They, they I, said no photos. They said no photos, no videos to protect privacy. Gotcha. Well, we're outside. I think we should all go outside, get Outside, they had a sign saying no photos, no videos. So. But isn't the banner up high or not? It's um, what I'm banner? Not sure. We have a banner outside. I actually it's think it was. He wants to take it, a picture. I missed it. It was on barricades <laughs> up front, so they they put it closer to the street than the the building itself. So I think it was actually more visible. Yeah, there's nobody around the banner. But okay. I'll do that tomorrow. Well, after that banter about the banner, um, let's return. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Uh, let's return to our meeting at 6.43. Um, on to item number one, direction to staff to continue with the 2020 Sustainability and Climate Action Plan SCAP update and evaluation of potential goals and key actions. Um, just a quick reminder to my fellow council colleagues, staff, and our community, um, sustainability in the context of climate change is one of our three council priorities um, for this year. And we have been dealing with a series of crises, which maybe has uh, washed over this one a little bit, um, but we are glad to see it. And I know staff has a presentation and a lot of public interest. So if staff would please kick it off. Director Eggleston, are you leading this? Uh, I will kick this off, yes, thank you. So good evening, Mayor Fine and council members. Uh, Brad Eggleston, Public Works Director. Uh, so just as a reminder of our recent past on April 13th, we had a study session to review the sustainability climate action plan update process uh, and the sustainability work plan for the council priority. So at that study session, uh, community members and also council members expressed interest in making sure that we have proposed key actions for the update process that are robust enough that we'll be able to achieve the city's 80% by 2030 carbon reduction goal. Um, and council directed that we come back with the key actions before having our consultant AECOM start the impact analysis that will um, ultimately lead to recommendations for the SCAP update. Mm -hmm. uh, so since that time, our multi-departmental team, which uh, like last time are all in the meeting tonight, mm -hmm. has done some additional work on the goals and key actions based on the community and council mm -hmm. input. And we're here to share this tonight and to hopefully get your direction to proceed with the SCAP update next, step, next steps with the consultant. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Christine Wong, our sustainability manager for the presentation. Thanks, Brad. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, um, it's me again. Um, so tonight um, we are going to review the 2020 Sustainability and Climate Action Plan potential high impact goals and key actions related to greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And while all seven of the 2020 SCAP areas are important, three have the highest potential for greenhouse gas reduction. And those are energy, mobility, and electric vehicles. Um, and that's what, we'll, we, that's what we will be focusing on tonight. Um, we're also going to introduce the concept of a range of various levels of intervention necessary to achieve Palo Alto's SCAP goals. Mm -hmm. And we hope to get council feedback on the potential high impact goals and key actions before they go to a common analysis, as Brad mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so um, even though our overarching goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2030 um, relative to our 1990 baseline, um, we do just want to point out that we have several equally important goals in the following areas. These are the team leads for the seven FCAP areas. And unfortunately, I'm the only one speaking tonight, but 
The entire team leads for energy, mobility, electric vehicles, and water are all here tonight so they can answer any questions that you might have. Um, so we solicited a lot of feedback from the community on the draft goals and key actions um, through a virtual on-demand community engagement workshop, through our sustainability website, and at the last April 13th Council study session. In addition, we presented the 2020 SCAP, the, the first draft of the 2020 SCAP goals and key actions to the Utility Advisory Commission on May 20th. Um, the UAC provided their thoughts, ideas, and recommendations for what staff should think about as we roll out more ambitious goals and key actions um, and uh, before they go to AECOM for analysis. Um, and uh, the UAC also posed several questions, um, including, but not limited to, um, how will the key actions be financed? Can we achieve our targets through incentives alone? or do we need to implement um, stricter measures? And should natural gas offsets count towards our 80 by 30 goals? And while the UAC didn't take any action on the 2020 FCAP potential goals and key actions, all the UAC commissioners signaled their support of continuing the carbon neutral gas program, um, which is supplied by carbon offsets. So um, this is a very familiar chart. You've seen it many times. Um, and basically, the main sources of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions are simple. Um, a third comes from natural gas consumption in buildings, and two-thirds from gasoline and diesel vehicles. Um, so this chart shows our 2018 overall greenhouse gas emissions from both Palo Alto municipal operations and community-wide emissions in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, starting with our 1990 baseline. Um, and the red line here um, shows you our transportation emissions, um, which is Palo Alto's largest remaining source of greenhouse gas emissions at about 64%, followed by natural gas use, which is the solid blue bar at about 32% of the remaining emissions. The shaded blue bar represents Palo Alto green gas offsets. Um, which have been used as a bridging strategy. Um, the carbon offsets are being purchased in an amount equal to the greenhouse gas emissions caused by natural gas use within the city. But as you can see, um, the natural gas use has not really changed in the past year, few years. So in order to meet our 80 by 30 goal, we need about 300,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, to uh, reductions to meet our goal. So we incorporate, as um, Brad mentioned, we incorporated community input to update the 2020 SCAP potential goals and key actions, which will be the foundation for the 2020 SCAP. Um, and as Council requested at the April 13th study session, we're returning tonight to review the updated goals and key actions before they go to AECOM. Um, the high impact goals and key actions for greenhouse gas reduction that we're reviewing tonight are a subset of the full list of updated 2020 FCAP potential goals and key actions. And we're highlighting the goals and key actions tonight that have the highest potential greenhouse gas reduction. Um, these goals and key actions are from the energy, mobility, and electric vehicle areas. Um, we, as you can see, the energy goal, um, we don't have a set target yet uh, because we need to uh, get more data um, from the impact analysis that AECOM will be conducting shortly. Um, so we know we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the direct use of natural gas in the building sector. We're just not sure what that target should be yet. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that um, for the first time, our mobility and electric vehicle goals, the main goals are the same. So they are to both to reduce transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions 80%, from approximately 300,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to 60,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2030. And they both have different strategies for getting there. Um, but that also means our mobility and our electric vehicles teams are going to be working much more closely together to achieve these goals. Um, and we are also including key actions that could be difficult, expensive, and or inconvenient to achieve. Um, some of the potential key actions we're going to share tonight will require additional legal analysis, 
and coordination with other agencies, such as the California Energy Commission, before being presented to council again for final selection. Some of the key actions might require voter approval and could ultimately be included in a potential ballot measure. So we've grouped the key actions. Um, the, the key actions are grouped um, into the areas of highest potential greenhouse gas reduction. So we, while we don't yet know the exact greenhouse gas reduction potential cost and sustainability co-benefits until AECOM completes their analysis, we do know that these are the four areas that have the highest potential to reduce greenhouse gases. So uh, these are to electrify most residential buildings. Um, and after AECOM does their analysis, we're going to come back to council and present a range of options that could potentially add up to between 15 to 20 percent of the remaining reduction needed, the, the, um, depending on the, you know, the proposal that council selects. Um, the second is to significantly reduce fossil fuel use in large commercial buildings, which could potentially add up to 5% of the remaining reduction needed. Um, significantly reduce vehicle miles traveled. This will require a lot more modeling from AECOM and fair and peers to get a sense of how much we could re realistically reduce VMPs. Uh, we're guessing around 10 to 20% of the remaining reduction needed and finally, to electrify the vast majority of remaining vehicle trips. So we can, and I would just like to note that we can implement key actions that reduce BMT related to commuting, but we can't prevent people from driving to run errands or socialize or drive their kids to work, um, or sorry, drive their kids to school or things that are completely unrelated to commuting to work. Um, but what we can do is to encourage the electrification of those remaining vehicle trips. Um, so we'll be asking AACOM to break the work into these four main parts, um, the largest components of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as we introduced in the staff report, um, this is the spectrum of tools for achieving climate goals. So the, key, the range of key actions that we could select go from our current voluntary market-driven solutions on the left, um, through the middle column with ordinances, um, et cetera, um, which we've also used, um, onto the right-hand column, which is the voter-approved mandates and potentially voter-approved fees or taxes or bonds, where we're going to have to do some very heavy lifting. Um, so once council hopefully directs staff to proceed with the evaluation of the updated 2020 SCAP goals and key actions, AECOM will then estimate the greenhouse gas reduction potential, cost, and sustainability co-benefits, such as improved local air quality or reduced cost of living of the potential key actions. Um, and this impact analysis will provide a range of costs per greenhouse gas reductions that will have various options along the spectrum. Um, and staff envisions using the impact analysis to come up with a set of potential key actions that allow multiple options to get us to our 80 by 30 goal, as well as trigger points for when more interventions are needed to achieve the targets. Um, for the next two years, we might need to focus on the lower cost areas um, and lower certainty key actions, um, depending on how the pandemic plays out. Um, but we're going to need to explore different funding streams, such as ballot measures, bond measures, or establishing a carbon fund so that we can uh, meet our 80 by 30 goal. So um, these are staff ideas for the most dramatic reductions based on public input and staff expertise. I'd like to note that we did not filter anything out based on cost or feasibility or legality. Um, we created everything here for now so you have an idea of all the possibilities um, and we'll work on feasibility uh, concurrently with the AECOM analysis. Um, so these high impact actions do not represent all the work that the city is doing or will be doing related to climate change and sustainability. Uh, we've numbered them to make it easier to refer to the specific key actions but they're not numbered based on priority. Um, so for the energy area, 
we proposed a range of 18 key actions. These are the key actions with the highest potential for reducing greenhouse gases in residential buildings. These high impact key actions are not mutually exclusive um, and are all presented here to give council a range of policy options. So for example, if we implement key action number four, which is to phase out fossil fuel use in existing buildings and disconnect natural gas to residential areas by 2030, then we wouldn't have to do one, two, or three. However, number four also needs to go under some serious legal review to see if the city even has the authority to do something like this um, and may also need voter approval. These are the key actions with the highest potential for reducing greenhouse gases in non-residential buildings. Um, I'd like to point out number five, which is requiring all commercial buildings above 25,000 square feet to reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. This is modeled after New York City's building emissions law and may need a green building code amendment. Um, the commercial buildings above 25,000 square feet represent 75% of the total non-residential square footage in Palo Alto. Um, this could potentially also cover city-owned facilities. Um, if we choose to electrify existing city-owned buildings, then we would be leading by example, which I think is also very important. Um, and that's why number four is on the list. So for the mobility area, we proposed a range of 11 key actions um, with several sub-actions. These are the key actions with the highest potential, what, what we think is the highest potential for reducing greenhouse gases from transportation or vehicles. Um, and I'd like to point out that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the tra transportation sector by either electrifying all transportation or reducing the amount of emissions from road vehicles by switching to less polluting forms of transportation. Um, and it, because it generally takes about 15 to 20 years for a vehicle fleet to turn over without city mandates or intervention in the market, conversion to electric vehicles in Palo Alto will need to be accompanied by shifting to cleaner travel roads if we wanna hit our 80 by 30 target. We can do this by implementing key actions such as number five, um, improving our transportation demand management strategies, including encouraging telecommuting. And number six, using land use to reduce vehicle miles of travel by thoughtfully locating people close to goods and services they need so they can more easily walk, bike, or take transit to meet their needs. For the electric vehicle area, we proposed a range of 15 key actions. Uh, the ones here are the key actions with the highest potential for reducing greenhouse gases from transportation or vehicles. Um, I'd like to point out number five, uh, ban the registration of gasoline vehicles in Palo Alto by 2030. This could achieve 50% of the remaining greenhouse gas emissions reductions needed. Um, but obviously this uh, needs to go under legal review to see if the city has the authority to do something like this and may also need voter approval. So in terms of next steps, AECOM is creating a citywide greenhouse gas emissions inventory, as well as a business as usual forecast. For the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, they are working on providing a more accurate methodology for calculating our transportation related emissions, um, which haven't been updated since 2016, and will include airport emissions for the first time. Um, the AECOM will also uh, conduct an impact analysis on the draft key actions that will estimate the greenhouse gas reduction of the potential actions, the estimated costs, and the additional sustainability co-benefits, such as improved local air quality, preservation of habitat, reduced cost of living, or reduced socioeconomic disparities. Um, we've solicited feedback from the community on the key benefits through a virtual public forum. Um, we are also seeking feedback from the Utility Advisory Commission the Parks and Recreation Commission, and the Planning and Transportation Commission. Um, and the results 
of the ACOM impact analysis will help us further refine the goals and key actions needed to get us to our 80 by 30 emissions reduction target. And we hope to present a package of options to council in the early fall. Thank you for your time. Uh, we recommend that council direct staff to continue with its work on the 2020 FCAP update. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Eggleston, any last comments or Mr. Bobo? Uh, no last comments. Uh, we're very interested in, the, in your questions and discussion. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go to our members of the public. So if you'd like to speak on this item, please do raise your hand uh, and the city clerk will help you to provide your comments. Thank you, Mayor Fine. At this time, we have nine speakers. Our first speaker is Dan Adams. Dan, you will have two minutes. Dan, go ahead, you have two minutes. Dan, you may need to unmute from your end. Yes, can you so, hear me now? There you go. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, convey how, how important uh, this action is towards uh, uh, city's sustainability goals. Um, I absolutely believe that the 80% target by 2030 is essential. And really, I can't think of anything more important for the future of Palo Alto, having a meaningful um, cultural goal that the city buys into. Um, this is for really the, the future of humanity, and we might as well start locally here. Um, I think uh, uh, I did notice that the SCAP says the city is fully committed to a sustainable future. And I think it's important um, for us all to believe, really, this should say the people of the city are fully committed. And that it's really the power of the individuals in the city who can make a huge difference um, in our footprint in general. And so I encourage us all to, to frame this all as things that will drive towards um, lifestyle changes, behavior changes, building smaller houses, driving much less, using less energy, less hot water, heat, air conditioning, wasting almost no food, eating less meat. These things are really the things that will make the difference. And uh, unless the people of the city are committed to this, I believe lots of these actions that are uh, currently in the SCAP plan might not be successful. So um, uh, I uh, um, applaud this uh, motion, uh, this momentum, and think it would also be great to figure out how to pull the citizens of the city into this with great enthusiasm uh, and support. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Our next speaker is Don Jackson to be followed by Sandra Slater, then Tom Cabat. Don, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, honorable council members. As a UAC commissioner, I've spent a lot of time studying, reviewing, and discussing the SCAP constituent areas of energy, water, and electric vehicles. Earlier today, I emailed you a thorough write-up of my proposals and suggestions regarding updated SCAP goals, and I urge you to read and consider them. Tonight, in the interest of time, I will confine my spoken comments to my most important request. To date, we are failing to meet our energy efficient energy electrification goals by a large margin. I believe a key contributing factor is that many, if not most Palo Altans, are simply not aware of the negative environmental impacts of natural gas and the need to eliminate its use. I myself was completely ignorant of this issue prior to joining the UAC one year ago. If we are serious about our electrification goals, we need to make significant changes. The first step should be a dramatic call to action, a proclamation alerting Palo Altans that we must start taking action to eliminate our use of natural gas and that it is our stated intent to shut down our gas utility at some future point, maybe in 10 years. 
Such a statement should be a key element of the updated SCAP. And additionally, I'd propose that this proclamation then be sent to every Palo Alto home and building owner. Firing this shot across the bow would begin to solve the current lack of awareness problem regarding electrification and get people thinking, planning, and talking about how to manage this transition. In my email, I outlined specific actions we should then take and how the first $15 million to fund electrification is easily within our grasp. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Sandra Slater to be followed by Tom Cabat and then David Cole. Sandra, go ahead, you have two minutes. Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. I'll keep my remarks short because I know everybody wants to get on with the business of hand and have an early evening for a change. I just support, I just heard John Jackson's comments and they were spot on. Um, natural gas is so pernicious and we do need to get uh, rid of it. So I support everything that he um, said. And our 80 by 30 goal has been adopted and the community is behind it. And staff has worked really hard on the SCAP and I think they've done a really good job outlining what ACOM should study. And we'll have to let the data that ACOM delivers drive our decision making. So I encourage you to make the programs that ACOM studies as robust as possible. Only then will we have a roadmap that's data driven and that will allow us to make informed decisions going forward. We know what the problem is. Climate change has been addressed quickly, uh, needs to be addressed quickly and with ambitious programs, even with our parallel crises. We certainly have those in spades these days. We haven't made much progress in the last several years, but we do have a lot of ammunition in our quiver. Education, incentives, levies, ordinances, financing, land use, building codes, just to name a few. So we got to identify what the barriers are to get these programs in place and figure out how to get them implemented. The real work will come when the data collection and analysis are completed and we have to make hard choices on how our collective footprints can be reduced. It's gonna to require tough trade-offs but we're a progressive community that values our environment and the health of our planet. Please know that the community is here to support the staff's recommendations and we urge you to allow the study to approve ACOM and staff to work expeditiously. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Our next speaker is Tom Cabat to be followed by David Cole and then Justine Burt. Tom, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hello, I'm Tom Cabot, a retired utility resource planner from Palo Alto. I worked for 30 years in the gas and electric utilities there, uh, really enjoying the challenges. I live in Menlo Park and now I'm part of the Menlo Park Environmental Quality Commission. And we are also working hard on the climate problem and we are so gratified to see the strong steps you're taking in Palo Alto. We look forward to seeing what we can do to work together on this problem. When we look at the sea level rise maps, even just three and a half feet of sea level rise is devastating to Palo Alto and East Palo Alto and Menlo Park. Together, we've got to be able to figure out the ways to make the inspired leadership that, that can grow the same way we've been able to do with reach codes that are now flourishing across the state and spreading. We need to be doing that with other measures for electrification. Your staff is doing a good job at teeing this up for you, but, but we are now in a race to see what we can do to save these communities and to have a worldwide impact by showing the bold leadership the world expects from such a well-educated and wealthy area as ours. So I really look forward to working with you more on this and uh, you can count on our support. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Our next speaker is David Cole to be followed by Justine Burt and then Kevin. David, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, if you look at the familiar graph that we've seen for a long time now, we've seen that we've been flatlined since 2013. So we really need to get this effort in gear. Um, the UAC had some good questions. Uh, financing, yes, we need to have on-bill financing to do this. Otherwise, there's not enough money in the, in the city to do this. We must allow the community to buy into this at a nice, easy way with on-bill financing. 
they ask if incentives alone will do this. The answer is no, it will not. Uh, we've had incentives for a couple of years now, and we have made almost zero pro progress um, with those programs. So we need to move out of that left-hand model of easy things, less certain to middle or mandatory items. Uh, should we continue with the offsets for natural gas? The answer is no. I think you just took those out of the, um, <clears throat> the budget. So those are not in there. We should spend that money on real reductions, not on throwaway money. Um, the staff suggested other reductions for energy less than 80%. And I don't think that adds up to realizing our goal. We need to have 80% reduction in each, in each of the areas to reach our goal. Um, Don Jackson made some great points and uh, we need to really get started on this. <clears throat> this is the second time we've gone through this iteration. We did this whole same thing with Gill. We had a community meeting. We had all of um, the actions outlined, too many perhaps. And now we're doing it all over again with another analysis with a different um, consultant I want to see council direct staff for real actions to meet this goal. Um, and let's see if we can get that done. Thank you. David. Our next speaker is Justine Burt to be followed by Kevin and then Brett Anderson. Justine, go ahead. You had two minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I applaud the city council and the mayor for their aggressive goal to reduce greenhouse gases 80% below 1990 levels by 2030. I'm just so proud to live in a city that's willing to do that. I have a slightly different reason um, for wanting to make this happen. Last year, I published a book about creating millions of green jobs called The Great Pivot. And now that 40 million Americans have applied for unemployment, and in California, 4.6 million Californians have applied for unemployment. There was recently a University of Chicago report by three economists that said 42% of these jobs are not coming back. And so all this important work that, that needs to happen to retrofit buildings for electrification, to get rid of natural gas, space heating, water heating, and cooking, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure that needs to go in, the protected bike lanes that are gonna make the 50% of Americans who would like to be able to bike don't feel safe sharing the road with, with drivers. All this work takes people and it's going to create jobs. So at a time when 4.6 million Californians are not working and many of those jobs are not coming back, I think this is an investment well spent that will give people's lives meaning and purpose as we build a sustainable future. So thank you for your continued leadership on climate change. Thank you, Justine. Our next speaker is Kevin to be followed by Brett Anderson and then Dashiell Leeds. Hello. Kevin, go ahead. Okay. I thank city council for continuing on the SCAP plan despite our current situations, but we, we all recognize that climate change is still a very big problem that if we do see actual physical changes like sea level rise or flooding, we're going to be a bit late for any kind of change. As other people have recognized that in our past five, seven years, we've basically made no progress. We've tried to kind of hide it with offsets, but as we see in our current financial situation, offsets themselves are not sustainable. Therefore, we should be taking aggressive yeah. action with all items no, kept on the table until we actually get the data from the consultant saying like, maybe this isn't as effective as we want it to be. So to match the 80-30 rule plan we chose as a city, we should go for like 80% below 90, 90 levels for like natural gas direct use. We should increase the amount of EVs in the city. We should target 100% of buildings for phasing out fossil fuel use by 2030 and such strong actions to demonstrate to the world how we are leaders in protecting the environment since we are going to be a role model and we should be a role model for the rest to follow to grab to change the entire region and so on and so forth and as such i hope that the city does choose such aggressive actions thank you thank you kevin 
Our next speaker is Brett Anderson to be followed by Deshaun Leeds by, and then Tina Chow. Brett, go ahead, you have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I would just like to um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you about this um, 2020 SCAP planning process. Um, I'm glad that staff has come up with a list of actions that do align with 8030 um, because we've been really missing that since the 2016 go round. So I think our ambition level should remain at uh, trying to achieve that 80% reduction by 2030. And I think the, um, the list should be considered open. I don't think what was presented was the complete list of things that will get us there or we'll have to do to get us there. Um, but that we have to keep in mind that what we do need in the end and to reach very fast is, is a policy or ordinance or rules that require us to use electric and low carbon solutions in place of gas from now on because we're we're wasting a lot of money and locking in a lot of um, carbon emissions by in furthering the investment in gas in business as usual. Um, the barriers to adoption or say the barriers to actually getting the approval of, of the public to pass those ordinances to require electric, I think can be reduced by the city. The city is in a very good position to reduce the barriers to adoption and make it easy for people to um, implement electric solutions. I mean, we've got control over, a lot of control over the rates, the electricity rates and the gas rates. Those determine how, um, how much savings are had over the life of the equipment. Uh, we've got a billing system that can recover the costs over the lifetime. And we've also got a planning department that determines the efficiency and safety standards we reach with our codes and the permitting process. So all of this is really in the hands of the city to make it happen um, and make people, um, willing and able to invest their money for electrification and carbon reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Our next speaker is Dashiell Leeds to be followed by James Hindery and then Star Teach Out. Dashiell, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hello, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm a uh, conservation assistant with the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Uh, we hope the city council tonight will direct staff to continue working on the SCAP and to continue the evaluation of potential, potential major goals and key actions. And we'd like to thank staff for including some very strong uh, energy, mobility, and electric vehicle goals. As far as the three GHG reduction targets given to city council, uh, we strongly support option C, which is 80% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, staff also noted in the report that they had received a recommendation for a reach goal of 100%, and we support reach goals like that as well, since um, by setting ambitious targets, uh, we can sort of give other cities the motivation to set similar targets, and it can transform ideas that may seem far-reaching to um, incredibly reasonable, as long as there's a consensus. Um, I also think that there's a particular measure, which is electrify 80% of existing city-owned buildings by 2030. Um, given that the city should have a lot more control over uh, their own buildings, specifically retrofitting them, um, I think this target uh, could be either achieved in a smaller time frame or perhaps a larger percentage of buildings. Um, also, we know the discussion tonight is only a subsection of the larger SCAP and that there are other key sustainability areas, um, such as the natural environment, uh, climate adaptation, and sea level rise and water also that will not be discussed tonight. Uh, we believe these items are extremely important and I think that they could likewise benefit from council review as is being done tonight. Um, specifically, so one comment on um, the natural environment, there was language removed from the major goal, uh, regeneration of natural environment. And that language was uh, maximize biodiversity and the stewardship of flora, fauna, air, soil, and water resources. Um, we think it would be really helpful to reinstate this language as a goal. And these resources, particularly for uh, should be listed under key performance indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Dash. Our next speaker is James Hindery, to be followed by Star Teachout and Kelsey Baines. James, go ahead. Hi there, Council. Um, 
I just wanted to say that I think um, lifestyle choices is definitely not are going to be a solution. Um, I know that's def that's not the the scope of, of this whole meeting, but but I, I heard it was mentioned by by several people before. I think lifestyle changes um, on an individual level um, aren't going to provide us the changes that we need. Um, I'd like to echo the statements um, from Dashiell and uh, agree with him that the electrification of city owned buildings uh, should either be 100% by, by 2030 or uh, that 80% figure by a, by a much sooner date because the city does own those buildings. And if we are committed uh, to climate, uh, to focusing on our climate and leaving a better world for our children and our grandchildren, then I think this is something that we need to, to treat with urgency. Um, and, and 2030 is, is not urgent in my, in my understanding. Um, that's, that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you, James. Our next speaker is Star Teachout to be followed by Kelsey Baines and then Alice Kaufman. Star, you may need to, un there you go. You have okay. two minutes. <laughs> Great, do you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I just want you to know that I too strongly support your continued work on the SCAP to meet these uh, 80 by 2030 goals and want you to know that you have some strong community allies and uh, really encourage you to be a true leader for other cities in our nation as Dashiell Leeds mentioned earlier. Um, and although, you know, I totally agree with James Hindery's comments about um, the city making these electrification improvements in the infrastructure of city buildings, I really do feel it's important that we give some of our attention to lifestyle changes. If only to have that, that support from citizens for any other major changes that we need. Um, in 2019, during our city sponsored cool block challenge, we ran our household under some consumption constraints and we continue to meet the 2030 targets in, in our family. And we're pretty happy and definitely well fed. Um, I'm an active parent in our Palo Alto schools, and during the remote learning phase, I've seen many families being more thoughtful about living a life that's less reliant on driving. Some of that, of course, is forced, but I feel we're in a unique opportunity to capitalize on this and help our residents make more permanent changes in their driving patterns by diverting some of their needs to bicycles. And more than that, I really feel we can simultaneously tackle some of the social isolation which exists in most modern communities. And um, I think with civic support, we can really pull together a closer community and uh, a purpose-driven community, which uh, will benefit everyone. So um, I think as Brett Anderson mentioned, you know, we, we have many of the puzzle pieces in place in our infrastructure, and I wanna encourage you to keep working on these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Star. Our next speaker is Kelsey Baines to be followed by Alice Kaufman and then Tina Chow. Kelsey, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, council members. Uh, and thank you for continuing to prioritize climate action during this difficult time. Um, I also wanna thank staff for improving uh, the SCAP uh, study plan with our feedback, um, which was great to see and appreciate the emphasis on electrification and seeing housing density and land use mix as part of the plan. Um, it's really important that we look at housing density and land use because we are not going to meet our climate goals without meeting our housing goals. And uh, my only gripe uh, with this plan is just that uh, electric vehicles um, and really just cars um, gets equal footing with all other forms of mobility um, as well as land use. And I would like to see um, appropriate emphasis be given to the potential impacts uh, if we made some bold decisions about how to utilize our land uh, more for people and less for cars. Um, 
And I would encourage you to look at uh, UC Berkeley has a cool climate tool uh, that shows what local policies could be adopted and what their impact on GHGs would be. And for Palo Alto, the most impactful policy we could enact is infill development. Um, so I would just like to see a greater emphasis on land use um, so that we could be changing our built environment so that we can get people out of cars, give people more transportation options um, and safer ways to get around the city without a car. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Our next speaker is Tina Chow to be followed by Shawnee Kleinhouse. Josie Gillard is our last speaker. Tina, go ahead. Hi, this is Alice Kaufman, I think I was next. Yeah, you are next, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you said Tina Chow. Yeah, no, my error, go ahead. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Alice Kaufman. I'm the Legislative Advocacy Director with Green Foothills. We're a, a nonprofit environmental organization working to preserve open space and natural resources in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. I wanna thank you for the work that you've done so far on the SCAP. And I just wanted to note, uh, there's been a lot of mostly discussion tonight, and I agree with most of the comments that have been made. Um, there's been a lot of discussion tonight on the importance of reducing emissions. That is really important, but um, we also need to remember that the impacts of climate change are already with us. There have been multiple studies that have shown we can expect over three feet of sea level rise by mid-century. And that's why it's so important, and we really applaud the city for doing this, to, have, to make sure that the SCAP includes not just emissions reductions, but also adaptation strategies. So prioritizing climate adaptation in the SCAP is really important, including consideration of strategies for managed retreat. The Bay Area has more development at risk of sea level rise than anywhere else in California. That's a lot of homes and businesses that need to be protected. If we start now, we can plan ahead and relocate critical public facilities as opportunities arise, as well as private development. We can plan for how to allow tidal marshlands to migrate inland with rising seas, and we can incorporate natural, natural shoreline protections such as horizontal levees and work with nature rather than against it. So we urge the council to continue to prioritize climate adaptation and responses to sea level rise as part of the SCAP. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Our next speaker is Tina Chow to be followed by Shawnee Kleinhouse. And our last speaker is Josie Gillard. Tina, go ahead, you have two minutes. <laughs> Tina, go ahead, you have two minutes. I'm trying to, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, City Council. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley, and I echo so many previous speakers here tonight in emphasizing the importance of meeting our 80 by 30 goal. The SCAP calls for elect electrification of new buildings, which is fantastic. And there's also a huge opportunity in remodeling existing homes in Palo Alto. I think Palo Alto should take the lead in making it easier for residents to retrofit their homes with all electric appliances. Last year, we were faced with major repairs to our home and we took the opportunity to convert our home to 100% electric. It felt great to do this, but it was super hard. After finally finding contractors who had any experience with electric heat pumps or water heaters, they would tell us that, oh, this won't work in your house, or we're gonna charge a premium for working in Palo Alto because of all the extra steps required by the city. We heard so many stories from friends and contractors where they just gave up and went back to a gas water heater or furnace. These obstacles can be overcome in Palo Alto by setting new policies and improving the permitting process to make sure that more experienced contractors are willing to work in Palo Alto and to make the process easier for everyone. This should include creating incentives for low-income residents to go all electric too. We're really happy with our new electric heat pump, water heater, and solar panels, and we no longer worry about gas leaks or a gas line breaking in an earthquake, and there's no risk of carbon monoxide either. And with solar power, our electric bill is zero for much of the year. I wanna see this be easier for everyone to do. Energy use in buildings accounts for a quarter of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot of room to take action here. As we saw in the report, natural gas is still a large contributor to our city's emissions. As you build all these exciting plans to get us to 80% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030, please make it easy for existing homes to be converted to all electric. 
It will take time to convert all the buildings in Palo Alto. So we need to start with these new policies now, not in a few years. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Our next speaker is Shawnee Kleinhouse to be followed by Josie Gallard, our final speaker. Shawnee, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm a Palo Alto resident and the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. I wish to add support to many of the comments that were made tonight, especially those by Dasha Leeds and Alice Kaufman. I served on the Citizen Advisory Committee for the Palo Alto Master Plan Update, Parks Master Plan, and Urban Forest Stakeholder Groups and other forums in the city. And I worked with others to include our biological flora and fauna assets and all our beautiful landscapes into our city planning, both for parks and for the urban landscape. I'm a biologist. I read a lot of documents and recent scientific studies. And many of them show that our planet is going through a biodiversity crisis, extinction crisis. Studies also show that cities can support urban nature by focus on native plantings and creating connectivity through the city for pollinators, for birds. Native trees and plants are critical to achieve and sustain a true natural environment in cities and support biodiversity. There was a very recent study in LA that showed just how important sycamores and native oaks are to the bird life of LA and how almost uh, no use was that was there for the other um, trees. So I'm disappointed that we, uh, that this stuff has removed some of the more important um, goals that we had before. And I would ask that you retain the goals that were in the original plan and uh, put as key indicator, the number of native oaks and sycamores in the urban forest, and also a key action to require 80% native plant cover and trees in stormwater and street infrastructure installations in the future and in city parks. And maybe we need 80 native plants by 2030 as a requirement in the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Shawnee. Our next speaker is Josie Gallard, followed by one final speaker, Julia Zetlin. Josie, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, city. Thank you, city council. I'm Josie Gaylord. I serve with Tom Cabot on Menlo Park's Environmental Quality Commission. And as he mentioned, we're doing something similar to you. We're revising our climate action plan. Tom and I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to figure out how can our city reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. And it's interesting, we've come to very similar conclusions to the staff in the goals that you're proposing. The staff is definitely focusing on the right strategies and they're proposing some bold goals. We would support enactment of, for example, um, to remove natural gas from your buildings, the goal of 80% emissions below the 1990 level by 2030. We think this is critical as natural gas is such a pernicious problem in fighting climate, climate change. The other thing we've seen is looking at sea level rise maps for our city of Menlo Park. We have about a billion dollars of real estate, which is at risk, very likely to be flooded, perhaps as soon as 2060. When I look at those same maps just a little further south in Palo Alto, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm just terrified to see how much of your city is um, predicted to be underwater. So I, I would urge you to continue to seek bold goals and be willing to embrace a bold leadership position. Menlo Park is thinking about many similar actions to you, so you're not alone. If you're interested in regional collaboration, because we're all stronger together in taking these actions, I would think that Menlo Park Council would be interested in that. So in closing, I applaud you and your staff for the plan, the bold plan that you've put forward and uh, look forward to seeing your bold next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. And our final speaker is Julia Zetlin. Julia, you have two minutes. Thank you so much council members and staff for working on the SCAP, especially during this difficult time. 
I'm the hub coordinator of the Sunrise Movement in Palo Alto, a youth-led climate action organization and a Palo Alto Youth Council member. I strongly support the council's work on the SCAP and their work to achieve the, the 80 by 30 goal. I have two main points. Our organization believes that we should not need to rely on natural gas offsets and must find more sustainable and actionable ways to reach our goals. We also think Palo Alto should engage in partnerships with other organizations and councils. In particular, we heavily advocate collaborating with East Palo Alto Council members in these climate action plans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. And that's our final speaker. Thank you very much, Clerk Minor, and thank you all of our speakers. We really appreciate your input. Uh, so we now return to council. I'm going to suggest we have a round of questions. Uh, first hand I saw was council member Philseth. Well, I had, uh, I had, uh, I had, I had more than a questions, but uh, maybe I can do this in five minutes. I do have a couple of questions. So first of all, um, I want to commend staff. Uh, this is uh, the most concrete and quantitative uh, uh, work on this topic that I think I've seen, and uh, I very much appreciate it. And so I, I want to commend staff for doing that. Um, second, um, uh, a couple of folks, the gentleman from the Sierra Club and a few others pointed out, uh, and they're absolutely correct, that uh, uh, emissions is not the only environmental axis we need to worry about. And they're absolutely right about that. Um, sea level rise, habitat destruction, uh, massive extinctions. We haven't even talked about water in the West. Um, and they're completely right about that, but I, I wanna talk about emissions in 8030 here, really. Um, so I really like staff's description of low, medium and high intervention. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, should, should we interpret what we've done so far as low intervention? Uh, this is Brad. I, I would say that in, in general, our programs have been low intervention. Uh, they focused on education and incentives primarily. Okay. And so but before I go on, I want to uh, say first that uh, we, we in this city have done a great deal of good work in this area. And uh, we are ahead of nearly everybody else uh, in the country, maybe in the world, if not in fact really ahead of everybody else. And I think we ought to feel really good about uh, the progress we've made and what we've done. That said, as a number of people have pointed out, it uh, uh, doesn't seem like we're on track to hit 80-30 uh, with uh, the low intervention uh, uh, methods we have done. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the staff assessment here, uh, it looks to me like in order to get to actually do 80-30, right, 80% reduction over 1990 uh, uh, levels by 2030, we have to go to some very high intervention things. And in fact, uh, it looks to me like there's really two things, okay? One is we gotta turn off natural gas, and the second is we gotta ban petroleum cars. Uh, and concurrent with that, invest heavily in the uh, charging infrastructure for EVs, both uh, in public spaces and residential. And basically all the rest of this stuff is nice stuff to do. It's good stuff to do, but it won't move the needle uh, the way that turning off natural gas and banning cars uh, will do if we really want to get to 80-30. And I'd like to ask uh, Christine, would you agree with that assessment? Um, yes, I would agree with that assessment. Okay. So it seems to me that where we are today, and I'll use a sort of uh, uh, a phrase that we didn't hear from the speakers, so I'm gonna try my own label on this. We, we're kind of in a cognitive dissonance situation. On the one hand, we're doing lots of good stuff. On the other hand, we're not gonna hit 80-30 and we know it, okay? And so it seems to me that we are faced with uh, three options here, okay? Uh, and only three. Uh, and not to say that we shouldn't, uh, I think, you know, it makes sense to go out and ask a ACOM to sort of further refine the analysis here. Uh, but we're going to very quickly come up to three options. Uh, one is we got to go to high, either a, either one, we have to go to high intervention uh, activities uh, and specifically turning off natural gas and banning cars. Okay. Or number two, we have to revisit 8030 
and modify either the 80 or the 30 or both. That's two, okay? Or three, we can continue with the cognitive dissonance uh, where we are uh, and uh, where 80, 30 is kind of aspirational uh, and we still keep sort of doing nice to do low intervention stuff, but we are not gonna get to 80, 30. Um, but it's gonna get harder and harder to do that as we get closer and closer to 2030. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, we, got, uh, we got sort of a, 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 a fork in the road with three directions to go on here. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Council Member Philseth. Uh, next I had Vice Mayor Du Bois. Um, and can I add one more thing? Sure. Uh, uh, I don't mean to be gratuitous here, but at some point we're going to have to, if we're really going to do 80-30, we're going to have to recommend, recognize that there's, there's potential conflict with some, uh, some social justice goals as well, uh, particularly uh, adding lots of population because you can't add people without adding emissions. Thanks. Can, can I add one? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Brad again. Just um, to elaborate on my earlier answer about incentives and education, I would point out the work the council's done uh, and staff in the last year with starting to use reach codes uh, to really push electrification and the fact that we, we are starting to move to the right on that spectrum. I would add, Brad, that uh, carbon neutral uh, electricity is also at least a moderate intervention given it is occurring again at a utility scale. Uh, but, I think uh, that one's huge. We've got a huge amount of mileage there and I, it's, it's yeoman's work. We've done a great job really focusing on, really looking forward at what do we have to do the rest of the way. No, I, I wouldn't under, underestimate that at all. I think we're, we're, we've done magnificently at that. Okay. Um, I actually want to pick up on a bit that Eric started to touch on and how, how are we going to plan to use the consultants and are there areas um, where we can manage these consulting costs? You know, what, what if we just started on some of these solutions? Like where do we really need help and where do we already have good ideas and we know what we need to do? Well, from my point of view, um, a lot of the, the expertise the consultant has uh, that, that they can really help us with is to look at uh, the good ideas we think we already have and try to help us understand uh, with the different ideas how far along on the, the spectrum do we have to go and model the, um, the impacts and carbon reductions that we'll expect to see from taking those actions. So, you know, there's certainly staff on hand that have worked on these issues, uh, but I don't think any of us feel that we're in the best place to look and say, uh, with what level of in incentives, say for heat pump water heaters uh, versus uh, different types of mandates or, or voter ballot initiatives, uh, the, you know, the differences in what we can accomplish. Okay. Well, I would just encourage staff to, you know, don't underestimate your own expertise and really use the consultants where they can help. But, uh, you know, I, I really think we can, we can lead in a lot of these areas. Um, it's some of the public speakers, speakers mentioned um, changes to key indicators. And I have to say the staff report we were given um, has a summary and then it lists a lot of community feedback. Um, it seems like we should have been given the, the current draft of the goals, the key actions, and the key indicators report. Um, I did find that doc online. Is that the current doc? And, um, you know, should council be, be providing feedback on those, uh, on those key indicators and key actions? Uh, Christine, could you take that one, please? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, we're sorry that, so the, that the, document you're referring to um, was included in the staff report, but it might have been buried a little more than we should have. But yes, the document on the sustainability webpage is the full updated goals and key actions that also shows how we incorporated community feedback. Okay, but the actual document was just a link, I, I believe, right? Uh, correct. Okay. Um, 
I guess I'll go into some comments until until I use my time. On the mobility side, I really think you know we need to consider the impacts of COVID and what we've learned in the last couple of months. You know, I think there's a huge opportunity to double down on um, what we well, what I think was listed as kind of uh, rem remote work options, um, and I'd really like to see that elevated in this plan. I think as we look at kind of a new normal, um, really having some indicators that focused on remote work focus, not just for city employees, but citywide, uh, could be just as relevant as, you know, one of the key indicators was a uh, proportion of residents within a quarter mile of frequent transit. Um, that might be less relevant in the next couple of years if the transit agencies are stressed and there are fewer commuters. So I, I really think we should make look at those key indicators, make sure we're measuring the right things. Um, and then again, the big one is really electronic electric vehicles. You know, like you said, ultimately people do need to get around. Um, and I, I'd really like to understand how we move the needle there. I like the idea of becoming known as EV city and setting a goal for EV ownership in the city, uh, the focus on daytime charging, and then really understanding, like you said, um, you know, could we could we go for something like a, a tax on fossil fuel cars? Um, you know, doing uh, doing one of the the, the larger items as uh, Councilmember Phil Sutz was suggesting. And then um, another question that came up, you know, are there barriers for the city itself reaching 100% electrification in city-owned buildings? Um, well. Uh, as public works director, I'll take that one. Um, the biggest barrier right now is, is that we hadn't set this goal until recently. And so we haven't done that study. And um, actually in the coming fiscal year, uh, we have a, a capital project that's for doing a condition assessment of all uh, city buildings. And as part of that, we're going to be looking at what's needed to uh, electrify those buildings and developing a plan uh, along with what those costs will be. Okay, but do we know we have some operation that requires something other than electricity? That's a good question. Uh, not, nothing's coming to mind immediately. Okay. Great, I'll, I'll get out for that study. Um, I think I'll stop there for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, next is Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Fine. Um, this is a fantastic staff report. I know I don't say that very often. Um, and I know I made the motion to make you guys come back before the break. Uh, I think it really paid off um, because these five pages are exactly the level of information that's helpful to us and will be helpful to the community, right? Everybody can read these five pages and start to get a sense of like, yeah, I really think that's important. Climate change is a huge deal. Here are the things we need to do to get there. So. I, I just can't give you enough compliments um, for, for this report. Everybody take that, take that for just a moment. Okay. Um, Council Member Filsa, thank you for laying out all of our options. I decline option three and I'd prefer not to do option two, um, but this, this spectrum is showing us that uh, we have to go to the high intervention. We simply have to go to the high intervention and the two things that are gonna move the needle are natural gas, as uh, many, many of our commenters discussed earlier. Um, and difference between encouraging people to have an electric vehicle and saying, you, you can't register a gasoline vehicle, right? Great to put us all the way, this is exactly what we asked for a few months ago, take us all the way to what it's gonna to take to get there. Um, I, it's interesting to talk about the telework part. Um, I think we need to remember that our major industries here in the city, our largest employers are healthcare and education. And while some things can be done with healthcare, with telehealth um, and telemedicine, much of healthcare and education is really hands-on. So um, certainly our hotels and restaurants and personal services, I wouldn't want people to get the idea that, you know, a vast majority of our workforce um, could work from home two days a week. A, based on the kind of work they do, and then B, also just thinking about what people's environment is at home. So I just, um, it's certainly interesting and we, we should think about it, but I think we have to keep in mind what our, our major industries are. 
Uh, I appreciate the speakers who mentioned adaptation strategies. Um, it is frightening to look at the maps for Palo Alto. I know I say this every time, but when you run that simulation and you see the blue just sort of spread over on the bottom, um, we do need to keep sea level rise there along with um, all of this uh, other work. Uh, and then just to touch on long-term funding, um, thank you for bringing that up. I think we're gonna need to consider that in context of all of our needs and all of the methods that we might have at our disposal. Um, so, if we did something like a parcel tax, we've talked about that might be for affordable housing. I think it's also possible we might want to consider at some point a parcel tax to pay for all the services we want that um, visitors have been paying for. We've just gone through this uh, budget cycle. Um, but then if we shift gears and look at a bond, I think there are a couple things that could be in there. One would be electrification. Another, of course, might be train crossings. The third, of course, might be coverly. So while I'm intrigued by the idea of long-term funding, I want us to do it in the context of all of the needs we have and not make that decision um, separately or individually. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the spectrum and how much I like it. Um, I feel like the low side is beta testers and the sum is sort of where we are now. And it's probably part of why we all felt a little uncomfortable. Like we're trying stuff, but we don't really feel like it's moving the needle. Um, and then to go to the high side, that's really what's going to be required for scale. So I'm um, super grateful to staff for doing this. I think we should be sharing this five page thing widely. Um, not sure it really fits in the coronavirus uh, twice weekly email, but um, you know, this is really important information and just the right level. Um, so grateful to the staff. Um, definitely worth thinking about how much we want AECOM to do, but um, I'm I just can't say how pleased I am. A little scary to think about what we have to do, but thanks for that. Council Member Ness. I feel a little guilty after I go in and said such wonderful things about the report and the report is wonderful. However, looking at the three that thank you for laying those out so clearly, Eric, where this one says, essentially, um, no gas in your house, uh, nothing but electric cars on the road. Did I hear you correctly? Oh. It looks to me like from the report. Love to hear different, but that's what that's what the report looks like to me. Right. Okay. So let's let's say that let let's say that's pretty close. Brad, do you agree? Uh, well, pretty close, but I think that would be closer to, to a 100% reduction from 1990 levels. Okay, well, we can take it in the middle than the 80-30, but let's, let's just for the sake of discussion and uh, you know, the reality of it, for everyone to be driving an electric car by 2030, what do we think, what would that take? So I said, let's just get practical for a minute because this is as, aspirational, of course, certainly number three, as we said, was aspirational. But if we were really to get there, we heard a woman earlier say, they had to work their, their heads off to all electrify their house last year. They had trouble with the city, they had trouble with, their, with the contractor, he, uh, he truly didn't wanna do any work in Palo Alto. They're delighted with the, with the outcome, but the path there was rocky. So, so given that we have, we've put out some pretty high bars here, what do we think about people's ability to be able to get permission where they, where they need it to do that? And do you think our system, our per permit system is substantial enough to do that? And secondly, we, we need to put out something about what we think it's actually going to cost the average person to do that. I mean, most of us do not live in a house that's all electric, including me. So any comments? Uh, I'll make a couple comments and then uh, ask if, if Shiva wants to weigh in, but um, that is a huge challenge and it goes far beyond, I think, just uh, the willingness of of individuals and households to, to go electric. Uh, so we also need to think about uh, the city's infrastructure and, and the ability to support that. 
we need to think about having a charger infrastructure in place and whether that all that charging is going to happen uh, at night when we're taking in other power sources or, or during the day when we have more ability to have solar energy uh, and frankly ha having the right mix of different types of EV chargers in people's homes, uh, at workplaces, in our commercial areas. Shiva, something you'd like to add? Well, yes, and, and also you might, might weave in with this. I have to think of how many houses we build a year, roughly 150, am I close? It, I think it's, it's something, order. In so, something in that range. 150 houses, we have 25,000 households. We, we've got a we've got a mountain to climb. Anyhow, I, I interrupted um, before we heard from where is she, Christine? Well, Shiva didn't jump in, so he, he might Shiva, not have sorry. had anything for now. Right, I, th I do think, Councilmember, your your reference to what it would take for market turnover and uh, actual uh, uh, reinstallation of personal infrastructure at scale is a huge issue. And uh, both, you know, we talk about um, uh, maybe it's it's easy for us to talk about banning things, but to incent actual action to conversions. That's a that's a whole other um, uh, level of uh, engagement uh, that, uh, again, uh, identifying the strategies that will get people to move is is a big issue. I mean, part of uh, when you speak uh, to electric vehicles, the rate at which vehicles are replaced is also an important factor. Uh, and while we might think that 10 years is a long time for a fleet to turn over, reality is it is not. And uh, so those, those are many of the considerations uh, going forward. The fleets turn over. I don't know how people in their cars turn over. And that while we do have a pretty high number of of vehicles in our community in particular. Um, what I hear when I'm at the air board meetings is a constancy of not having enough chargers, especially in apartments, especially not having superchargers where they're needed. And, and if we're really going to say no cars or no, um, no one who's not driving an electric vehicle within 10 years, we, we should face that we really have a lot of work to do to get there. Great, great goal. But um, you need some realistic stepping stones along the way. Uh, um, Director Brad, I didn't have anything to add to your to that discussion. Oh, there you are, Shiva. Oh, thanks, Shiva. <laughs> Is that all, Councilmember Ness? Um, I think that's a fair amount. <laughs> I've just thrown out the gauntlet and saying, okay, what is it? And I think we should actually, as a city, put down some numbers. What does it really cost to, to take your house and make it all electric? It takes, I mean, in addition to just fortitude to come up against the city and all of those um, requirements that we have and permits. In addition to that, there's money. There's some actual really outlay of, of, of cash. So I think we ought to, and as much as I love what we're discussing and totally support where we're going, I think having some idea, this is hardly a figure in this report, we should have some idea of what something would cost. I'm not sure at this point, if we went to electric water heaters, what that would cost at my house. And probably most of you don't either, unless you are looking at electric water heaters. I, I would know. Five minutes. Uh, be so practical. Yes, uh, so if I might just note, uh, Council Member, that in your uh, agenda packet for next week's uh, Council meeting, I believe on the 22nd, one of the actions you've got is related to a new agreement with the Empowerment Institute for the Cool Blocks program. That as one of the, uh, one of the elements of that program is block level electrification incentives and looking at what it would take to scale uh, that conversion uh, using the cool block model as a as a way to get there to to the earlier discussion doing it one household at a time one household owner at a time is quite frankly not likely to get us there uh, so looking at it more at the block level is a more scalable um, module 
uh, through which we'll be evaluating that program. So I'll look forward to that discussion. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, I also want to thank staff for your work on this. Um, it, uh, overall, I thought it was really good work. I mean, I, I wish we could go further. I think uh, protecting the environment, trying to reduce our greenhouse gas is actually critically important. Uh, we, we all see the polar bears and all the other news stories about this. So it's, it's definitely uh, a real concern. I just want to speak kind of what off uh, what uh, Councilmember Nis was talking about because I actually had my own recent experience. So my my hot water heater broke, and I thought, great, you know, it's a chance to try to get a, you know, go all electric. And I suppose if you plan this out, if you're not, you know, you're not in a house with no hot water, you could probably do it if you had like months to months or quarters to make this happen. It's probably you know very very doable, but when you know your whole family doesn't have hot water, um, it's, it becomes like a very urgent issue to fix. And I think a lot of people actually um, contemplate new water heaters when the water heater breaks. But I, you know, I was pretty determined. So I, I, I did all the research that I think the other speaker, uh, I think Trisha, or I forgot who, who spoke about it, but the other public speaker who spoke about it. And it is, it is incredibly expensive. You know, it was like you have to run a new panel you have like the place where I had my water heater wasn't big enough to have enough circulation of air. Um, I mean, it was like, and there were new wires inside the house too. There's all these permitting fees to, to make it happen. It was like, I mean, it was really, really, really expensive and, was, and not just expensive, but taking a long, long time. So then what do you do in the meantime when you have no hot water, right? Do you just take cold showers? Like what, what, what's the, so I, I think the point of like, there's only 150 new houses built every year. So you can only do so many houses, you can only, you know, transition so many houses. But I think there has to be some sort of, because I think what's going to happen is people largely are going to change the water heater when the old water heater starts breaking. I mean, there's, there's a few people who are super proactive and can think way far in advance and, you know, take two quarters to kind of figure all this stuff out and line it all up. But a lot of people, when the water heater runs out, they think, oh, maybe I can, I can make some changes. Um, so anyway, I, I looked at it and looked at the amount of time, the amount of cost, and it is, I think it's going to be prohibitive for most people because we're not, we're not we're talking about like not just like 30 percent more 50 percent more we're talking like it could be like an order of magnitude more money and and i think in order to make this easy we gotta there has to be kind of a smoother on-ramp to allow people especially when they're um especially when they're trying to fix their, their current water heater otherwise you have to get a temporary water then you're buying two water heaters and you're like well why should i even do it so um and and i think the other thing is um there's also uh, natural gas prices are really low as, 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 as well, maybe not, not necessarily in our city, but in general, they're pretty low. Um, and so it, 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 um, if, if you're trying to create the economic incentives, you also have to kind of think about that. Um, and then uh, I think there's also maybe easier on ramps to, um, to um, uh, encourage uh, homeowners when they're thinking about trying to go all electric. And one of them is uh, and I spoke about one of the other council meetings, but is there, there's various companies now, there's like, I think three or four companies that will take your air conditioning um, condenser and dump the heat into the hot water heater. And it's kind of doing what a, um, what a uh, heat pump water heater is doing, except it's actually cooling your house as well. And so um, it's, it's, it's an easier, I think it's easier install. So maybe the staff could look at that to, um, to offer that and or perhaps even have rebates. Um, I mean, it's something you actually buy now at Home Depot and Moles and other places or even on Amazon. And the other thing to uh, think about is that um, there are also ultra efficient gas water heaters that are lower cost and really, really small carbon emission because they're, they, they, they consume very little energy. And I think the other thing we should think about is how much, how much, what is the carbon footprint? Like, I, so I looked at my house and it's like major renovations to, to go all electric. And like, what is the carbon footprint of having to demo a bunch of stuff, you know, pull a bunch of new copper wire, um, you know, break open a bunch of drywall and do a bunch of new, I mean, like, like some major renovations. I almost feel like I should redo my house at that point um, versus maybe going, to, maybe, you know, Having ha allowing people to dump their their AC condenser heat into the into the water heater, um, or going to some sort of ultra efficient water heater. Um, so just something to think about. I, I don't necessarily have the answers, but I just have some personal experience 
uh, of trying to do this because it's, I think a lot of people want to do this, but when they start looking at how much it costs, like $5,000, $10,000, it's like, wow, you know, you could have bought yeah. like a lot of water heaters for that. So even a very, very efficient water heater for that. So it's, um, and, and not just right. the cost. Did you get the water heater? You know, I, I you know, you, you can only put up with no hot water for so long before your family starts complaining seriously. Right? So your, your family is like, okay, so where's this hot water? Like, how long do we like go, hot, you know, so, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, I, I think even for people, and I was, I was pretty committed to trying to do this, but it's, it's like really like there's so much stacked against you. And, and there's some people who can persevere, but I think when they persevere, they already have hot water heater. They, they already have a working water, hot water. If they don't have hot water, I mean, there's like a big time constraint where you just, it's like, you got to get hot water after a while. These people, are, you know, people, I mean, maybe I'll put up with it for a while, but like after a while, people are just like, okay, you know, the family's up in arms about having a working hot water heater, right? So, um, so anyways, um, so anyways, I think the point to staff is just, I think we got to figure out, in order to really do this transition, we got to figure out an easy on-ramp uh, for existing houses. Otherwise, it's a lot of people are going to be in, in kind of my situation. Um, and then um, uh, the other part is, uh, yeah, so a lot of our carbon footprint is transportation. So I, I do agree with what the vice mayor said. I do think that remote work is, is something that is, because of the pandemic is going to be fairly common and we should pick it back upon that and maybe encourage it and enable it. Like, I mean, I've been trying to get like gigabit ethernet now. So that's, you know, having fiber to the home or having a really high speed connection is actually really important to a lot of people to enable work from home especially if you have the whole family, you know, like remote learning and, and, you know, on Zoom calls all day long, it becomes, becomes really important. So I think, I think the enabling us to better internet, um, but also, um, also like my current provider can't, doesn't, doesn't do gigabit ethernet. There's one other choice, but it's a little bit expensive and still trying to get that going, but. Um, Five minutes. Okay, but anyways, uh, I have one other item after this, but I'll grab some, I'll just finish this thought and then uh, I'll go off the next round, but I think um, I think uh, I think there could be a lot of incentives or other programs in place where people don't actually have to do the commute, where they can work from home. So I think that's a great way to uh, make some headway on this greenhouse gas. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Ku. So thank you. Very quickly, I just wanted to bring up the natural environment. Uh, I mean, uh, especially now that we're being sheltered in place, you know, um, we have much more cleaner air because there's less driving. So in terms of telling, telecommuting, that's really something that I would be very interested in looking at too. Um, and then, you know, the trees, um, you know, that's another one of the most natural and most least, least expensive way for clean air. So I wanted to kind of find out, you know, um, if that's something that the council decides on moving forward is how do we, how, how, how is that compared uh, to, you know, turning off the natural gas and banning petrol cars and, you know, everything that council member uh, Phil Seth had mentioned, but to have part of that as a complementary plan. Um, you know, how to integrate also the urban forests with uh, storm water um, and green roads. Um, it certainly helps to improve the habitat and also um, the trees and also the plants help um, support pollination um, and provide these corridors for birds and biodiversity. Um, I also wanted to um, mention, you know, I don't know if staff had looked into um, you know, New Zealand has this campaign about the One Billion Trees campaign and moving and it helps with moving forward sequestration uh, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And it shows that the non-native plants often grow faster compared to the native plants, but they also decompose faster. And so it helps to accelerate the release of almost 150 percent more carbon from the soil. So, um, you know, some of these natural things would be really nice to have, especially, you know, they do also go beyond just helping the environment. Um, they also provide aesthetics um, and they have beauty and there's also, you know, um, life that comes from it. So that, 
I mean, everybody has said everything else. So I'm hoping that, you know, this is another area that we do not forget about. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo, um, and thanks all my colleagues uh, for the comments. A couple um, for myself. So, Council Member Philseth, thanks for laying out our three options. I think there may be a few uh, permutations between them, um, but I agree we, with Council Member Cormack, we may have to look at some of the higher level interventions to reach our 80 by 30 goals. And if we don't reach that, so be it, um, but we should make a good faith effort there. On some of the energy issues, um, really appreciate staff's report. A few quick comments. Um, we, we've heard from a lot of people about natural gas offsets and whether they should count. I think especially as we look at using them more in future accounting, we may wanna consider backing them out. We've used them less previously compared to what we're going to be using them in the future. Um, and I think some people see them as an accounting maneuver. Um, so, so maybe a little more diligence there. Um, agree with some others, electrification is vital. Uh, a question though, how do we get tactical on that? Um, you know, whether it's on bill financing, electrification mandates, uh, I would say both those areas probably deserve broader community discussion. Uh, I know when we've talked about electrification before, um, you know, there are certain community members, business owners, restaurants who are not terribly happy with that. Uh, on bill financing and potentially opting people in rather than or opting them in by default rather than allowing them to opt in themselves uh, probably needs some more discussion in our community. Uh, the key actions around mobility, uh, really appreciate that. Some of the mobility services like an electric bus, internal combustion tax, safer bike and pedestrian infrastructure, uh, appreciate all those. Uh, some of the land use ch changes. I heard a quote a few weeks ago um, that transportation planners are left to clean up the mess of the land use planners. Um, so maybe we have to look at the interaction there a little closer. In terms of EV construction, especially in uh, multifamily buildings, I would be interested in understanding those costs a bit more. Um, would they impact our, uh, our additional goal of, of housing development in Palo Alto and how much? Um, in terms of some of those goals though, whether it's the bike and pet infrastructure or the ice tax mobility services, do we need metrics to measure those? Like, do we need something such as a certain number of miles of bike lanes to achieve the goal? And that, that's just staff, that, that is just one kind of pinpoint, but do, do we need more tactical goals to achieve the, the, the broader goals? Sylvia, you wanna take a crack at that? Yes, sure. Um, we need a lot of metrics. That would be a, that, but that bike lane mileage is something that we always track. So I did not include that there. Um, for for the sustainability um, for sustainability sustainability plan, we're we'll take suggestions for additional metrics. But we are, um, but we need. I, I included the metrics that I felt that matched these particular key actions. Okay, that's helpful. I, I guess there's just like a nesting of metrics that, you know, council and the community may benefit by seeing over time. Um, and, and related to that, you know, is how do we measure, you know, general council actions on a given night against those? And so I bring that up because last night, you know, on the one hand, we funded a contract for energy efficiency services and projects. Um, we also extended an auto parts contract and a parking study. Um, and I think sometimes we, we miss opportunities, even though all of those services are vital, um, we, we maybe miss alignment with some of our, our broader climate goals. So just, just a comment there. Um, one last set of comments on the housing strategies, um, really appreciate staff calling that out. Um, again, will staff point out where our political decisions maybe impact our climate goals? Um, you know, are we measuring opportunity costs for not building housing, whether people are driving here when they otherwise may have a shorter trip, uh, BMT talks to that, but do we look at per capita emissions of residents and visitors? Um, anyways, I, I don't need answers for those, but just, just a few ways of thinking of, of our broader decisions and how they relate to this. Um, otherwise was, was really happy with this report. Um, do appreciate it. Think we should continue it. Um, but there are a couple areas that 
seemed sensitive enough to me to merit uh, broader community input. So those are my comments. Um, before I go for a second round, does staff need a motion here um, or just endorsement of continuing this? Uh, that is the motion we're looking for. It's just direction to continue with the, the analysis step. Okay, thank you. All right, um, let's go to a second round, but if anybody would like to make a motion, um, given we're almost an hour behind, that would probably be uh, welcome at this point. Uh, Council Member Tanaka, then Vice Mayor Du Bois. Um, so I'll just continue on. So my other comment here is, uh, I don't know if you guys have been reading the papers about, um, or news sites about um, the boom in electric bicycles, but, uh, you know, because a lot of people are worried about, you know, st stuffing the cells into trains or, or subways or whatnot. And so the sales of bikes are just taking off. Um, and so I, I think one thing that I've been thinking about as I, as I saw the report and your presentation is, um, you know, so I think when we think of electrical vehicles, we all the time just think about cars, but, um, you know, with cars, you still have parking and traffic challenges. And uh, with, you know, a scooter or a skateboard or a bike, I mean, it's, it's so much smaller, you can have 20 of them the size of a car sometimes. So, um, so in terms of incentive, I, one thing I'll be curious for staff is, have you guys looked at incentives, not just for buying electric cars, but buying, you know, electric bike or electric skateboard or electric scooter? I don't know if staff could talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not aware of any work we've done to incentivize those purchases yet. I'll, I'll ask anyone else to, to, uh, to jump in if they are. That's uh, a good point. I can speak to that a little bit. So we have funding for electric vehicle rebates. Sorry, my camera is not turning on. Um, this is Shiva from Utilities. Uh, but we haven't, uh, we are considering providing incentives for um, uh, by electric bikes, but we haven't finalized that yet. Okay. Is, this, is this open to like just bikes or is it like skateboards and scooters or, because I think we want to encourage all forms of, of like mobility and it's a heck of a lot cheaper than a car. It takes a lot less space to park and um, it uses less energy. So I, I think we, I, I think, in fact, I would almost argue that having a electric bike or a scooter or skateboard is actually better than having a car because it has less impact in terms of traffic and less impact in terms of parking. And so if someone's, because a, a lot of people maybe not, are not in the best shape, but, you know, with an electric bike, it gives them like superhuman power, right? So they, they feel like they could really bike almost anywhere. And I think that's why the sales have taken off. And so I, I, I just think that, and, it's, and, it's, and I think the dollars that, that go towards electric bike, because the bikes are so much cheaper than a car, they go a lot far, like further. They have much, much higher return on investment. So I, I was just, if, not, if it's not part of it, I don't know if staff could start looking at this because I think I've seen this from other cities now and it's very encouraging. And I mean, I think already the sales are taking off like, like a rocket, but I think, if we want to get more, if we really want to try to meet our, our greenhouse gas objectives, this is one easy way of doing it without spending a heck of a lot of money, right? Yeah, so we will consider that. We are doing a point of purchase rebates for electric cars funded by the utility. It's a statewide program. We are trying to get that same statewide program to also try to fund a point of purchase rebate statewide. So that's one of the directions we are looking at. So you're trying to, you're trying Let me just to add, it. if I'm my council member, and this may be stating the obvious, but timing is everything. Uh, as you may recall, we were launching our uh, scooter share program uh, just before COVID. And, you know, again, recognizing the concerns about spread of the virus um, with shared vehicles uh, that's not active at this point. Uh, that is hopefully a momentary blip. And, you know, the, the entire scooter share industry has been up, up, turned upside down as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, but I do believe that uh, one way or another, uh, as we come out of uh, the pandemic, there will be a new iteration of that. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally get the scooter share and I hope that comes back. But what I was really talking about is if you're giving money to, for someone to buy a car, an electric car, maybe some of that money could go towards buying an electric bike or electric scooter or electric skateboard because the, the environmental impact of that is way less um, in terms of energy usage, in terms of, parking footprint, et cetera. So that's really what I was talking about. I, I, 
Yeah. So yeah, so it's great to hear that staff will look at that. Um, and then the other part of it, like the other challenge with owner, owning an electric bike, and probably you guys, you guys probably see this on next door, is like, oh, my new electric bike got stolen, right? I've had like three bikes stolen here in Palo Alto. And so I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's almost a, something built to be stolen because it has wheels and, you know, there's only so much you can do to lock it up. But I don't know if there's, whether there's better patrols, better cameras, I don't know. I mean, I think probably everyone here has gotten a bike stolen. But how do we, like, how do we, like, um, cause that's the other big bummer. It's like you get your, your brand new electric bike stolen. It's just like a big downer. How do we, how do we as a city, I mean, this is kind of a, almost like a solving world peace type of problem here, but like, how do we, um, uh, I don't know whether, whether we're mending a bit more bike racks. I don't know. I mean, what is, what, what's the solution here? But I, I think that's something that's something else to think about. Um, and I, I think, so I talked about the ownership part, but I think the other part of it is usage. So. Um, you know, I think we have really great bike infrastructure. We're flat terrain, but the challenge I think we have is, um, I think we got like the avid bikers like myself, I'll bike rain shine no matter what, but, but like for the casual biker, I know that's, people are more hesitant for that. And one of the reasons why they're hesitant is really around safety. And so, uh, I don't know if staff has looked at this too much, but, and, and I saw it on a slide, you talked a little bit about it, but I think protective bike lanes helps get the next segment of bikers biking, right? And bikers like me are gonna, are gonna bike, but what about the next segment? And so I don't know if Steph could talk a little bit about where you guys are at on trying to, trying to enable the next class of uh, more casual bikers to start biking. Five minutes. Uh, Sylvia or Philip, can, can you answer? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Uh, we do have a bike plan update that we're hoping to kick off at some point in the next year. Um, it might be in the, the, year, the next fiscal year, depending on resources. And we also have a grant project um, to look at either buffered or protected bike lanes in South Palo Alto. So we hope to have a conversation with the community about that. Protected bike lanes are not easy to um, install depending on um, the land use context around them. So um, it's it's a lot harder to do. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I've done a lot of surveying around this because I've been trying to figure out how do we, you know, we already have a really high percentage of people biking, but I'm trying to figure out how do we get the next level of people. And, and the number one issue that comes up is safety. People don't feel safe, right? But if people felt safe, they would do it. And so, there's other ways than protected bike lanes, but I think, or separated bike trails, I don't know, but something where people, um, so like everyone here on the Zoom call would feel comfortable biking anytime, right? That's what we want. If we do that, then we get a lot, a lot bigger um, group of people biking than we do today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, um, so just, I do want to say um, that I do believe remote work is gonna become much more the norm. And uh, again, I think it should be a key indicator on improving our uh, transportation greenhouse gas numbers. I think in the report, it was talking about um, essentially offering incentives for offices that would commit to two or three days a week working at home. And I, I could see that, I could see you getting incentives. You'd have more space per worker, you would need fewer parking spots. Um, Going out of kind of the, the big three for a second, um, did want to note the comment on page 10 that Palo Alto is one of the few cities without advanced metering. And we've slowed that down with our budget cuts, but it's something I think we should get back to. And then um, I did want to pick up on the natural environment. Um, so currently our key indicators are tree canopy and reduction of pesticide use. And um, we have a factor of maximizing biodiversity, but I think we need a key indicator there. Um, and uh, so I'd like to ask staff about that. If we propose a change in the natural environment, um, I only talked through this a couple of years ago. I think it was on the SCAP then, it might've been um, a comp plan, but we added in um, some requirements around native plants. Um, and so I just wondered, would staff be supportive of something like that for a biodiversity uh, key indicator? Um, I believe believe we had it before. I'm not sure which document it was in. 
I, I think we'd be open to have something about biodiversity and we could uh, take that as a comment and go back to our uh, natural environment team. I don't think they're here on this call to, uh, meeting tonight because we were kind of more focused on the big greenhouse gas areas. Um, but we can work on that some more and with the community and when we come back to council uh, for the study session we're planning in the fall, have some more detail there. Okay. So I'd like to go ahead and make the staff motion to continue with the analysis and add, a, add that request that staff uh, look at the uh, natural environment and consider a key in, indicator around biodiversity. I'll second that. Do you wanna to speak to your motion? No, I mean, I think we've talked about this a lot. I think it was uh, overall a great report. And again, focusing on the type items, um, you know, I think that's where we spent most of our time. I think that's appropriate. Obviously things like water, water reuse, natural environment are also important. So I uh, appreciate the, the addition to the motion. Um, yeah, so I mean, agreed, great staff report, good discussion here. We need to continue the analysis on the natural environment indicators. Uh, somewhat agreed with the vice mayor uh, on, on expanding those. The one thing we really didn't touch on tonight is water, um, which is another key area. We can, of course, revisit that. Okay, um, so there's a motion on the table. I does, see. The, does staff need help with the wording there? It was, um, let's see, right. And ask staff to look at a, a key in indicator for uh, bio biodiversity. Bio. Okay, um, council member Nis then Cormac. Support the motion, but would suggest that when you come back, that we have some items that we could make, that we could create that could happen right away. Something that allows us to get to one of our levels, one of, one of our at least aspirational areas and give us an idea of what the cost would be as well as what the time would be. So um, I really like this. I'd like to get a bit more practical. Councilmember yeah. Cormack. Thank you, I'll be supporting the motion. I appreciate Council Member Nis's, um comments about costs um, to individuals and um, households. That, that's a thoughtful addition. Um, no surprise to anyone that I think the next step of this is actually communication. The staff has done a marvelous job of listening and taking information in, um, but I don't think the broader community is probably aware of this. And so, I think a component, something to think about from now until when you come back is not just how do we socialize the electrification part, but how do we socialize this decision, right? Are we willing to do council member Phil Sess number one? And it, it, if so, great. It, and if not, why not? And how does, that, how does that adjust what might happen in number two, whether it's the 80 or the 30, um, which again, not be my preference, but um, I think um, a little bit of thought over um, over the summer um, to try to explain this again, that those five pages are super helpful. Um, and if we can be helpful, um, let us know. Thanks. Thank you, council member Cormac, Ag agreed with you about kind of outbound communications. Uh, council member Philseth. Yeah, thanks. So I, I'll support, I'll be supporting this too. I think uh, uh, again, thanks to staff for the work that you've done so far. I think it's really good um, and the motion says basically, you know, it says continue, continue the good work. And I think the communication is a good ad. And I also think council member Nissa's uh, uh, observations on costs and so forth are, are important too. I think, I mean, I mean, the reason I bring it up is that we're going to have to decide between option one and option two and may, or maybe option three. Right. Um, and so, uh, I think a lot of the work that staff's uh, going to do going forward on this, you know, we're going to have to use that work to decide whether we're going to do option one or option two or option three. And I think it's going to get informed by this kind of stuff. And so I think we all kind of need to keep that in mind. And uh, we, we don't necessarily need to make, you know, hard decisions in August or something like that, but the, the time is going to come when we're going to have to do that. And, uh, and so I think this is, the, this work needs to kind of point us towards that. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Ku. 
Um, so thank you for the motion. I'll be supporting it too. I just have a question. Um, so when Council Member Cormack spoke about, you know, um, communications, um, have, have, has staff spoken to a lot of the business, um, you know, especially the restaurant and retailers that are here and uh, engage, their, engage their thoughts and comments? Uh, Christine, maybe you can follow up. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of specific well there there has been a lot of outreach when it came to to uh reach codes on electrification last year mm -hmm. and a fairly broad outreach to try to engage the community in the uh the virtual workshop we had and and to give input on our initial uh, goals and key actions i'm not aware that any of it was uh, specifically targeting businesses and restaurants um would that be a that's, concern that's correct we, we didn't do a targeted outreach, but out of the 204 participants in the virtual workshop, five were small business owners, which okay. was just by accident, but yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe I, I might just suggest that maybe it is a targeted one just because, you know, they're a bigger community and like, um, as council member Niss and Tanaka said, you know, that is a huge conversion, right? So thank um, you. I do want to point out that um, the REACH code that City Council has adopted only applies to low-rise residential buildings and staff is looking at um, proposing a, uh, a REACH code ordinance for non-residential buildings. So we will be doing further um, outreach to the, um, the business sector for the REACH code that applies to residential, non-residential buildings. Okay, thank you, Christine. Great, thank you all. So let's please vote and then we can take a break. Uh, Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Niss? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Council Member Philseth? Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Great, that passes unanimously. So thank you so much to staff, uh, our members of the public and my colleagues. Um, I'm gonna propose we take a 12 minute break or so, so till 8.45, uh, and then we will move on to item two. Thanks all.
Okay. Um, looks like all of us are here. Let's resume our meeting. It's 846. Our next item is item number two, review of the third quarter financial report and approval of various FY 2020 budget adjustments. And if staff has a report, let's start with that, please. Go ahead, Chief Financial Kylie, Chief Financial Officer Kylie Nose, reporting for staff. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hopefully tonight we just have a brief presentation for um, the council. Uh, what's before you is a um, fortified typical Q3 financial report. Um, staff typically prepares this report and it will be heard by the finance committee um, with no real action. It's just keeping uh, everyone apprised of where we're at. However, given the um, uncertainties and unique nature of this um, year, we've bolstered this report and used it to also include year-end projections for the general fund um, and specifically recommended adjustments so we can solidify uh, year-end estimates uh, and ultimately impacts to the budget stabilization reserve. So with that, um, we are really still in unprecedented and uncertain times. Um, beyond just COVID, um, there is all of the work that we're now taking on with our, um, the racial equity initiatives, as well as the new budget um, estimates. And so ultimately, the targets continue to move, I guess, is the, the main gist of this. Um, however, as of third quarter, uh, the financials were still within expected conditions. Um, mind you, the shelter in place took place or rather was ordered halfway through March. And ultimately really in uh, on March 15th is when we activated our EOC. And on March 16th is when we ratified that proclamation of emergency. March 17th is when the county issued that shelter in place order. And ultimately, if you think about Q3, that's January through March, you're looking at 15 days. Um, of your Q3 financials reflect the shelter in place order. So really the results of mean are not really materially impacted by this Q3 report. Um, so staff has done their best to update based on new information through frankly, April and May to the extent we have it to bring this report to you. As a reminder to the council and the public on May 4th, uh, staff and the city council reviewed forecast scenarios for FY 2020 and FY 2021. At that time, we estimated an impact in the general fund of $15 million to $20 million in fiscal year 2020, which is this year. And then there are three scenarios that were presented to the council that ultimately informed the decision of how to work towards 2021 financial planning and budget balancing. So based on all of that, here's what we know now. Um, initial findings on TOT have dropped about 95%. Um, and ultimately that's really uh, the very initial impacts of the shelter in place order. Um, in the staff report, there's a list of all the hotels that have actually closed. Um, there's over 10 hotels in the city that have actually just shut down. So no TOT is being collected in those areas uh, with a significant number of rooms impacted. The other thing to remind ourselves on the TOT side of things is it's not just occupancy rates, uh, but ultimately it's the room rates that are dropping as well. So you are hit on both sides uh, because as they are having less travelers and guests, those room rates are being significantly reduced. Um, so TOT is where we expect it basically with that, that significant drop. As a Context for a council, we typically receive about two to two and a half million dollars a month in TOT. Um, and we are in the 100,000 to $200,000 range for our first uh, COVID-19 month. Um, for DTT, so documentary transfer taxes, these are when real estate holdings um, transition, either commercial or um, residential. Uh, during the data that we have for the initial COVID period, uh, they are down about 45 to 50% uh, from prior year levels. Again, this is consistent with what we previously assumed uh, and what we forecasted through the end of this fiscal year. 
Sales tax. We still don't know sales tax. Uh, we don't even know sales tax for January through March. Um, we won't know those figures until July of 2020. And then ultimately the period of April through June, which will be the core shelter in place period, won't be available until October of this year. So we still are uh, in the dark a little bit on the full impacts of sales tax. So staff hasn't changed the estimates from that May 4th estimate uh, that was provided to council. Charges for services and licenses and permits. So activities that we charge uh, fees for services um, are unknown, but dropping. Uh, staff continue to work to refund classes and program fees, uh, and ultimately our facilities have remained closed for at least two months or continue to be by appointment only. So this is really impacting things like our um, development center revenues, our um, recreation revenues, or our um, outdoor or our classes uh, and programmatic revenues. And then the other one that this is impacting are major areas like our golf course, uh, where we had a full two months of inactivity there. Uh, and then the other piece is our expenses are tracking below budget. Uh, so overall, from a departmental standpoint, uh, ultimately, as you heard from staff, as we we're entering into this COVID-19 um, kind of essential services only period of time, uh, staff were highly focused on prioritizing our expenses. Hiring freezes were placed um, immediately. Uh, we looked at all contract expenses and have been pulling back on those to the extent possible. Um, so everywhere we can, uh, we have been pulling back on our normal financial activity in the general fund. And ultimately we're expecting to be able to achieve about $3.8 million in savings in both salary and non-salary across departments um, as a result of those efforts. This is inclusive of the administrative leave that has been granted, the authority that was given to the city manager um, to grant administrative leave through June 30th. Um, I can tell you to date all funds, not general fund, all funds, we've only spent about $1.5 million on those activities. So the next two slides are really just kind of looking at our revenues and expenses in the general fund for the third quarter um, by revenue category or expense category. And what you can see is really the initial finding, which is you really can't see the material impacts of COVID-19 in these Q3 numbers, uh, given the short period of time that they've materialized. So overall, you can see revenues are a little bit sluggish in 2020, with only 62% of the budget being collected through third quarter, whereas um, in 2019, we were at 65% of that budget being, uh, revenues being collected. So you can start seeing that tapering, but nothing to the magnitude that we'll ultimately see in Q4. Uh, and here are the departmental expenses. Um, overall, departmental expenses are at 60, were, through the third quarter, were 65% uh, of the 2020 budget. Uh, and the prior year in FY19, same period, we were actually 67% expended. So that's really about $6 million less this year uh, if I was trying to compare apples to apples. Uh, there's a lot of seasonality associated with our expenses. And so kind of looking and comparing to where we were at in a prior year is typically a good gauge uh, in terms of where we would be, uh, where our expenses would be tracking. Uh, compared to budgeted levels and ultimately year-end forecasts. So no, no major anomalies here. So ultimately, where are we at in terms of those FY 2020 projections? Uh, and this memo before you not only is obviously was an update on where we're at in Q3, but also recommends budget, budget adjustments to align the 2020 uh, budget with these forecasts in the general fund. So overall, there's a $23.7 million reduction in the general fund budgeted revenues. And this is uh, transfers in as well as net revenues. Uh, the major reductions are in those tax revenue categories, uh, primarily driven by TOT, um, and then also sales tax. Those are our two largest hits. So that would be overall in total a $15 million reduction in tax revenues. And then the reduction in other charges for services, licenses and permits and other revenues is $8.7 million. Um, so that would bring our total 2020 um, recommended budgeted revenue estimates to 209, basically $210 million compared to the original 2020 adjusted budget of 
$7 million. Um, so these, this $23.7 million reduction is pretty consistent with those May um, estimates that were provided to the council. Um, so ultimately, I guess the, the message here is the revenues are reducing as expected and as forecasted. Um, and and this is, these are the adjustments um, to reflect that. Now, as I mentioned, staff has been working really hard to manage the financials to try and mitigate that $23.7 million loss. So we've been trying to reduce our costs or pull back on projects or expenses wherever possible um, so that we don't need to take a full $20 million reduction to our budget stabilization reserve. And included in this report is a recommended reduction in budgeted expenses of $12 million. So this $12 million helps offset that $23.7 million reduction in revenues. The savings are recommended to be taken from savings or I guess reduction in programs um, are recommended to be taken in the salary and non-salary savings of departments. So there's no service level necessarily, uh, necessarily impact of that. That's reflective of our current staffing levels um, and our current spend that the council has been feeling for the last uh, whatever, nine months, nine, 10 months of the year. We're reducing the transfers to the capital improvement fund. So part of that revenue loss is TOT. And so that one for one transfer between TOT to the general capital fund, that's about 3 million. And then on top of that, the council um, with staff and per our BSR policy uh, approved transferring 3.5 million from our excess 2019 BSR. We're now crossing three fiscal years, so I apologize if this is confusing. Um, but ultimately, in 2019, we ended with a surplus in our budget stabilization reserve. And per council policy, um, that surplus, to the extent possible, goes to the capital improvement fund. So as part of mid-year, as part of our 2020 budget actions, we were going to transfer $3.5 million to the CIP. And so we're rolling that back. This was already factored into the 2021 budget balancing. This was already factored into the proposed budget that the council reviewed in May. Um, so no um, adjustments need to happen from that point. Uh, this is one of those reasons why it was so difficult for staff to find additional money in the CIP as part of the budget process, because we had already tried to scrape and change our estimates to the extent possible to try and help 2020. Um, we're reducing or eliminating some reserves. So we've set aside money typically for different things like special projects, the recruitment and retention, um, changes for operations, and then ultimately the development center has their own uh, special restricted reserve for feedback um, activities. And so we are recommending we reduce those programs and or reserves. So ultimately we would be um, canceling the recruitment and retention strategies uh, that were the kind of unique and um, ways to work with the HR team and our employee population, as many of those strategies have been uh, changed given the teleworking environment that we currently are facing. Um, so that's 1.6 million in savings. Um, we're recognizing savings for the city manager employment contract of about 600,000. This is the contract that council approved um, in December to satisfy the requirement by the charter for the city manager to live within Palo Alto boundaries. So there's 600,000 for that. And then these reductions are partially offset by two known investments that we need to make. Um, the racial equity work plan that the council just reviewed and approved last night, uh, trying to set aside some one-time funding to make sure that we can staff that and resource that um, as necessary uh, to ensure that's a successful effort and then the downtown bid, as we have been uh, refunding and giving back all of the funds for canceling the fees this year, uh, there's a negative balance in that fund. So we need to make sure that it stays solvent. Uh, and so we're transferring from the general fund to the downtown BIB. So the question ultimately is where does this leave us? This leaves us with a draw of the general fund BSR of 11.7 million. Again, that's a reduction compared to the prior estimates of 15 to 20 million. Um, in the 2020 mid-year budget CMR, we estimated a BSR of 44.7 million. With this reduction of 11.7, we'll be at 33 million. Um, and the 33 million is 14.3% 
Um, so this is below the target range of 15 to 20% um, as we expected, uh, but not as low, frankly, as we thought it was going to be. So this is uh, good news, frankly, uh, which is abnormal for me these days. <laughs> So ultimately tonight, we're just reviewing the financial report and then amending the council, seeking council's approval to amend the 2020 budget appropriation um, for the general fund and the capital project uh, that transfer and the transfer to the downtown bid. Um, this is, does require a major, uh, super majority vote since we are drawing from the budget stabilization reserve of 11.7 million. Um, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Director Nozay. Um, let's go to members of the public who wish to speak on this item. If you wish to speak on our third quarter financial report and uh, the budget amendment for FY 2020, please raise your hand. If the clerk would please help me uh, get these folks to give their comments. Thank you, Mayor Fine. At this time, we have three speakers. Our first speaker is Nielsen Buchanan, followed by James Hindery, and then Xander Koo. <laughs> Nielsen, go ahead. You, you've got. Thank you very minutes. much. I thought I lowered my hand. You're fine. Go ahead. You have two minutes. I, I don't need to speak. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Hendry. Th thank you. Thank you, Breath, um, and, and hello, Council. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I, the only issue that I have is with um, the money going to housing for Ed Shikata. Um, I think that's an exorbitant amount of money for us to be spending um, to reduce his commute time. I mean, it's, it's absurd. $600,000 is, is way too much money um, on top of his salary to be giving him. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, James. And our final speaker is Xander Koo. Xander, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, um, I think, so I believe that uh, with respect to the um, racial equity investments, a lot more should be done by the city. Um, the city needs to put its money where its mouth is. And in this time of need, we need to not only help our, help ourselves, but help our neighbors, because there are so many people who maybe they don't live here, but they work in Palo Alto, and they are definitely the ones who are most affected by this uh, COVID nineteen out uh, pandemic. Um, I think these there should be a lot more um, done in that regard, uh, as well as. Uh, there seems to be a lot of financial strain on the budget. And I believe uh, I've heard from a few voices in the public. And uh, I think that a good place to pull money from would be the police department. Uh, I, again, reiterate my support for defunding the Palo Alto Police Department and dismantling it to reconstruct a better public safety infrastructure for us all. I uh, yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Xander. Our next speaker is Oniza. Oniza, you have two minutes. Hi. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi. So, yeah, you know, I just want to echo what um, James and Xander have already said. I think we're kind of in an interesting moment in time right now. There's a lot of competing issues. We, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of like financial strain. And I really think that this is the moment to examine what the role of the Palo Alto Police is and and how we can kind of take some money from that and funnel it into other things. So, you know, I, I agree completely we need to defund the police that it seems like such a logical step, especially given the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I'm going to echo this again. I don't understand why we're paying pension to police officers who have history of misconduct who've resigned just because they have done things that are horrible and deplorable, right? Like, I just, I feel like everyone has been calling in saying this over and over again, saying, look, we have a solution for you. This, this is something that can help. We can pay our teachers more. Paulo is so proud of 
education and and I mean rightfully so I feel like I got a pretty decent education at gun right so I just don't understand why there's this reluctancy to embrace something new and try something different and I really wish I really really wish that people could just open up to the possibility of something new and something better and to start taking accountability and to start like actually trying to make things better and I know it's hard to do these meetings over and over again I mean I've only been calling in for a week and I'm like yeah this is a lot of time but you have a chance right now to do something different and to make a better world and you have to take it and we can ask you all we can but it's on you right now and thank you for hearing us out and that's our final speaker Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for the input. So now we return to council. Um, seeing only one hand, um, I'll open it up to, to comments, questions and motions. Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, thanks to our finance staff for, for that update and, and, um, and actually to our city manager for adjusting so quickly and um, reining in our expenses in the middle of the quarter. Um, just to respond to a couple of the public comments, uh, we have a requirement in our, in our charter that the city manager live in Palo Alto. And when we recruit a new manager, housing is part of the offer. Um, so Ed, Ed, as part of his offer, was entitled to more money and he's returning that 600,000 to the city. Um, so thank you, thank you, Ed, for that. Um, and also to be clear, we did pull money from all departments, including the police um, as part of this new budget. Um, so, you know, I, I reviewed, reviewed the materials offline um, and I appreciated the report. So I'd like to just go ahead and make the motion to, to accept the update and to approve the budget adjustments as proposed. Second. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor and Council Member Cormack. Uh, is my understanding correct? You're just moving the staff recommendation? Yes. Okay. Um, so the vice mayor has moved the staff recommendation, seconded by council member Cormack. Uh, do you wish to speak to that? Uh, no, I think I just did. Thank you, council member Cormack. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois. I would like to speak to it briefly. I, I uh, uh, echo your thanks to um, the city manager for the decisions that were made in here and to the finance staff for bringing this forward. Um, I just do want to draw, you know, public's attention to a few of these things to have, you know, transient occupancy tax down by 95% is, uh, is pretty stunning. Um, I know people are talking about sales tax. When we think about that, we have to keep in mind that when people are buying things at grocery stores instead of restaurants, uh, there isn't much sales tax on the food. So um, I, I'm very comfortable with um, the most aggressive scenario that we chose for this next fiscal year based on even just this glimmer of, of early information. Um, I also wanna uh, compliment the fire department on managing their vacancies down with their overtime. I noticed that uh, we're getting a lot of comments from people about why aren't we taking money out of the capital budget? And I see 55% of these um, expense reductions in the capital budget. Um, and then I just have one quick question. If we end up at the, um, 14.2, it looked like it was 14.2 uh, in the report, maybe 14.3% for the BSR for 2020. Um, what does that number look like for 2021 then? I, I apologize, I don't have that one with me. We've changed the budget so many times. Sure, um, so what this means is as we move into 2021, this is what we would be starting with, that $33 million number. And in terms of the, um, Percentage. In terms of the percentage, if we were doing the 18.5% target that council has set based on the current 2021 20, proposed budget <laughs> expenses, uh, we would need an additional $3.6 million to reach that 18.5%. So, and another way of stating this is we would want a BSR of $36.6 million in 2021 to be at the council target of 18.5%. So we're within 10%. Correct. Of the, the Delta. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Yes, and just um, uh, just to touch on the um, question about um, the city manager's housing 
um, my understanding of this is this means that the current city manager's house is less expensive than the prior city manager's house. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also just note it's a co-investment between the city and the city manager. Um, Council member Ness. Thank you. And just a reminder that uh, we made money on the last city manager's house. We came out ahead. So um, we, we share in, in the largesse. So Kylie, could I ask a, a few questions that are more about the future than about what you brought up tonight? Because we need to be looking ahead a year at this point. Hotels are at 95% of what we collected previously. Is that right? That's correct. And how many hotels was this based on? Uh, Ten or closed? How many all told? So actually, well, and I wouldn't go by the number of hotels that are closed. I would actually look at the total number of rooms that are available. Uh, different hotels have different quantities of rooms impacting that. Um, so overall, there are 11 hotels that are currently closed as of April 17th. Um, that is obviously a little bit dated. I actually don't know the total number of hotels or rooms in the city. Um, Tara Narayan is our Treasury uh, Debt and Investments Manager that should have that number and might magically appear to help answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure, Taryn. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Taryn. So the, the hotels that are closed are about 30% of the hotels. So 70% of the rooms are available, but not necessarily booked. So translate that again. 70%, what, what does this, because you said we were talking about rooms. So, so you're saying uh -huh. of the rooms, what percent are available? So, uh, uh, so, but Carly was saying uh, of all the hotels that have uh, suspended the operation or basically closed, uh, right. they represent 30% uh, of available rooms uh, in total of the city. Uh, so the hotels that are open represent 70%, but obviously uh, uh, ni uh, ni they have a, a you know, 95% uh, kind of vacancy. Uh, so most of them are empty. So we've got those three numbers to work with. There's the 30 to 70 and then the very high vacancy. So if we look ahead to the coming year, since we're talking about, I think you said, Kylie, about 95% of where we would normally be. Yeah, that's a 95% reduction. So we're only at 5% of what we would normally right. be. Yes. So if we go forward with that, we have had very good luck with our TOT. It's what we use to um, do our major projects. I don't think you can project out quite that far, but I think this doesn't bode well for next year. So that's the kind of thing we need to keep in mind as we look at the, as, as we look at the budget is where is it all going? So I can see some areas where we're saving money, but there are other areas where we're certainly not bringing any money home. So that's a, that's a major issue. It's, it makes me uneasy to think of where we'll be in December. And I'm sure it does you as well. So one last thing, because there's a certain cost in staying out of City Hall, correct? Mm, house, uh, can you unpack that a little bit for me? How so? You, I know that, that big companies used to shut down in certain periods of time. You save on air conditioning or you save on, on the janitorial. You save, you save in electric, a whole number of things, so, so, which actually bring the cost of City Hall down. It may not bring it down a great deal, but it will bring it down some. And then um, we don't have any magic way of knowing when we might go back into City Hall at this point, right? Uh, I don't think so, but I'll let Ed us <laughs> tackle that one. That's correct. We are uh, running a variety of scenarios. We are partially reoccupied in City Hall as uh, the basic operations that do require uh, being in place um, are continuing. And we I have no specific date at which we would refill. In fact, uh, we're basically planning, as most organizations around the Bay, uh, through the end of the calendar year with at least a partial uh, work, continue working at home. Right. So, so it, it, it 
does save money. <laughs> so it would be interesting, be interesting to factor that all in at the same time. It's like looking at a whole different organization, one where most of the people are staying home rather than going into the office, and one where you're not worried about even what the temperature is going to be during the day because there's nobody there. So it's intriguing. As you said, we, this is a time like no other. And just one note for the council, um, you know, in all of these year-end projections, we do have the costs that the city has incurred to date uh, in terms of COVID-19 expenses. Um, and it's been things like reprioritization of janitorial services away from those closed facilities towards those open facilities or those facilities that need heightened cleaning as a result of COVID-19. So what we've been doing is uh, shape-shifting, right? We've been allocating the re resources where they're needed most right now and pulling them away from those areas that are ultimately not physically being used. Um, and so that's why you see that, that difference. Yeah, interesting. Thanks, Kylie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Council Member Philseth. Yeah, so thanks to staff for doing this. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, this is one of those things that, you know, we're all eagerly waiting to see this kind of information coming forward. Um, usually when you make revenue projections and you nail your revenue projections, you feel good. I think uh, in this case, it's a little bit bittersweet <laughs> that we hit our, hit our revenue projections so accurately. Um, but uh, but good job. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the BSR uh, the budget stabilization reserve target. Uh, you know, uh, thanks staff for uh, uh, engineering things uh, to uh, re reduce the impact in in the second quarter. I think I think all of us expected something more severe, which means less of a hole to fill in out of revenues in the future. That's good. Again. Uh, in the in the in the bittersweet category, uh, you know, one thing that helps us with the 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 ESR is the target level is actually a percentage of revenue, and so if revenue is down, then it's easier to hit your BSR target. Um, so <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so thanks. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing uh, sales tax numbers in October. Thank you, Council Member Filseth. Um, I have a couple comments and then I just see my colleagues hit their lights. Um, yeah, as, as Council Member Filseth said, this is bittersweet. Um, you know, I think it's some of the numbers in here are masked by the fact that this crisis really hit us late in March. And so even if you see, you know, quarterly revenue up by 3%, it's, it's really quite misleading. Um, things change pretty rapidly towards the end of the month. This is really crude math. Uh, but I was looking at some of these numbers, hotel, uh, TOT down 95%, sales tax down 5%. You split the difference, you're at about 50% decline, which is kind of what we were projecting. So um, I think, you know, to some degree, we're, we're on track for what we projected. That said, uh, you know, the report does state that later in the fall, we'll see uh, more accurate sales tax percentages. And in April, they're already down 10% estimated. So um, the problem is not getting easier. Um, you know, I, I guess one question, Council Member Tanak and I asked a few weeks ago in one of the budget meetings, how are we tracking this on like a month to month base basis? And I know some of these reports are delayed. Um, are there any mechanisms we have for a little more granular updates? Um. Do you mean like uh, monthly updates on where our revenues versus expenses are? Um, actuals or projections? I guess projections is maybe the most helpful. Um, but sure. do you have any mechanism to do that currently? Uh, no, the projections are ultimately staff work, to be honest. Um, so what staff does is they look at the activities that are happening in any given month, in any given year, um, and looking at um, how they're doing compared to other years, compared to what we know about what's going on, um, and updating those. So there's not a, a perfect algorithm for, you know, we spit out our actuals from our ERP system, and then it hands us a projection. Um, yeah. The projection is the more refined area. Uh, if we were just to spit out actuals, 
uh, those are kind of those initial Q3 tables that you saw, uh, revenues versus expenses. And so those only tell you so much. Okay. I, I know there's a lot on your plate, um, but it may be helpful to have, you know, more frequent updates than just quarterly up updates at this point um, for council. Anyways, um, really appreciate this. As others have mentioned, uh, also really appreciate some of staff's value engineering here to re reduce some of our expenses uh, so we don't have to draw on the BSR as much. That, that helps uh, the city and the community uh, tremendously over the next few months and years. Um, next I see is council member Tanaka. Uh, yeah, thank you for your work on this. Uh, a few questions. Uh, first question is, uh, I, I know you guys have the sales numbers for Q3. Um, do you have uh, what the last what the sales numbers were for the last two weeks of the quarter? Uh, what sales numbers specifically are you looking the sales at? Sales tax. For we don't have Q3. So Q, sales tax happens um, in arrears. Uh -huh. uh, and so we actually will not know what happens for Q3 sales tax until. Um, slide, July. Um, sorry, I apologize. Can you open up? Um, uh, this maybe um, I got confused. Can you open up to I don't know what slide number it is. Uh, can you open up the slides to the general fiscal year uh, 2020 general funds, please? Slide three, perhaps. Yeah, uh, slide four maybe. Okay. Uh, give me one sec. Councilman, are you looking for revenues or expenses? Uh, I'm just looking at revenues right now. Okay. This one? Yeah. So um, there's sales tax of third quarter, 20 million, 20.6 million, right? Correct. On the second line? Yep. Okay. So we have the actuals for Q3 for the sales tax, right? I see what you're saying. So those are the receipts that the city has received through Q3 for sales tax. That okay. does not indicate the sales tax activity through Q3. That no. really only indicates the sales tax activity through December. That we receive from the oh. state. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Okay. So this, this is this is even though it says Q3, it doesn't mean the sales tax from Q3. It means it means the cash on hand that the city has received okay. through March. Um, or you know Q3, but it doesn't reflect what the activity was through March. There's a significant okay. delay on sales tax. Okay, so so I see. So it's 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 from December, like calendar year December. Right. So sales okay. tax goes in an advance, an oh, advance, fine. and a true up. So you only know the real amount every quarter. Okay, let's move on then. Um, what does that adjusted budget mean? Adjusted budget is this is this adjusted budget from what you guys are presenting tonight, or is this a what is Sure. So throughout the year, uh, so the council adopts a budget, which is yeah. slated for your adoption next Monday for 2021. Yeah. And then throughout the year on any given Monday, um, the city council can adjust that budget. So what this is, is this is the adjusted budget as of today um, through various okay. actions. Can, the council you go back to, can you go back to the last slide, please? And no. I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm on a timer here, so I'm trying to move <laughs> it fast. So, um, so uh, can you go back to the slide before? The, yep. Yeah. So, so this adjusted budget is the numbers that you're, all the numbers are adjusted um, as of today. Yes, as of, well, I think we adjusted them as of uh, the end of May, but council hasn't taken any action subsequent to them. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then um, how much have you spent? I know that there was a contemplation of um, buying hotel rooms for employees. How much did we spend on that? Uh, I actually don't have that figure uh, at my fingertips. I would need to talk with our you could, department. You could, you could swing it on yourself to research that. I'll move on, um, and just you can shout it out when you guys when you guys get it. Um, so, um, can um, can I share my screen? Can someone enable me to share my screen? Beth or someone? Okay, so I I, I just did a little math here. Um, can you guys see my screen? Do you guys see a spreadsheet? Okay. So, um, so tonight, what we found out is the TOT is about five percent of what it was, right? Is that correct, Kylie? Okay. And then um, the the documentary, the the real estate tax, um, basically is about forty five percent of what it was, right? It's forty to fifty percent. I just use forty five percent as a as a 
average? Uh, sure, it depends, but yeah, it, we saw drops of 45 to 50%. Okay, so I'm just putting 45 for now, right? Um, so um, and then I took what our numbers were um, in terms of what we project with the $39 million shortfall. Uh, for the TOT, it's 14.9, and for the real estate tax, it's 4.7 million. And then I compared this against 2019, fiscal year 2019, because we don't have final, um, we don't have final actual 2020 numbers, right? So we just compared against 2019, um, this 29 and 6.9 million dollars respectively. So what I was trying to do is, well, what is, you know, what is, what is, uh, what percentage um, drop is this, or, or, you know, compared to what actually is happening right now? So you know, this right now, our projection is about 50% of 2019, right? Which is a little bit optimistic because 20, 2020 was even higher, but let's just say 2019 is a good good baseline here. And then the the real estate tax is about 68%, right? But right now we're tracking about 45%. So my, my, my point here is that what's actually happening is we're doing about 5% of normal for our TOT and 45% of normal for our real estate. But our budget, what we what we're what we projected for 2021, and we don't have sales tax, so we can't do it for sales tax. But for the TOT and, and the real estate tax, which we do have, it's way higher than what has actually happening right now. Now, some argument can be made that this will come back, and you know, this is just for these couple of months, maybe. But my my concern here is that there's there's a 10x delta between what's happening and what we budgeted. And there's, I, I just have to minutes. jump in, but the what happened column are quarterly numbers. Huh? That, that's just for, for, no, that this is, this is, I'm talking about like, I know it's quarterly, but what I'm saying is this is what's happening at this very moment. Now, well, you could argue so that this is going to come back up. That's going to column B. What'd you say? It's, it's one quarter. Column E is one quarter, which you're extrapolating to column B on an annual basis. I know, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see if our projections are realistic. So right now what's happening is our TOT is, Kylie says, instead of getting $2 million a month, we're getting $100,000 a month, right? So we're getting a fraction of what we used to get. And same thing on the real estate side, it's, you know, it's about roughly half or less. But my concern here is that what is happening, at least at this very moment, now we could say that we're gonna have a V-shaped recovery, the companies come zooming back, all that stuff. But what's happening, our, our projections are way higher than what's actually happening right now. Now, I don't know if that's going to translate to the sales, sales tax side or not, but it, it makes me, it gives me pause whether our projections are a bit too optimistic because of it does a big delta from what's happening right now. And, and Mayor, you're, you get your point that it's going to come zooming back, but a lot of the economic projections do not have us in a V-shaped recovery. So um anyway i just want to point this out and and you know i'm sure kali could do much better job but just based on the numbers i pulled up it gives me a lot of concern about our projections okay um five minutes okay so, i'll go on the next round then quick question does, does city staff have any response there um well first i would note that the projections are not before you tonight so that's not a part of this specific item and also um, that the figures, the 5% reflected the last month of the quarter, not the full quarter. So and again, not to, not to uh, discount the significance of the drop we've had, but I, I think it just speaks to the importance of being cautious in extrapolations. Thank you. Um, Council member Ku. So thank you for this report. It's. Um... It's quite a read, you know, up and down the feeling of uh, looking at the numbers. But uh, remind me, in on page five, there's the ERAF, and um, you know, it says that the state law is uh, counting it in a different way. Remind me of that one. I remember either you spoke about it or read it somewhere else, but I'm not remembering what it was. Why is the state doing that without? Um, I mean, it's it's not. Is there a new proposal or a state law out? What is it that they're? How are they doing this? Sure. 
So EREF has been coming to cities um, for a number of years at this point. And most cities, if you talk to them, um, use it as one-time funds because there's a formula on the distribution of it. Um, and right now there's a debate between uh, some counties and the state on the formula of how to calculate that excess. Um, so there's not a change necessarily in the law, but there is currently a dispute amongst the state and some counties on how they've been calculating that excess ERAF and distributing it. And so that's what's under question at this point in time. Okay. And the dispute of 1.5 million or 40% is pretty high for an entire wait uh, until, well, the, so the dispute is expected to occur, the resolution ex expected to occur in this upcoming fiscal year. So in a couple of months then. I don't know if COVID will impact that, um, but that's what is supposed to be happening. Um, and ultimately, I think the good news for council on ERAF is staff is conservative in those estimates, given the fact that it is one time. So fingers crossed, uh, the impacts won't be as severe as we may uh, as we may see on paper from year over year changes, because staff does not assume um, the full revenue from that annually. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to a second round and then I'm going to encourage us to vote. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. Sure. Um, so I'll continue. Um, so uh, in regards to the TOT, so I've been, I've been talking to our hotels, um, some of the ones that have even shut down temporarily. And uh, one thing that they're telling me is that, um, uh, or just hotels in general, is that the people coming to the hotels now are not the business travelers. So business travel has largely stopped. I think, I think everyone knows that already. And so the people that are coming to our hotels tend to be non-business travelers. So these people tend to be much more price sensitive. And this is why I think Kali has talked about why we're also seeing a decrease in the room rates as well. So it's a bit of a double whammy. And so one thing that um, several has, have expressed to me and I, I am very sympathetic to it, is that, you know, I think there's some hope that perhaps we could uh, match our TOT rate uh, tax from what it is, which is, you know, the highest, I think, in the country, or if not the state, but um, is uh, to make it more aligned to cities around us, given that the new travelers, new people staying in the hotels are not the expense accounts, business travelers. So I, I, I do think that's something for us to think about. Um, and then um, Kylie, um, uh, I noticed um, uh, in terms of the police overtime, it looked like you went up a bit. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? I looked at, I saw that in the staff report. Um, so, or maybe I misread it, but I was I was looking at that. I'll 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 look I'll let you look at that because I'm on a bit of on a timer here. Um, and then um, I think the other thing is I don't know if you also have any any um, readout on what is the amount we spend on hotels for employees. But I, I would still love to get that number if you guys have been able to dig that up. Um, I'm just going to queue some of this stuff up because there's a timer going. So um, okay. And then um, one thing I just want to clarify. So. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the city manager house, um, so I, one of the members of the public brought this up. And I think what happened was the city manor, manager was granted a, basically it's up to $4 million. There's a partial loan and whatnot. It's a little bit complicated, but about $4 million for a house. And I guess what the city manager has done, given the, what the report is, is I assume that means that the city manager actually bought the house recently then. Um, so that's why it's now a three point. So the, so the city manager actually bought a three point four million dollar house, and it's, since it's not the full four million dollar that was authorized uh, by you know my colleagues, not necessarily me, but my colleagues, um, that we get a six hundred dollars six hundred thousand dollars savings, right? Is that is that the way to think about what really happened, Kylie? Uh, I'm not sure that the full story that you just walked through is is how but you are correct that the asset that the city is investing in with the city manager is at a lower price than the 4 million. 
um, okay. as of right now. And so we are counting that savings. Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, we, we just had a couple of discussion yesterday and, um, you know, we we're trying to take about three something million dollars from the school district. And here versus bought a you know three point four million dollar house, right? Which I don't know. I mean, just the optics of it makes me wonder. Uh, we're doing layoffs. There's a bunch of layoffs that are going to be happening. Um, management has taken some pay cuts. Uh, we're going to be cutting a bunch of services for the people in the city. And I just think about the optics of, you know, like like so some some of the, some of the cities, but you know, buy houses for their city manager, like Los Altos. But that was a two million dollar house, not a four million dollar grant or three point four million dollar house. So I just do wonder, you know, I'm wondering about the sensitivity of this in terms of being trying to, trying to be, uh, make sure, make sure that we're good stewards, um, of, of, of our taxpayers money, given, you know, this dire fiscal situation that we're in 25% unemployment. A lot of people in our city have lost their jobs or have taken a pay cut. Um, and so I just think about like, this kind of um, the optics of purchasing this kind of property at a time when we're like really um, going through hard times. So I, I, I mean, I, I know like our school district um, has some probably some challenges about you know, trying to figure out how to make ends meet on their side. And so I, I, I just, I guess, I guess I just feel like we need to be better financial stewards of of the taxpayer money because just less of it. And, um, and so I, I'm, I'm just a little bit disappointed that that the purchase had to be made now versus maybe when times are better. Because the same manager is already getting a stipend uh, for to live here, right? It was like, I think it's two, how much is the stipend? Like three, 2000, 3000, I forgot what it is, but it's, it's, it's not insignificant. So I, I just, um, yeah, I, I just, that's Five the minutes. way I wish. I, I, I do, I'm grateful for the $600,000 we didn't spend as we didn't spend the full four million, but I'm still kind of puzzled by the three point four million dollar purchase. But Kylie, whenever you get the numbers, let me know. Sure. So staff is still looking on the hotel information. Um, as for the overtime, the increase is due to uh, backfill for workers' comp vacancies. So when uh, officers are not able to work the line, uh, we fill them with overtime. Uh, another one has been additional patrol services in the shopping districts uh, because of the break-ins that have been occurring or the, the smash and grab, so to speak. Um, and then the last one are we've had some unforeseen uh, activities this year, such as um, a major incident in the first quarter, as well as um, a POTUS visit. And so both of those have created uh, spikes in overtime. I fully expect, frankly, with the protests that have been going on within city limits in the last few weeks, that we will continue to see a spike in PD overtime, since typically those kind of events we staff on overtime. Does POTUS refund us on, on, on the staffing at all or no? no. Like they, they probably should, but okay, that's a different topic. All right, um, thank you all. Seeing no further lights, um, I'm going to call the vote on this. So, uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, I'm just kind of disappointed with what happened. I'm going to vote no on this one. Okay. Uh, Council Member Ku. Yes. Council Member Ness. Council Member Ness, I think you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Um, I vote yes. Council Member Philseth? Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Great. Thank you. That passes six to one with Council Member Tanaka voting no. Uh, we move on to our final item of the night discussion and direction of staff regarding the establishment of a pension funding policy and the approval of a contract for a six year term for actuary services. Uh, and the authorization of the city manager to ex, uh, execute a contract amendment uh, for pension and retiree health liabilities. Does staff have a presentation on this? It's fine again. Um, so yes, we do. Um, and I will pass it over to Steve Guagliardo, who's actually going to run this. 
um, as he's setting up and pulling up the PowerPoint, uh, just a kind of reminder to the city council, this has been a multi-year effort um, that the finance committee actually reviewed last year. Uh, and we've just uh, been moving it around on the agenda since it doesn't necessarily have a time frame on it. Uh, but this is an update and really the next steps in that long-term planning uh, in terms of our pension liabilities and how we want to continue to address those proactively. Um, I am happy to report that this year, in spite of all of the financial work that we have been struggling with, um, trying to offset, we did maintain our, or we are maintaining our full 6.2% uh, additional contributions to the 115 Trust, as well as our supplemental contributions. So we really haven't in any of those 2020 budget strategies or financial actions pulled back on any of this work that the, the council has really worked very hard to prioritize. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Steve, um, who will walk us through a pretty complex issue. Um, and we also have our actuarial services, Mary Beth uh, from Bartell and Associates uh, on the line as well. Steve? Great, thank you, Kylie. Thank you, members of the City Council. I'm Steve Guagliardo, Principal Management Analyst with the Administrative Services Department. As Kylie mentioned, this has been an ongoing work effort, really representing the culmination of work that began all the way back in 2017 and has been iterated on and continued through the work of both the City Council as an entire body, as well as work through the Finance Committee over the past few years. The Finance Committee most recently discussed this on October 15th of 2019, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. So what we're doing here tonight is talking about the pension funding policy and where we are at the moment. We're seeking input and guidance from the city council on elements of the pension funding policy, which will ultimately proactively address the city's long-term pension obligations. The idea is that we will incorporate any input offered by the city council tonight and return to the city council in fall of 2020 for the final adoption of the policy. That's part one of the conversation tonight. And then as the mayor mentioned in the title, and as Kylie alluded to a little bit, we are also asking council to approve the contract and the first amendment with Bartell Associates, our outside actuarial consultant, to continue the work on this important topic. So this triangle might look familiar to those of you who were intimately involved with the fiscal sustainability priority from 2019. This really highlights the fact that we exist as a city in an ecosystem of service delivery. We have the services we offer to the community and that's balanced against the resources that we use to fund those services, as well as the cost of doing business. The cost of doing business for a service-driven organization like the city of Palo Alto is largely driven by the people who provide those services and by extension, their pensions. So the overarching goal of a pension funding policy is to avoid the service delivery reductions that may otherwise result from escalating pension costs. This requires balancing near-term investments with long-term impacts Obviously, we need to strike the balance so that we're not cutting services now to invest in these long-term investments. At the same time, we need to make sure that the long-term liabilities don't creep up and continue to grow as we encounter them. As we were working on the pension funding policy, a few key principles emerged throughout it. These were discussed with the Finance Committee in October, but they're worth reiterating with the full body tonight. The biggest is what is the desired funding target and the corresponding timeline to achieve it. Presumably, we want to reach full funding, but we have to recognize that pursuing that too quickly will result in those same service delivery reductions that we're trying to avoid in the long run. Additionally, we need to recognize that the pension funding policy should be evergreen. We need it to guide staff and the city council when certain parameters are met, but as we've seen with COVID-19, we also need to make sure that there's flexibility and adaptability to ensure that the city can encounter changing circumstances and continue to roll with it. This needs to be balanced against what can the city afford and what's the most efficient use of its funding, including what payment options and tools best align with those considerations. Finally, it's critical to keep in mind that this is a statewide issue. This is not unique to the city of Palo Alto. In fact, the work that we've done over the past few years helps put us out at the forefront of local jurisdictions dealing with pension funding policy issues. However, this is a statewide issue. So CalPERS is the state system that we are invested in, and they invest over an incredibly long-term timeframe. The fluctuations and variability we see over a short timeframe, even as recently as what we're seeing now with COVID-19, 
do not necessarily reflect the long-term investment principles that CalPERS uses to try and reach its rate of return over that much longer time horizon. So what staff did was look at these funding policy key principles and apply them through various elements that were discussed with the Finance Committee. These elements are the funding goal and timeframe, how much do we want to reach by when, the funding components, essentially figuring out how much money we should put in to the pension trust, um, the Section 115 trust we have, which I'll talk about in just a moment, as well as CalPERS, and how what we can do with those funding sources. Balancing those are those other elements of the fiscal sustainability triangle, including service delivery outcomes, as well as those fiscal impacts. So this next slide, I'll warn you in advance, looks very busy, uh, but there's a, that's because there's a lot of data. And this one was what the Finance Committee in October spent a lot of their time on. I can see some of the members of the Finance Committee looking at it, surprisingly, perhaps ringing some bells. Uh, this appears on packet page 59, and it's really what the Finance Committee got into from a brass tax perspective in that October conversation. What we did is we took each one of those elements I had just discussed, the percent funded goal, the time frame, the funding components, the allowable uses of the funding components, and the service delivery outcomes, and laid them out into different examples, one, two, three, and four, so that people could understand what an example pension funding policy might look like. Example one on the far left of this is just the baseline. It's what we would do if we just did what CalPERS requires us to do. Example two more or less aligns with what our current practice is. And example three is slightly more aggressive and example four is even more aggressive. As you move left to right, you encounter more and more difficult trade-offs associated with the fiscal impacts and the service delivery outcomes. Through the conversation with finance committee, there seemed to be a fairly strong desire to see something between two and three and to better understand what the ramifications of impacts of that would be. I'll do a quick recap of what the conversation was with the Finance Committee and what the outcomes were there. Um, there was generally broad consensus that we should continue to pay the CalPERS actuarial determined contribution and continue to use that lower discount rate to pay to calculate the normal cost and then transmit that additional piece over to the Section 115 Trust on an annual basis. There seemed to be interest in amending the existing budget stabilization reserve policy as Kylie alluded to in the last agenda item, at the moment we are allowed to transmit excess BSR above that 18.5% over to the infrastructure fund. One example change that we could do would be to amend that policy that, so that some of that could be sent to pension costs and our city's Section 115 Trust. Um, once we reach one year of funding in that Section 115 Trust, we could transmit it over to CalPERS as an additional discretionary payment. One of the benefits of that and that being an allowable use of funding, is that that's how CalPERS actually recognizes the contribution. The money that we put over into the Section 115 Trust is separate and distinct from CalPERS and is not recognized by them on an actuarial basis. So when CalPERS tells us how much we owe, they're not contemplating any fund balance over in that Section 115 Trust, which can only be used for pension costs. So there seemed to be consensus amongst the Finance Committee that we should return to the city council is part of the budget process to discuss uses of that 115 trust. And then on a service delivery outcomes basis, the idea was to continue the current prioritization and the city manager could identify plans to address additional contributions as part of the annual budget process. That blue chart with all of that data on it looked at those different examples across 10 years. What would it take to reach a funding level of 85% within 10 years, 90% within 10 years, 95% within 10 years? And one of the questions that the Finance Committee had from that meeting was what would that look like over different time horizons? If you were to extend it from 10 years and out to 11, 12, all the way up to 15 years, what would it look like? So in partnership with Bartell Associates, we worked on that model to see what I believe Mayor Fine referred to as quote unquote, the matrix of pain to see what it would look like for those additional contributions to make those contributions at the time. So. What these next four slides show, and they are also in your packet, they be, I believe they start on packet page uh, 71 or so to see what they look like in those PDFs if you'd rather look there, are the fiscal impacts associated with a more aggressive funding to reach a 90% funding level in 10 years. This is showing the baseline costs in gray 
and that represents what we have to pay to CalPERS on an annual basis. You can see that the biggest chunk of this graph in every single year is that CalPERS actuarial determined contribution. That funding represents the linchpin of any pension funding policy. Maintaining that payment ensures that we don't backslide or regress at all in our payments to CalPERS. Even setting aside the issue of what their discount rate is and what their actual rate of return is, as long as we continue to pay that actuarial determined contribution, we're making a significant investment in the city's pension funding sustainability. What this next little bar, that yellow bar shows, is the additional margin that we are contributing by paying the 6.2% discount rate on the normal cost. So you can see that above the baseline, we're paying about 2.8 million for the miscellaneous group in FY21. And we hover getting up to about 2.6 million as you go through the forecast. What this shows is that we would reach a 90% funding target within every year from 14 years to 13 to 12 to 11 if we made the CalPERS ADC and that 6.2% discount rate normal cost. The only time we'd have to make an additional contribution is if we wanted to make that 90% within 10 years for the miscellaneous group. Incredibly important to note, this is predicated on CalPERS meeting its rate of return of 7% in each and every one of these years. If they don't make that discount rate and they don't meet that rate of return, there would obviously be a corresponding impact and more funding would need to go here. We'll talk a little bit more about what the ramifications and impacts of the current COVID crisis are on CalPERS as we get to the end of this presentation. So that's what it looks like for the miscellaneous group, but it's a slightly different story in the safety group. You would essentially have to start contributing additional funding immediately in order to see what the impacts would look like. It would take not only the baseline cost to CalPERS but, and the 6.2% discount rate, but also an additional $165,000 per year to reach the funding level of 90% within 14 years, and then an additional 539,000 to reach it within 13 years, and then an additional 695,000 all the way down until you get to 10 years where it would cost even an additional million dollars. Each one of those numbers stacks on top of the previous one. So to read this chart correctly, to reach a funding level of 90% within 13 years, it wouldn't just be 539,000, it would instead be 539,000 plus that 165,000 for a total of 704,000. Again, predicated on CalPERS meeting its rate of return of 7% in each one of these years. Recognizing the unlikelihood or the unlikeliness that CalPERS would actually reach that, Bartel also helped us calculate what it would look like if there was a risk mitigation strategy. This shows what it would look like if the cost increased um, as a result of a lower discount rate beginning in FY 2023, where the discount rate would go from 7% to 6.95% down to 6.9% in FY 2024 on down through the rest of the forecast. That additional cost is reflected by the red portion of this graph, and you can see that that makes up a significant portion of the risk mitigation strategy costs. Again, you would interpret this graph the same way. Miscellaneous would only need additional funding beyond the 6.2% and that additional costs if you would need to reach 90% funding within 12 years. Otherwise, you would reach it within 13 and therefore within 14 and 15 years. However, again, different story in the safety plan, you would need to start putting in essentially an additional million dollars under this strategy beginning in FY 2021 to reach it within 14 years and even more if you went on a more aggressive timeline. What I wanted to spend just a brief moment on is talking about what the impact of a CalPERS 0% investment return would look like. There's been a lot of volatility lately in what CalPERS returns look like. And so it's important to understand what the impacts and ramifications of that would look like for us as a city. Essentially, for every percent below 7% that CalPERS gets in its year-over-year -year investment return for the year ending June 30th, 2020, it would be about a million dollars by the time it's fully impacting the city. It does get phased in over five years. It won't fully impact the city until FY 2026. But if it returns 0% by June 30th, then we'd be on the hook for approximately $7 million in FY 2026. Important to note, we track their investment returns year to date on an almost daily basis at this point. It has ranged from a negative year over year rate of return at the beginning of the 
coronavirus crisis all the way up to a positive return of almost six and a half percent as recently as last week. As of today, they're about 4% and we'll continue to monitor the situation to better understand what the impacts will be as we go forward through the budget process. Included in tonight's packet is an example pension funding policy. You can find this on packet pages 75 to 77. This is really meant to be a springboard for discussion and meant to be the start of a conversation with city council about what a pension funding policy could look like. So what that example includes is trying to reach a 90% funded level of CalPERS liabilities within 10 years. It includes calculating the normal cost at 6.2% and transmitting the additional portion of that to the section 115 trust fund where it would accumulate. It includes that the BSR policy would be amended so that amounts of over and above 18 and a half percent could be transferred to the 115 trust fund at year end at the city manager's discretion. And it would include that once we reach a full year of actuarial determined contribution funding in the section 115 trust fund that we would transmit it to CalPERS on an annual basis as an ADP or through conversations with city council. That's what we see in that allowable uses of funding row is we would essentially accumulate certain funding in the 115 trust fund before we send it over to CalPERS. And again, that's to maximize its impact so that when CalPERS sends their actuarial valuation and their bill to us for the next year, they would be recognizing that assets impact there. And then an important thing to keep in mind, especially as we look at the current budget, we need to contemplate what the impacts on service delivery levels would look like. If council goes beyond what our current practice is in the short term, there would be additional service impacts, uh, even as we contemplate the significant reductions that are currently included in the FY 2021 budget. So again, just to recap, what we're doing here tonight is seeking input and direction from the city council on the elements to be included in the pension funding policy, using that example policy as a starting point, hoping to help clarify any necessary clarifications that may be needed as well as explore any additional dimensions to any of the elements that would need to be included in the final policy. All while we balance the flexibility and adaptability necessi necessitated by events like the coronavirus crisis, along with a long-term strategy for addressing what is this known pension obligation. As mentioned at the beginning, the direction will be incorporated uh, into a final pension funding policy, which we hope to return to the council with in fall of 2020. And we are also seeking the approval of the contract and the amendment with Bartell Associates so that we can continue this work and do all of the modeling necessary to generate the numbers to have an informed conversation about it. That concludes staff's presentation and we are now available for any questions council may have. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to members of the public who wish to speak on this item. If you please raise your hand at this time and the clerk will help you uh, provide your comments. Any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand. Mayor Fine, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you, Clerk Miner. Um, so with that, we'll return to council. Um, I know it's been a long two days, uh, so I'll open it up to questions, comments, and motions, starting with council member Philseth. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for, to staff for, for sort of doing all this work and analysis and also the finance committee uh, last year for, uh, for, for uh, that, that lovely chart that in the, with the three point Pika type. Uh, uh, uh. Can you put up please the chart, the first chart with sort of all the gray bars? Yeah, yeah, that one. <clears throat> um, so the, the gray bars, if I understand it, are the annual payment to, that CalPERS requires. And then the yellow box at the top is the difference in normal cost between 6.2 and 7%. Is that right? Yes, that's the correct interpretation of this graph. Super, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I would just note that that yellow box, okay, those yellow boxes, I mean, dating back to the year 2000 when uh, the Gray Davis administration and so forth. Those yellow boxes, okay, are where our 
compounded annually at 7% are where our 500 plus million dollar pension, unfunded pension liability has come from, from those yellow boxes added up. So it adds up to a lot of money over time. So, and, and that's where it came from. Um, <laughs> so on the gray bar, I assume that includes both CalPERS' calculation of the normal cost and a payment towards amortizing the unfunded liability. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So the unfunded liability is also calculated at 7%, which means that the true unfunded liability is higher than they say it is. So how can we trust their amortization schedule? Steve, you want to try and take it? Sure. So I think the council member is raising an important concern, which is what I tried to lay out a little bit here, that this is predicated, that this schedule that we just showed on this slide is predicated on CalPERS meeting that 7% rate right. of return. Um, as he correctly identified, to the extent that they don't, that would grow, and that amount that you see in the yellow bar would need to be compounded. That exact reason is why we are seeking council oh. input on this pension funding policy because to the extent that they made a return of 6.2% for this year, for example, we've right. already paid that normal cost at that 6.2% level. Yeah. That's effectively subsidizing and insulating is kind of how I think of it against those losses that they're going to incur below that 7% level. But that's, oh, I thought you were gonna go, I actually sort of listening to you, I thought you were gonna go a different place, which is, <clears throat> But we need that normal, yeah, no, that normal cost, the extra normal cost we paid makes sure that the future liability doesn't grow any bigger. I think, wait, a, can you go to the next slide? I think I'm answering my own question. The next one after that. I'm thinking actually that red box is the one that's the difference between uh, their estimate of what the UAL is and what it really is. Yeah, that's another way to look at what this risk mitigation strategy is trying to identify. Uh, okay, that's, so the, the, risk mitigation, the risk mitigation strategy is reality. I think it's more aligned with reality than the 7% number, yes. Okay, all right, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. Let me ask, uh, you, you mentioned this briefly, but I wanna make sure I understand the answer. The idea to give extra money to CalPERS, why, devil's advocate question, why would we give it to them instead of keeping it ourselves and putting it in the 115? It's certainly one of the considerations to be balanced when you're looking at a pension funding policy like this. Mm -hmm. There are different strategies that you could take. So one is that the pension funding policy could outline that the Section 115 trust is meant to be a uh, hedge and it's just figuring out what time horizon you want it to be a hedge to right. the extent that we're investing with CalPERS over a much longer time horizon than 10 or 15 years. Uh -huh. We're in with them through contracts for, you know, as long as we have employees who are going to be there. Yep. CalPERS really is a long-term investment arm. If you're looking at something right. and trying to maximize your return over five yep. to 10 years, you might yep. be looking at a different mechanism in that 115 trust and a more aggressive investment strategy than the moderately conservative. It really just depends. And with the idea that we are investing with CalPERS over a very long time horizon, it really does get the most bang for your buck if the dollars are in there, recognized on an actuarial basis by their actuaries as they calculate your annual cost and realizing the returns over that very long basis. Is, there any, reason, is there any reason to think that CalPERS investment returns will be higher than the returns on our section 115? In the current portfolio that we're in, yeah, we're expecting returns of, I believe it's somewhere between four and a half to five and a half percent per year. Okay. And I think the, the benchmark that CalPERS is trying to set for itself is that 7%. Again, <laughs> again, recognizing that they're probably not going to achieve that. Yeah. But every, as every you, mutual fund manager says he's going to beat the market or she, right? But and so I think it really risk just gets it. risk adjusted. Why would we not get the same kind of returns as CalPERS? 
So I think the the really the thing on this is council member is what you just said. We would have to change our risk profile in our 115 account. And so it gets to the core question of what's the intent of the 115 trust and when yeah. do we want that money to be available? Um, because uh, if you ask certain finance directors in the state, they'll say, well, why wouldn't I give the money to CalPERS? Because if I put it in an aggressive strategy in the 115 account, you're going to buy high and sell low because you're going to need the money when the market's crashing and you're going to buy when you have extra revenues and the market's doing well. So you really, it gets down to how, how do you want to use those 115 trust funds and right. how can you balance your investments in your 115 trust and CalPERS? Because ultimately right now with how we've got them programmed, the 115 trust is in a more conservative um, platform and right. should frankly get a lower return than right. if you were to invest those same dollars in CalPERS because CalPERS is so, more aggressive. So I see what you Five mean, minutes. but it depends on what you want to use for the, the 115 for. Because if you said, you know, I want to use the 115 as my primary investment vehicle, in which case, instead of having, you know, a year or two's payments of CalPERS in, I potentially have hundreds of millions of dollars in the 115. Then you wouldn't risk as conservatively, that you wouldn't invest as conservatively because you wouldn't have to make a payment out of that every year. Does that That's make correct. any sense? And, uh, and what that would do, though, is it would take away that as a tool from a rate stabilization standpoint. So when right. CalPERS rates spike, we right. would see that spike in our budgetary financial planning and mm -hmm. would likely not recommend pulling from the 115 trust at that point in time to help smooth those impacts. So again, it, you're right. It gets right back to what's the intent of the 115 trust. Right. Well, that's interesting because in my mind, the whole situation that we've sort of been moving toward is is kind of a, I don't want to say a divorce, but maybe a separation from CalPERS. Because um, I worry that long term, our, our money might not be safe with CalPERS, right, for a variety of reasons. So I just saw that, I just saw an art, somebody speculation this week that uh, CalPERS, somebody floated the idea, I can't imagine they'll really do this, right, but floated the idea of actually borrowing money. At, uh, at borrowing money at low rates and investing it in order to boost their returns so that they would, uh, you know, cover some of their, their paper losses, right? I mean, that, I think we would want to run far away from them if they were ever to do something like that. Right? And just, I think I heard Monique come on a little bit earlier, but one thing I do want to make sure we address and discussed in the engagement section of the manager's report is that it is important to keep in mind that the city will have avenues at a state level to engage in advocacy yeah. um, in terms of seeing what options might exist at a system-wide level and making sure that we continue to take advantage of those options as they arise. Got it. Thank you, council member. I'll have, I'll, have, I'll, have to think, I'll have to think about some, it's, uh, yeah, okay. I'll have to, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about that. We'll come back for another round. Uh, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Fine. Um, yeah, I recognize that uh, that blue chart. Um, would you mind putting that back up again, Mr. Gogliardo, or whoever's running the slides? It's page seven or packet page 59. Perfect. Thank you. Um, before I get to that, I do just want to, in the um, in the event that we still have members of the public listening, do a little uh, uh, translation here on packet page 47 of page two. Um, and talk about why we have this pension funding policy, which this says minimize service delivery crowd out from escalating pension costs by balancing near-term investments with anticipated long-term needs. Um, so I think, feel like we should just translate this for um, you know, the public who doesn't spend as much quality time with this as, uh, as some of us do, um, which is that we're not really capturing the full cost of the people who work for us now, right? Um, there are essentially externalities associated with that, which is the pension costs. And since they're not captured correctly, what we could do if we didn't do this is we would have too many people working now um, in terms of you know, what we're paying for and 10, 15 years from now, then when we have to pay those pensions, we'd be cutting the services available to people who live here in the future. 
So um, just want to be sure. I know most of us understand that, but anybody else listening in for the first time? And we do have some um, people who are starting to listen into um, council meetings. So that's great. Okay. Um, thank you for what I will call, I think we called it 2.5. Is that what we called it last year? <laughs> right there in the middle. Um, and thank you so much. Um, I, I still feel like that's, that's the right area. I remember us asking for 15 years and <laughs> just thinking like, well, there's 30 year mortgages and then, you know, put it on a 15 year, pay it off more quickly. Um, it's understandable for people to, um, to sort of grasp that concept. Um, down in the allowable uses, which is sort of one, one of the components of what we were talking about. Um, I wonder if staff wants to talk a little bit about fresh start, because I can see some people would be like eager to go all the way to 100. And what does that look like? So could you just give those um, a, a refresher to those of us on uh, finance last year and to everybody else that a, a understanding of fresh start, because that gets to what we can use the, the Section 115 trust fund for. Certainly, thank you for the opportunity. So the fresh start is the idea that you would re-amortize your entire CalPERS liability, and then it would be smoothed out on a reset basis. What that is just trying to say is that every year where there's a gain or a loss, it contributes to your base for the next year once it's recognized in the actuarial report. And instead of it being spread out over each of those years it's been accumulated, it would all get put together. There are two elements on this slide that show what a fresh start in concept is referred to as, and then a contractual fresh start. A fresh start in concept would be looking at what the different bases are and figuring out how to essentially do a fresh start without altering the CalPERS contract. That means that it's still at the city's discretion whether it should make that payment in any given year or not, or it should revert to the CalPERS ADC or any other element outlined in the pension funding policy as it will ultimately be adopted. The contractual fresh start locks the city in by re-signing the contract with CalPERS and says that this is the new level that has to be paid on an annual basis per the contract. Um, through the conversations with the Finance Committee, it certainly seemed like the contractual fresh start was a little less appealing for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the removal of discretion and locking us into that higher rate. A fresh start in concept certainly affords more flexibility. And as this slide shows, the safety group was offered as an example um, one of the things that emerged from the conversation with the finance committee and our outside actuarial consultant was the idea that even without doing a fresh start, you could still target certain bases and use those targeted payments to essentially do the same thing a fresh start would and limit your variability and liability on an ongoing basis. And just to sort of dig in on that basis part, it's not, it's not captured in these, these um, stack graphs, but I remember there were other stack graphs that we looked at at the time that showed us and there were tables that identified their particular years that are more expensive than others. And that's what you mean, right? When you're talking about targeting certain ones to pay off. Yep, that is okay. what we mean. Okay, all right, fantastic. Um, I wonder if you could just explain the stacking of the tables again, maybe table, uh, table two, I guess on packet page 72. I wanna be sure I understand that. So I think the best example is probably the safety yeah. Just because there are actual ones here. So what this is showing is that there is a baseline cost for the CalPERS normal cost at 7% and UAL at 7%, which is about 16.7 million for the safety group. That's what we see on the gray bar here in FY 2021. Then our 6.2% discount rate applied to the normal cost would generate an additional cost of 1.3 million. In FY21. And, that's what's, and that's what's going into the Section 115 Trust. That is what we okay. currently have being transmitted to the Section 115 Trust. All right, let's keep going. If the City Council wanted to reach a funding level of 90% of CalPERS calculated liabilities within 14 years, the City would need to contribute an additional $165,000. And then if it wanted to reach it within 13 years, it would need to contribute an additional 539,000 in addition to that 165. Okay. So, so that would be so so the okay, so those are all deltas. So what correct. would the total be then? If we yep. wanted to okay. <laughs> so the total if you wanted to reach it within 10 years would be 3.3 million dollars more in FY 2021. On top of the 1.3. Yep. Correct. Okay. 5 minutes. Okay. Um, 
Thank you so much. Um, I think when we come back around, um, I'll be interested in talking about any potential overage of BSR, which seemed like a normal thing to talk about last year, but it's a little theoretical this year. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois. Yeah, first I have to say I'm getting very tired. I've been up very early both days, so I hope I'm coherent. Um, we actually had, I think, a really good discussion about this at finance. We went through it in a lot of detail. It has been some time, and I was like looking at my notes, trying to refresh myself on our discussion. I think um, again, Council Member Felsa started to to poke at it. I mean, we had a big discussion about how we amortize our, our UAL, and we had a discussion, uh, I think, about thinking about how we separate, um, you know, basically from CalPERS, because it gets really complicated when you start to look at their numbers based on their assumptions. Um, you know, the, because they overstate the projected asset returns, it, it affects everything, right? They underestimate the normal costs, they underestimate the UAL, they underestimate the amortization period. And, um, you know, we. We spend a lot of time talking about how we could adopt a strong policy that will make us a lot less likely to get hit by giant payments um, or the need to give them giant payments. Um, and um, I, I wondered if you could pull up the table on packet page 59, or I forget what slide that was. It was the, the pension uh, funding examples. Yes. So we spent a lot of time going through this and kind of mix and matching the characteristics, and, I, and again, I think that's what staff is asking for us for tonight, um, in kind of these different categories. And I think where we ended up is, you know, a, a funding target of, of 90%. I think we said 80 to 100 uh, when we settled in on 90. Uh, we weren't really sure of the time frame. Um, my notes uh, it said, you know, 10, 10 to 20 years. Um, so. Uh, Bartel looked at 15 years. At the time, again, we were we had excess BSR, and, but we were still, I think, being a little conservative. We were saying that 50% of an of an excess BSR would go towards this, and then the 50 other 50% would be discretionary. Um, I think we all supported um, getting additional cost sharing with employees over time, um, and then. Um, additional funding through the budget process. And then on the use of funds, I, I don't remember where we ended up. I think we were talking about the difference between safety and miscellaneous and whether we should actually have a different pension policy for those two funds. Because, you know, when you looked at those charts, um, in the miscellaneous fund, we didn't need to make extra payments, but in safety, we potentially do. Um, and then we also talked quite a bit about whether we keep the funds in the 115 or we make the payment to CalPERS. I think we were convinced uh, that it would make sense to make those payments to CalPERS. We had that whole discussion about investment returns as well. Uh, um, but basically uh, getting, you know, basically starting to pay it down and basically having a policy of accumulating one year payments. Um, and then the last part of my notes here was a discussion about the investment strategy um, with a suggestion that the city manager also uh, bring that back as part of the budget process each year. So, I mean, this, this whole area uh, for the council members who haven't been studying the pension or uh, went through this discussion, um, you know, it is, it is fairly complicated. I thought we ended up in a pretty good place it seemed like we were pretty close to a policy. Um, and there is really that question of kind of what time frame we want to target. And again, I think how much flexibility, how much do we want to tie our own hands versus have flexibility? Um, again, when we get into a year like this year, um, but again, we, we were talking about what we would do with excess funds in the BSR. So I, I think it would still apply. Um, so it's just kind of a summary. Uh, I really don't don't have a conclusion beyond that. I'm I'm curious where the rest of you would like to go. You know, we we took two years to you know start to allocate the money for the normal costs, 
Um, I think we could could ease in if we wanted to start to contribute additional money to the UAL, um, ease in a policy over two years or something like that as well if we need to. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Next is Council Member Ness. Council Member Ness. Yep. I'm right here. So, because I wasn't on last year's infamous finance committee, um, this is certainly confusing. But but more than that, what what are the actual decisions that we're trying to make tonight? I had to scroll up so I could unmute myself. Sorry about that. The decisions that we're looking for from council at this point are weighing in on perhaps the example pension funding policy that's included on packet pages 75 to 77 and seeing if that captures the general consensus that was present at the finance committee in October, recognizing that there may be some interest from the council in either changing some of those funding components, refining the allowable uses of those funding components, or offering further things that need to be explored before a final policy can be adopted. And then the final piece is, of course, the approval of the contract and the amendment with Bartel. So it would seem to me as though this is a far longer discussion than the one we're going to have tonight. But, but moreover, to come at this from a, from a different angle um, is the concern that we have all had over a very long period of time about, about the amount, about the rate that PERS is, is claiming it will get every year. And if you've got 7% as your claim, and you're really going to be in the four to five range, that makes an enormous difference long-term, which is why what Eric said about someone going out and apparently um, maneuvering in the market was, was probably something that actually happened. So when we leave here, I'm looking at you, Mayor Fine, what kind of answers are you looking for? So I think if you look at the staff recommendation, there are two big pieces. Uh, one is the approval of a contract and amendment with Bartell and Associates. And the other is a approval of a tentative or example pension funding policy as outlined on slide 13. Um, that is to my reading very close to what the finance committee recommended. The big difference that I see is the funding component excess budget stabilization reserve. Um, I believe myself, the vice mayor and council member Cormac recommended that any excess BS, any money beyond needed to fund the BSR goes 50% uh, towards the 115 trust, 50% to other uses. And you'll see on slide 13, it's saying excess money uh, beyond the 18.5% would be at the city manager's discretion. And I, I presume that is because of our current budgetary circumstances, which we, we did not foresee last year. Okay, well, um, I'll let the rest of you continue on. I think it's a, a fascinating discussion. And it also maybe said too simply, it doesn't seem like we can ever catch up. Thank you. So we will never be fully funded as I read it. So another way of thinking about that, I think I asked the question. Oh, Mark. say that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, think, I think there was a staff response that this is, this is a, a lifetime contract between uh, CalPERS and, and the city uh, pending anything else exceptional. Um, next, we had council member Tanaka. Can we go back to the blue slide, please? Okay, so I mean, given what the mayor just said, uh, basically we're trying to pick a number one through four. Is that essentially what you guys are looking for? I think what we would be looking for is feedback from the council. Uh, again, to 
summarize the finance committee conversation from October, they basically landed somewhere between two and three at that two and a half level, mm -hmm. which is what's represented in that example pension funding policy. Sorry, what'd you say again? When the finance committee discussed it in mm -hmm. October, they essentially landed somewhere between example two and example three mm -hmm. at what is essentially a two and a half level. And that is what is described in the example pension funding policy included in tonight's packet on packet page 75 to 77. Um, so, um, you know, one thing I've been thinking about as I was um, looking at the packet and listening to the discussion is, um, and I, I think it's been asked many, many times before, but, you know, part, the, the fundamental challenge we have here is that we have pensions, right? Pensions, which are, um, which, uh, you know, for the most part, because of all the complications involved, most of the rest of the world, except for government, has moved to 401ks. And so I've, been, I've just been thinking about, about the, about the, uh, the bigger picture here, right? Because we're, we're talking about how to deal with the current crisis, but part of the part of the part, part of the challenge of dealing with the current crisis is not to make the, you know, not to keep on digging here. Now I've heard in the past that um, it's either everything or, or nothing, right? You have to you have to um, you have to uh, uh, even new employees have to be on on a pension. Because I guess of union rules, right? And as as my maybe can someone on staff talk a little bit about that? What is the what is the what is the reason why we can't have one more step where new people are a full one case? Like, what's the we have barrier in that? Calpers that requires employees to go into the system. And, and, PEP, and state law prohibits PEPRA prohibits the adoption of a new tier. So it's beyond our control. So the only only other way to do this then would be, um, basically maybe go towards contractors, right? So rather than city employees, contract out as much as possible because even though we may pay more for the contractor in terms of on paper, it's actually going to be cheaper because when you start looking at all these pension costs, it's actually a pretty big multiplier to their pay. That's actually increasingly no longer <laughs> an alternative in particular for court services for any organization, but certainly for a public organization. I see. So you're, you're saying that you're not allowed to hire contractors anymore. Changes in state laws have made it more, more difficult to do that. Okay. Um, so um, what's, what's the challenge? Um, and I'll be interested to know what, why, why 2.5 versus three? What's the, um, I guess I'll, I'd like to maybe someone on the finance committee or someone on staff to talk about why why the 2.5. I think, um, I mean, my, my colleagues should correct me. I think there, there were a few areas. Um, I think the main one we were a little worried about was the fresh start. But otherwise, I think we were mostly on example three, but, you know, a target of 90%. I think it was really mix and match. It was 15 yeah. years, 90%, not no fresh start. Yeah. Yeah. I would echo council member Du Bois's sentiments. It was mix and match. The The target was lower than 95%. A lot of the elements that you see in example three are reflected in the example pension funding policy. Mm -hmm. It is a slightly lower target of 90%. It is a slightly longer time frame of, you know, whatever the council so chooses, but the, the premise of including Additional cost sharing with employees through negotiations would persist. The idea of identifying funding for the pension obligation through the budget would persist. Mm -hmm. um, fresh start, as council, as Mayor Fine alluded to, was one of the things that kind of was talked about but didn't actually solidify. But uh, and then those other elements of service delivery outcomes are included in the example pension funding policy as well. So it's really the two and a half isn't like a clear halfway between two and three. Some of the elements of three are included in there. And what's the big issue with the fresh start? The contractual or the concept? The concept. So the fresh start in concept, I think, is one of the elements that you could look at. And again, through the conversations with Bartel, it became a little bit more visible 
that targeting specific bases could do a very similar thing um, without necessarily doing the fresh start and concept, which would be a much bigger smoothing operation. Five minutes. Okay. Can we just finish the discussion? Because I think it's probably useful for everyone to understand. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. So, um, so, so uh, Steve, you're saying that it's, you said, and I can't really hear you very well for some reason, but you're saying, you're saying that um, the first start was a problem because you said there's some sort of smoothing. I didn't quite understand. Hopefully the audio is slightly better now. Maybe it's a little. Maybe my close. side too. I don't know. I've been having problems. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Uh, so the the fresh start in concept would would smooth the entire base, like the entire crude liability for the safety group, if that's what you chose to do. And so it would be, you would do it once, and then that's what your new payment would be for the next 25 years at that much higher level. The, the conversation we had with Bartel Associates and with the Finance Committee at the time in October was that instead of having set, resetting the bar, even in concept at that much higher level, you could achieve a similar impact on the city's liabilities by targeting specific bases in an intentional manner and doing that analysis on a annual or biannual basis to make sure that you were getting the most bang for your buck. What do you mean by basis, like targeting certain basis? Yep. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify. What I mean by that is that in any given year when CalPERS either exceeds or, as we all know, more likely falls short of their targeted investment return, mm -hmm. you accumulate a new base. And so that base is what gets factored into your unfunded accrued liability. It gets amortized over the CalPERS schedule and it gets factored and amortized as that base over the 30, now 25 year horizon that CalPERS calculates that base. So when I say you target a base, I mean, you're gonna target a specific year's loss and try to pay that down in a more aggressive manner so that it doesn't continue to appear in year after year after year of actuarial evaluation from CalPERS. So why is it called a fresh start again? What was the, why, why, why was that name chosen? So fresh start is how CalPERS refers to that to oh. their idea, and that is each of those accumulated bases that has popped up over a number of years uh -huh. gets all put together and then spread out on a as a single base reamortized over the oh, next. Oh, I see. Years. I see. Okay. Versus us getting to choose and having the flexibility. Okay, I get that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think the only one who hasn't spoken besides myself, uh, Councilmember Ku, do you have comments on this item? Okay. Um, just a couple that I've kind of touched on uh, in between some of you all. So on the BSR, um, I believe our, our direction was to allocate any excess beyond the BSR's top target, 50% to the 115 trust, 50% to other uses. Um, I think given that per our previous item, we will be refilling some of the BSR for the next few years, that no longer is a prudent policy. Um, now, should it be up to the city manager's discretion or council's discretion, what we do beyond the 18.5%, we can decide that. Uh, but for the next few years, it, that, that money will likely be going to the BSR. On the allowable uses, um, this gets a little bit to the fresh start. I think just to clarify, there are two types of fresh start. One is where we do it in concept, in which we essentially treat it as if we're doing a fresh start. The other is a contractual fresh start where we actually sign with CalPERS and re-amortize all our previous base years into to one new year, which we pay off over 30. Um, if I recall correctly, I think where finance committee was interested is if we are going to spend the 115 trust, uh, ideally after saving up one uh, year of, of ADC money, um, where do we spend it most effectively? And is it if I recall correctly, we, we can actually target that money at specific base payments. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so our question there was, you know, like, how do we tell which base payment is the most effective and uh, intelligent for us to apply that, that 115 savings? And so I, I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but I think that was one of the reasons we, we stayed away from some of the, the fresh start discussions. Um, One item we haven't touched on much is the percentage funding target, which drives a lot of the other math. Um, we agreed on 
I wonder now if that's not a bit aggressive. Um, and so th there, there may be a little bit more legwork to examine there. Um, but th that's actually a whole nother discussion. So with that, I mean, I, I'm fairly comfortable with this policy. I would just say the one thing is, you know, for excess BSR money, do we want a little more specific uh, direction rather than just the city manager's discretion? Um, otherwise, I think this is about what the finance committee recommended. Um, this really is the right step in terms of dealing with our pension funding. And it hasn't been said yet, but, but many thanks to council member Phil Seth for, for years of work on this and right. really, really orienting and driving this conversation sure. to the point where many of us can understand it. We are paying our normal cost and we are beginning to pay the unfunded, unfunded liabilities as well. Although there's the different discount ratios for, for those groups of, of monies. Um, anyways, those are my comments for the moment. So we'll go for a second round. Um, but uh, at this point, happy to entertain motions. And please don't forget, we're also considering a contract uh, and amendment with Bartell and Associates. Uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois. I think my hand is still up from last time, but having said, had some more time, I guess, could staff just answer the question, I guess, about the, the use of the excess BSR funds? Like, why in the example policy did you? Did you use just, just city manager discretion? What was the thinking there? Uh, I think it's more just the flexibility of it. Uh, there's nothing that says we couldn't do 50% or not. Um, something to remind the council as part of this policy is this would state that only if we're over 18 and a half percent. So ultimately, you know, over the coming year, as we're working to build back up to that 18 and a half percent, no one uh, without council authority would have the ability to redirect any contributions to the BSR um, while it remains under that 18 and a half percent. It's only once we move past it. So when we talk about that evergreen policy, um, I think it's still appropriate if that's council's intent uh, to write that into the policy because it just means that we won't do it probably for the next year or two as we work to rebuild that BSR back to the 18 and a half percent. I think it, if it's the will of the council and they want the policy to be prescriptive, that it's a 50-50 split between um, capital and the 115 trust, uh, that's easy for, for us to write in. We were more just trying to be cognizant of maybe the flexibility uh, due to the current changes in our financial picture. Right, and I think that makes sense. So again, so the current policy is that excess over the PSR goes into the infrastructure fund automatically, right? Without council approval? Correct. And so the change here is you would, have, the city manager would have two choices, either the, the unfunded liability or the infrastructure fund and whatever ratio made sense for that year. Correct. Okay. Um, I guess the one other thing we didn't talk about was whether we should, maybe we did back then, I can't remember, change the discount rate for the UAL, right? And so the assumption here is the, while the normal costs are 6.2, we're keeping the UAL at whatever CalPERS is at at the time. Is that, that correct? In terms of the funding ratio, yes. Um, and really just as a reminder, the council uh, taking a step back from all of this, uh, some of these questions have surrounded on why haven't we gone so far or should we go too far? Have we gone too far or do we need to go further? Um, this is a really delicate balance. And I think the last month and a half has really highlighted that delicate balance of tying up funds in a financial policy uh, versus, and being fiscally prudent versus tying them up too much and restricting our hands so that we're not able to react in urgent situations. Um, and so really, I think we're watching that fine line um, as we're going through this policy. So when you're looking at that 90% funded level or doing it at the CalPERS discount rate, one of the things that staff and the finance committee talked about extensively is, is our market competitiveness. Um, you know, we're not and we're not on an island. We have jurisdictions with neighboring borders that are near us up and down. So 
the financial choices that we make impact our ability to one, deliver services, two, um, provide benefits and costs uh, associated with the employees that are gonna deliver those services. So we don't wanna get too far too fast. Uh, we don't, cause then it puts you uh, in a situation where you might be uh, making yourself less marketable in the uh, kind of broader government workplace. So it's, it's that balance that we all talked about uh, in terms of wanting to be financially responsible, but also keeping an eye on where the rest of the, the state is at. And then one last question. I, you, you know, one of the funding components was um, uh, overtime looking for additional cost sharing with employees. That's not in the, the example policy. Um, is that just something that you didn't feel needed to be in the policy? That would be kind of a separate discussion as part of labor discussions? In short, yes. Uh, the idea was that that is one of the underlying principles and that we would continue to look at that and explore that. But that since it is subject to those negotiations that including it in the policy itself is somewhat difficult. So it's not saying that we're not gonna do that. It's just it didn't really belong there. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, after uh, refreshing myself and kind of reviewing example policy, I, I think I'd, I'll try to get us started and just go ahead and say that we would adopt this example policy as our pension policy. And, um, you know, I guess it'd be open to amendments as we talk through it. But I think actually staff did capture uh, what we discussed in finance and um, Again, I think I think it is that balance, and I think it, I think it is actually a pretty pretty good policy here. So Second. that would be my motion to make the staff motion. Okay. Um, so the vice mayor makes a staff recommendation. I believe that was Councilmember Cormack seconding. Is that correct? Okay. Do you want to speak to your motion? Uh, no, I think I, I think I did. Right, uh, Councilmember Cormack. Uh, thank you so much to the vice mayor. Um, thanks for the. Refresher on the BSR policy, I think it is appropriate to have both of the options available. Um, as I recall us discussing it, while naturally the 50-50 feels good, um, really it's a balance between what we're doing to pay off prior debts and what debts and what we're doing to um, prepare for the future. So I, I feel that that's a, a nice symmetry there. Um, the one thing, did we have this fiscal impact section did we discuss this, the 7.5% um, decline? I don't recall us discussing that last year. Is that here because of our new situation? Thank you for pointing that out. That was put in as one of, one of the things we had talked about back in October was the idea of guardrails or contingencies if something like that would happen. And so that was put in um, even before we encountered the current crisis. And I think the current crisis really calls into spotlight the importance of having something like that certainly any piece of this example policy could be removed or modified at council's direction. Okay, so basically it's a trigger saying, hey, this thing is happening. Let's just take a moment to decide, are we still comfortable with going forward with this? Okay, that's fine. And then I think the other thing, you know, where we ended up with the 90% and the choices on the, on the blue chart, I remember us having a discussion about the, the cost it would be to eliminate all uncertainty for the future um, was extremely high. And we were trying to figure out what's the sweet spot of us appropriately saving extra to minimize the likelihood that someone sitting, whenever everyone gets to sit in that community meeting room again at the a future finance committee doesn't have a really significant problem. So when I thought about that more in like an insurance um, mindset, um, I think that's part of why we ended up at the 90% in the 15 years. Um, so with that, I'm happy to be the seconder. Thank you. Um, I see hands from council member Phil Seth and then Ness. Oh, no. No. please. <laughs> Congratulations to Eric. <laughs> so, so thanks very much. And uh, uh, thanks very much. I appreciate the work of staff and, and the explanation from uh, Adrian and Tom on the finance committee and and uh, I'll defer to the finance committee on this. So I think that it looks reasonable. Um, I thought, uh, I really liked a question that uh, council member Nis asked, uh, which was what exactly are, are we asking to, to 
do here, to authorize here. And it seems to me that one of the big questions here is how, do, how big do we let the, the section 115 guess get before we start transferring money back to CalPERS, right? Um, and, and so I think that's embedded into the discussion that, that we're having. And I think that that seems to be one of the major ones. Um, so I think we ought to, yeah, I think uh, follow staff, follow the finance committee's recommendation on that uh, and, and keep thinking about it as we go along and, and adjust if necessary. Um, the second one uh, observation here is that we've sort of said, on the one hand, we've said, what's the target time to amortize 90% of the unfunded liability, 10 years or something like that. And on the other hand, we've said, well, how much of our surpluses do we want to put into the section 115 and to pay that down? And it seems to me those two things are not independent of one another. It's like, you got to pick one or the other, but but because they because they because they're sort of the, the flip side of the same coin right so just uh, not to propose any change here but i think we gotta we gotta understand that those things are not independent of one another that is if you we're going to put this this much money in that it's going to take x long to amortize this much of the unfunded liability or the other way around is going to tell us how much money we got to put in so they're not independent quantities one of the things that i think i heard us ask and and let me ask if there's an answer to this is, are we gonna treat the miscellaneous plan and the safety plan differently? Is, is there, do we have to make a decision on that tonight? In short, no decision is required on that particular piece tonight. I think one of the things that's built into this policy as an evergreen policy is reporting mm -hmm. back to the city council on progress towards those funding goals over the horizon. And so if there was some deviation that needed to be incorporated at a later date to make sure, say, safety was on a different track and didn't seem like it was going to meet its 90% goal within 15 years, corrective action could be taken at that time. Are we ever going to are we ever going to run into a circumstance where we're, we're going to go, you know what? You know, we need one section 115 for safety and another one for miscellaneous because we're putting in normal costs here and these people are splitting normal costs that way and so forth. Are we ever going to run into that situation? I'll take a crack at this and then I see Kylie getting ready to jump in as well. The, the way we have the 115 trust set up right now is split out by fund. So mm -hmm. all of the general fund money is there. All of the fund from the enterprise funds is there. And that's from an accountability and transparency perspective. Rate payers shouldn't be subsidizing what will ultimately be a funding contribution for a general fund okay. activity. Yep. What we've been doing lately is tracking what's going in from the safety units into the 115 trust fund as well uh, as an internal tracking mechanism. Mm -hmm. So we do have that insight to see how much was generated um, once we started contributing that normal cost. I will say at the beginning of this process, when we were starting out and we recognized the importance, but we didn't have as refined uh, a policy even shaping yet, the money that was put in from the general fund, the $2 million that was the first contribution as an ad hoc contribution was just general fund contribution. And it wasn't split out this much for safety or this much for miscellaneous. Right. So I'll, I'll say at this point, staff tracks that independently, but we have not yet got to the point where we think we need separate 115 trusts for the different plans. Okay. But, but we are keeping an eye on that. Okay, that's good. Um, and then you're asking us to approve the Bartell contract. And then finally, I think the last thing you asked about was the, the or for input on was the fresh start uh, uh, issue, which finance committee recommended that we not do contractually. Uh, and part of the part of the argument was we can we can sort of do it synthetically by uh, by the mechanisms that you described plus the buffer in the section 115. And, and that makes sense to me uh, as well. So I think that's, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would support that. Um, I, think, I think we should be, any number we get from CalPERS, we need to take it with a big grain of salt. And uh, you know, my instinct on the Fresh Start program from CalPERS is it's, you know, I'm sure they're trying to do the right thing and, 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 and cover some of their, their issues and their gaps, right? But it, at the same time, it kind of comes across as yet another one of these. Here, look over here while we move money from that bucket to this other one, and so forth. And I think we got to be, you know, we got to make sure we don't get too distracted by that kind of stuff. And I think we need to, to, keep, to keep keep track of our own stuff here. Okay. Five minutes. 
Thank you. Um, Council Member Ness. See if I'm unmuted. Um, am I unmuted? I hope. So Eric, um, thank you for all you've done. I remember the year this first came up and I know that also Greg was involved at that same time. And if you probably both remember in the past, this wasn't anything that was worried about. No, there were no big discussions during budget time about pensions and, and so forth. So uh, I think this has taken us down a very different pathway, uh, a, a, you know, certainly a valuable pathway. Um, so thank you both. Thank you to the class of 2019's finance committee, which did such a good job and we're looking at it tonight. Um, but let me share one thing. I, I knew a lot about, about PERS when I was at the county and I was also asked to go and do a keynote for them at one point. If you haven't looked at the makeup of their board, I would suggest that you do that. Where is Mr. Name I can't pronounce? Um, and I apologize. Say your last name once again. That's Guagliardo. Guagliardo, got it. So. Um, now, well, close enough. <laughs> um, and I, I, was, I was somewhat troubled by their board. And I would, at some point, if I were any of you, just, just take a look at it, who runs it and so forth. It, it, made, me, it made me uneasy. But I think that um, this group has, has taken this on with a vengeance, has come up with, appears to be, appears to be a, a good middle of the road solution. And I'll be glad to vote for what you all have really spent a great deal of time and effort on, on producing. So thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Koo. So first, I just want to say thank you to Steve and to Kylie for this. Um, it's, it was very difficult to understand. So thank you so much for the explanation and going through all of it. I had to read it, I think, three times, you know, but um, and also thanks to the Finance Committee for reviewing all this and coming up with this plan. I just I wanted to ask a question, you know, on the uh, BSR, what was behind um, the um, to give the to um, confer discretion to the city manager to make the transfer if it's over the 18.5%. Um, can you just kind of give me some idea about that and you know what, what? What was? Why just to the? Why to have that amount go to infrastructure and not? Maybe there might be some other need in the city. So I'll take a crack at that, and then, oh, Kylie muted. Thanks, Steve. So in short, the current budget stabilization reserve policy allows that excess BSR above 18.5% to be transferred to the infrastructure fund at the city manager's discretion. Oh, so now it already allows it. I see. For, for infrastructure. And so the idea would be that this would be another allowable use of that. I will just note that to the councilwoman's question about all of the other potential uses of it, if that's in the general fund, that can be addressed through other mechanisms. It wouldn't necessarily need to be transferred as these two items would. Okay, and these two items are just from the BSR if it goes over the 18.5. That's correct. Okay. Just one other point, council member, just to remember with the BSR and funds that fall to that. Um, it is extraordinarily easy to say, oh, we got more money than we thought, let's go do this program or let's go help this service. Uh, but the one thing that all of your finance folks will always remind you of is this is one-time money. And so really what we look to do is invest that one-time money in one-time costs or in areas that it will help us in the future, but not tie our hands to ongoing things. So that's why even when you look at this policy, we have an ongoing cost of the 6.2 normal cost. And the BSR would be additional one-time supplemental payments uh, because we can't always count on that to happen. Okay, that's that's really good. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, I just want to also want to just thank my colleagues and staff for uh, bringing this together. I think it's an important topic. You don't want to have this massive uh, unfunded pension liability. Um, I wanted to just ask uh, the folks that uh, in the finance committee who were looking at this before, did you guys ever look at what, so this is one approach to deal with the problem. Um, did you guys ever look at what are some other cities trying to do to deal with this problem as well? Did that ever come up? Did you guys ever like discuss that or uh, look at, because a lot of cities are facing this problem, right? And so I'm just wondering, were there any best practices you guys found um, or does this pretty much capture everything? And I realize that there's cities behind us who are, who are totally ignoring it. So I, I get that as well. But I don't know Mayor, if, um, if I may. Um, my recollection is, and I, I think uh, Director Nose touched on this very gently, is we're, we're at the forefront of this. There, there was not another example, as I recall, that they were able to find um, because that was a question we asked, like, hey, you know, what, how are other people approaching it? So, so this really is, um, you know, a, I hesitate to say cutting edge, but definitely leading edge in terms of pushing the envelope um, to use a lot of metaphors. It's really late. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think staff should respond, but my recollection is that was not basic a, a terracotta. Way what was that? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is went away. Yeah. Okay. Is there, I know this was, so you guys looked at this, you know, last year. Is there anything, any updates? Has any other city uh, come up with anything else innovative? I know, I know basically. Money's money, right? So this, you can't make it up. So on this, but is, is there any other, any other, um, I, any hear, other things that I hear you council member. And one thing I want to say is in all of the extraordinary work that Steve has done on this item, one of the items was to go research what others have done. So if you actually look in attachment a on page 13, you'll actually see a paragraph of the research that he did. It's packet page 64. Um, so the original staff report to the finance committee had that research. Um, as for what other agencies in the state can do, I'm not sure if Mary Beth is still on the call, um, but if she is, this might be one area that she might be able to help uh, shed a little bit more light on what some other uh, things might be in the works. Um, thanks, Kylie. I can just take a brief stab at it and, and sort of echo what you've been saying. I think the city's really at the forefront um, in terms of having a real formal policy that you've been following for several years now. I think um, a lot of cities would like to have a policy like this, but they're in sort of the stage of let's set up a 115 trust and if we find some extra money, we'll put it in there. And we, we haven't really thought yet about how much we want or what we're going to do when it gets to the level that we're, we, we think is sufficient. So they're really not as far along the path of implementing a formal policy as Palo Alto is. Okay. Um, that's what I kind of thought, but I was thought maybe there's someone else being even more innovative. Um, just one of the things that Councilmember Phyllis has talked about that I also wondered about is, you know, let's say, you know, this is, a global depression and things really the wheels fall off the wagon here. Um, so, um, you know, the, one of the, one of the things I and I I get, I, hook, I get the argument about why we should invest in Calpers versus keep the money in our own account and stuff like that. I get that, but I just wonder, like, you know, we're being fiscally, we're trying to solve this this pension issue. A lot of other cities aren't. You know, the, the, I, the idea I like about having our own separate fund is that other cities who are, let's say, maybe behind us can't, you know, take our funding, right? That, and so I, I guess can, that's one thing I'm just kind of concerned about. So, but I, I do think that we probably need, that means if we, if we do keep the money in our account, then we need to probably go for a higher risk, higher return type of, type of thing. Otherwise, it would be better to be in CalPERS. But can staff or someone on the finance committee at that time talk about like, because we've had this discussion before way back when I was on the finance committee about this very topic, right? And I know it's kind of a thing that keeps coming up, but that's, that's one thing that makes me a little bit worried about this, um, given that we are ahead of others. Um, so, you know, let's say this crisis continues and the state is, you know, losing $60 billion and other cities are like, you know, 
unable to pay their share, right? What happens to us, right? What happens to our share? So Mary Beth can weigh in on this a little bit, but just our funds in CalPERS are separate and distinct. And, and the, if other cities have issues, they're not allowed to tap into our funding that's accumulated in CalPERS to address that. Even even if CalPERS like basically is like bone dry, they can't pull money, they can't, they can't say, oh, well, here's a Palo Alto fund. We could. No, they can't do that. OK. Five I don't know, Council Member Phyllis is saying, I don't know, uh, Mayor, can Phyllis speak? Or, or? I think the I, why you're can... seeing this is, is that this is based on current state law. Uh, if the CalPERS or the state legislator changed the legal parameters by the full state legislator, then the rules could change, absolutely. Okay. Um, but under current laws and under current contracts with CalPERS, no, our funds cannot go to another agency. We are in a separate account. Because the thing I, 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 can't I, can actually, I can actually think of two ways we can get rated here, okay? One is the way that Kylie just said. If in fact in 15 years or 20 years or 10 or something like that, the wheels really come off the train uh, uh, in California, the state legislature can do a lot of stuff, okay? The second is I think we need to recognize that there's a significant moral hazard problem in, in CalPERS because as they get farther behind, they have an incentive to go after risky high return investments, okay, for everybody in order to close their gap, okay? Because if they put it all into wildcat oil drilling or something like that, right, for example, right, then if the returns come in, they're bailed out. If the returns don't come in, then the agencies like us are on the hook to, to pay it back. So there's a moral hazard problem with CalPERS investments we got to keep an eye on too. And that would have the same effect as looting us to pay other jurisdictions. Yeah, so I guess in this example here, is it saying that we move towards, you know, having our own fund? I, I guess that's the thing I'm trying to understand. Like, because why, why not just keep an own fund, go for the riskier returns, because we, we could control that ourselves, right? In. I guess one of the things that I could say that if it is the will of the council, what we could do is revisit, obviously, this policy and our investment strategy with the 115 Trust at some sort of timetable frequency. It's these details that we'll round out in this next round when we write the full policy. Um, and if the sentiment of the council changes, then we can always adjust. Uh, there are different investment profiles that the vendor that we currently use to do the investments has. And ultimately, I guess part of what I'm trying to say is we're not even near the one year of pension cost funding. So I hear what you're saying on should we move between the 115 trust versus CalPERS and how do we want to handle that? I think this council has time before that decision needs to be set in stone. Okay, I just hope the knowledge of this isn't lost, right? Because to me, what makes sense is we should try to keep the money in case, because we're a small, if we were like a, you know, a million person city or two million person city where we had a lot of pool, right, in the state, if we were like San Francisco or LA or something like that, then, okay, you know, probably have enough pool that state law can get changed and, you know, we won't have to get, we won't have to worry about getting rated. Or if what I was hoping was there were other people out there who were ahead of us, or at least with us, you know, taking care of their pension. But it sounds like there's not, right? But we're a small city and we're ahead of everyone else. So that's why I, I share the concern that, that Councilmember Phillips has brought up. And that's why I rather, you know, do our own investing directly versus giving the money to CalPERS. So for me personally, I agree with the CFO knows uh, for the moment, I'm not, personally feel comfortable making such a decision tonight, right? But recognizing that there are, and I didn't understand, I didn't really understand this till this evening, right? There are two ways to look at this. There's the way that we're moving forward looking at it, right? Which is it's kind of a buffer, the 115, and we're really still using CalPERS as the primary investment vehicle, right? 
The other way to look at it, which is the way that sort of I had been thinking about it before, was that actually the 115 is going to be the primary investment vehicle and we're going to bleed off a little every year for whatever we have to pay CalPERS, right? Those are fundamentally different strategies, right? But uh, as, as, as the CFO knows said tonight, you know, I mean, for the next year or two, I mean, we don't have enough in the 115 that those strategies make any difference anyway, right? So I, I would agree with, I would be supportive of going forward with sort of finance committee spent a lot of quality time thinking about and moving forward on that. But, you know, let's keep thinking about it for the next couple of years because we're in this for the long haul. Well, the problem is that we don't last that long, right? So I'm just, I'm just wondering, that's the thing I just worry about that people are going to forget like what's going on here, but um, maybe not. Um, so Mayor, I know I'm out of time here, but yeah. I have a question about Bartel. Otherwise I could wait for the next round, but. I think it's time to vote. So if it's a quick question, a quick question. Um, go for so, it. I, I, I was looking for the, for the red lines for the Bartel contract. My main question is, is it the same rates as before or do they raise our rates on us? So I'll let Mary Beth chime in in just a minute here. But in short, the rates were consistent over the past few years and they've escalated year over year with the CPI cost increases. Well, Justice. CPI went down. CPI went down 0.8%. So they, did they decrease it 0.8%? So when they had set the rates, the CPI had not yet decreased. And I'll let Mary Beth weigh in on exactly what happened to the rates. But as they were being set for the coming years, that's what we've been set up in the contracts. The last, um, so this contract goes back, I think, to 2015 um, and covers time since then. So um, the the majority of the work was uh, set as a fixed fee back in 2015. Um, hourly rates for extra work have gone up with CPI since then. We've not yet quoted on um, on uh, rates where the CPI is dropping. Okay, I guess those I'm time just trying, get, just trying to get clarity. That there were no red lines here. I'm just trying to get clarity on how much the rates, how much for the work that we're asking them, how much more is it than last time? That's, that's what I'm trying to get a feel, right? Sure. So in the at places memo, um, you can actually see that the rates do change. Um, and it really depends. Uh, as uh, Mary Beth had alluded to, we do have some flat rates. Sorry, I kind of don't want to waste time. What, what page are, are, is it at? And I'll look at it right now. It's on the... Um, it's the at places memo. So it's not the staff report. So it doesn't have packet pages. Um, it is in, let's see, on page eight of exhibit C, there are the uh, hourly rates and fees for 17 um, and 19. Which but it doesn't show the delta. That's, that's what I'm interested in. I know I see that, but I'm looking for the delta. Like how much more? That's what I'm asking. I see the hourly fees. I don't see the increase. Right. So it's got a 2.5% CPI on it. If you look at the note above the table. So the total is 230, 2.5% on that is, you know, $7,000. I see. Okay, so that it's that asterisk. But remember the 230 is over the lifetime of the contract. It's not the and individual annuals uh, work. Now, again, there are two components also of this contract. There's one component, which is the biannual actuarial report that has to be done for our OPEB. It's evaluation report. Um, and then we also do that for our pensions. And then there's this ad hoc work for all of these scenarios, which are billed to us on an hourly basis. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the vote. It's 1110. We've had two eight hour days or so or longer. Um, okay, in reverse order, uh, motion on the board, Council Member Tanaka. Um, you know, I'll, I vote yes on no, on A, but B and C, I just you, don't like having increases. How do you vote on the motion? Uh, Why, well, as far as I understand, you can split the motion, right? Sure, but it's 11 10. Yes on A, no on B and C. How do you vote on the motion? The motion is A, B, and C. Molly, can you step in here and tell me, is, is this not splittable? Is this? Is 
sorry. Uh, it, the motion is divisible. Mr. Mayor, you should split it into okay. three. Okay, let's vote on letter A and then B and C. Two, yes, okay. two separate votes. Okay, so for motion, we're voting on letter A. Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Council Member Nit Koo? Yes. Council Member Niss? Council Member Niss? Uh, you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Uh, myself is a yes. Council Member Philseth? Yep. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Okay, motions B and C together. Council Member Tanaka? Uh, on B and C, it's uh, no. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Niss? Yes. I'm a yes. Council Member Philseth? Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Okay, so motion A passes seven to zero. Motion B and C pass six to one with Council Member Tanaka voting no. Thank you very much, staff. Thank you to our members of the public who are listening still. And thank you to my colleagues. It's 1112. Unless there's any other business, uh, our meeting is adjourned. I hope you all get a good night's sleep. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks all. Good night.